All right, so to get ourselves started here, the first thing we're gonna do is incorporate Firebase Auth a little bit more deeply into our front end, right? So we've already added the Firebase Auth package, we've already set it up, and we've already made it so that when the user puts in their information to either the login or create account page, it will log them in. However, we haven't really done anything since then to actually incorporate the fact that the user is logged in or not into our app. So that's the next thing we're gonna do here. Now, before we write and rewrite a lot of code in refactoring, let's talk a little bit about how we're gonna want this to work. So if we open up some of our pages, let's open up our notes page, for example. Our notes page is currently getting all of its notes from the notes context, and this is true of the note detail page and most of the other pages that we're using right now. So let's open up our notes context provider. All right, that's going to be notes provider, this component we created earlier to manage all of the logic with dealing with notes and allow our pages to share the data. And what we're gonna have to do is each time we make a request, whether inside a use effect hook or whether inside uh, just a function like create node, update node, etc., we're gonna have to take into account now, A, the different routes that we changed previously, right? We changed the way that some of our routes were set up to incorporate the idea of having different users in our application into them. And B, we're gonna have to include the user's auth token in all of the requests that we're sending. And this is going to allow us to actually verify that the user is who they say they are on the server side. And that will allow us to prevent users from doing things like accessing each other's data, modifying each other's data, deleting each other's data, etc. All right, so we're gonna start off here just by changing the routes, and there will be a few other things that we have to do as well. But uh, for now, let's just make sure that the routes are in line with the paths that we set up on the server previously. So for loading the notes for a given user, what we're gonna need to do is change this and incorporate the user's ID into this URL, all right? Now, we're gonna use backticks here and say slash users slash, and then we're gonna need the user ID, which we currently don't have. And then, of course, we need to say slash notes. Now, one way to get the user's ID would be to simply use the current user property on the Firebase auth object for our application. So let me just show you what that would look like real quick. We're gonna say import get auth from Firebase auth. And then down here in our load notes, what we're gonna do is say const user equals get auth dot current user. Okay, that will give us the current user only if that user is logged in. And then inside this path here, we're gonna say user dot UID as the user's ID. Okay, now this should work provided that the user is logged in when the application starts up, right? So what that's gonna look like if we just go back to here, oops, let's actually start up our app here. We're gonna say npm run dev inside our notes app directory, and that will start up our front end and back end. And it looks like our application isn't loading those notes correctly. Now what's going on here, there actually is an error occurring behind the scenes, and you won't actually see it if you open up your console because we have this thing inside a try catch block, remember? and that's basically swallowing this error silently. So if we say console.log and log out the error that's occurring, we're gonna see that we're getting an error that says cannot read properties of null reading UID. Now what this means is that when we say user.uid, this current user doesn't actually exist because we're not actually logged into the application. Now what we're gonna need to do here is actually go to the login page all right, and we're gonna need to log in with the account we created, so john at gmail.com and abc123. And if we log in now, we might have to refresh this. And it looks like we still don't have a current user. So anyway, I'm not gonna go too much further down this path because this isn't the way that we wanna do this anyway. And I wanted to demonstrate this because a lot of people just think that they can access this current user thing as is and not have to listen for any updates or anything to it. But in fact, what we have to do is something that we've seen earlier. We have to actually create a subscription that will listen for changes in the user's auth state, right? So in other words, if the user uh, logs in while the app is being used, our notes provider isn't going to be re-rendered automatically. So we need to actually create a subscription that will listen for those changes. So what that's gonna look like, we're gonna use another use effect hook here. 
And we're also going to import another function from Firebase auth called on auth state changed. This is how we create that subscription, if you remember. All right, now we're only gonna want this logic to occur at the very beginning, right? We just wanna set up that subscription when our notes provider is first rendered. So inside here, we're gonna say on auth state changed. We're going to pass the reference to Firebase auth as the first argument here. And as the second argument, we're going to pass a callback that will be called whenever the user's auth state changes. Okay, so we're gonna say user. And then inside here, what we're gonna have to do, well, first of all, is create two state variables, one for whether or not the user is currently loading. All right, so we'll say const user is loading and set user is loading equals use state true. And then we'll say const user and set user equals use state. And that will be equal to null initially. Okay, we'll set that to the actual user once the user logs in. And then all we have to do is inside this on auth state changed callback, we're gonna say set user, oops, let's try that again. We're gonna say set user to user, and we're gonna say set user is loading to false. All right, and then one last thing we wanna make sure of is that this subscription is canceled if for some reason our notes provider is ever unmounted. So the way that we do that, remember, is this on auth state changed returns a function that we can call to cancel the subscription. So we'll say const cancel subscription equals on auth state changed. And then we're going to return this cancel subscription function from our use effect hook, which will automatically call it. Oops, we don't wanna put the parentheses after it. We just wanna return the function. That will automatically call this function when our component is unmounted. Okay, that's just how the use effect hook works. All right, so that should take care of keeping this user state in sync with whatever the actual state behind the scenes is with Firebase off. And the next thing that we're gonna do now is actually use that user state variable instead of the user that we were using here to make this request. So if we go back to our application now and refresh, it looks like it's still giving us the same error. So what's going on here is we need to actually wait until the Firebase user is done loading in order to uh, load our notes. So all we're gonna do is inside this use effect hook where we load our notes, we're gonna say if the user exists, then load notes. All right, because we only wanna call this async function if we're going to have a user that we can get the UID from. All right, so now we're gonna have to add user to the things to watch down here, and that will basically make sure that this use effect hook gets called each and every time that user changes. So in other words, if the user goes from null to an actual Firebase auth user, then it will detect that in here, it will call load notes, and it will take care of loading everything then. So let's try this again. We're gonna go back to here, I'm going to refresh it, and sure enough, it looks like our notes are finally being loaded correctly. And you'll notice, of course, that it displays without anything for the first second or so while our notes are loading. And if we want to prevent that, what you can do is inside the notes page, which I already have open here, we're going to find out if the notes are currently loading. We'll say is loading. And then we'll just use that to display a loading message. So down here, we can just say something like if is loading. Then what we want to do is just return I don't know, we'll just do a paragraph tag with loading. You could put a spinner here or something if you wanted to, and that will get rid of the weirdness where we start off by displaying that there are no notes, and then we fill those in. Not that that's a deal breaker, of course, because I still see a lot of sites that do things like that, where it'll have a message that they wanna display when you don't have any data, and that message will still display when that data is loading, and it can be kind of confusing if you have a slow connection. Um, so, you know, it's not that big of a deal, but I just like to have my stuff look good, which is why we took care of it. And it wasn't really that hard to do. So the next thing we're gonna do now is inside our notes provider again. Now that we have our user being updated in the state variable, we have our use effect hook incorporating the user's ID. We're gonna have to go down and add this to create note as well. All right, so the path here is going to be, instead of just slash notes, we changed this to uh, slash users slash user ID slash notes, 
And actually that user ID is not going to be, um, it's not going to be the colon syntax there. It's actually going to be a, uh, just a curly braces thing that we're inserting into our backtick string. So for that, we're going to say user.uid. And just to protect ourselves, we might want to check up here to make sure that um, that user actually exists. So we might want to say if the user doesn't exist, then we could just say something like return, right? Basically, we would just be shorting out that function. Now, in general, this shouldn't really be a problem because the user won't be able to actually get to the place where this function is called from if they're not logged in once we actually set up our uh, route protectors and stuff like that. But for the time being, I'll just put that in there anyway, just for the heck of it. So that should be the only changes we've made. I don't think we made any other changes. Let me just take a look at the routes and our back end again to see if there's anything else that I missed. Okay, we got the list notes route. We changed that one. We got the create notes route. We got that one. Uh, delete notes is the same and update note is the same as well. So uh, we should be good to go. Let's just try doing things like creating notes, uh, updating notes, etc., and make sure that we didn't break anything here. So I'm going to try adding a new note. We'll say testing the uh, new auth stuff and click on create. Sure enough, that will create a new note for us. If we click on that and edit this note, We'll just add something in there like that. Click Save Changes. Sure enough, updating works. And if we go back and try and delete that note now, that should work as well. So everything seems to be working just fine, just to make sure everything is persisted when we refresh. It looks like it is. And that's the first step in really starting to incorporate Firebase Auth into our front end, is making sure that we have access to this user here. And in order to make that happen, we just added this on auth state changed function, which creates a subscription for us. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so now that we've incorporated React Auth a little bit more deeply into our application, right? We're loading the user, we know when their auth state changes, etc. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to make sure that only authenticated users can access most of the pages in our app, except for, of course, the login and create pages, which we're going to want to make sure only unauthenticated users can access. Okay, so you might remember that earlier when we did this uh, with our friend tracker app, for example, what we did is we created a separate private route component or something like that, which basically allowed us to pass in whether or not the user was authed, right? We had a prop that looked something like that is authed. And it also allowed us to pass in whether or not uh, we were currently loading the user, right? In other words, if we currently didn't know whether the user was authed or not. And we're going to follow a similar approach for uh, the component we're going to create here, the main difference here is that instead of just caring whether the user is authed or not, we're eventually going to want to use more complex logic to determine whether or not a user can access a page. So essentially what we're going to do is instead of having is authed, we're just going to have a prop that'll be called something like can access. And that will allow us to basically pass in some kind of Boolean combination of different variables. And that will end up determining whether or not the user can visit that page. So just to give you an example of this, eventually when we add the ability to share notes with other users to our application, whenever a user goes to the note detail page of a shared note, we're going to want to check whether they actually have access to that. And if they don't have access, we're going to want to redirect them to some kind of like, yeah, you don't have access page, something like that. And on the other hand, if they do have access, we'll just let them see the page. So Here's what this is going to look like. We're going to create a new component in our components folder. We're going to say new file and we'll call this protected route. I think that might have been the same name we used before, but uh, this is going to be a slightly different kind of protected route. So that's not a big deal. And here's what this component's going to look like. We're going to say export const protected route equals. And inside here for the props, we're going to say can access. We're going to say is loading, and then we'll take the rest of the props that we would normally pass to a route, and we'll use these if we end up displaying an actual route here. So here's what this is going to look like. We're going to say if is loading, then we're just going to return a uh, paragraph tag here with the loading text like that. 
Otherwise, we want to check if the user is able to access this thing. And if they're not, right, if can access is false, we're going to want to return a redirect. And that will redirect them to one of the pages of our application. Now, that's actually another prop we're going to add to this protected route is a prop that will allow us to specify where we want to redirect the user to if it turns out that they can't access this, uh, this route here. So what that's going to look like, we're just going to add a redirect to prop to our protected route, and that will be passed to the to prop of our redirect component. So we'll say to redirect to. Okay, and we do have to import the redirect component up here at the top from React Router DOM. And then down below, the next thing we're gonna do is say return. And if is loading is false and can access is true, that means the user is free to see the page. So we're just gonna return a basic route here. We'll say dot, dot, dot props. And that should be all we need to do for this protected route. So let's see how to use this thing now. What we're gonna do is open up our routes.js file. And inside here, we're going to swap out all of our routes with the protected route uh, component that we just created. So let's start off by importing that. We're gonna say import protected route from components slash protected route. Oops, let me try that again, protected route, there we go. And then we're gonna swap out all of these routes with that protected route component. So starting off with our redirect route here, we don't technically have to do this one because we could just change our notes page to a protected route and let that handle all of the logic. But just to avoid any unnecessary logic happening in there, let's just add it to both. So we're gonna say protected route and protected route. And first of all, we're gonna say can access, and this is going to either be true or false based on whether or not the user currently exists in our application. Now, we currently don't have access to that data from inside our routes component, so that's something we're gonna to have to add a little later. But for now, up here at the top of our routes, let's just say const is logged in, and we'll say equals false, right? This will just be for testing to make sure our protected route component works. And for can access, we're just gonna pass in is logged in. And we're gonna say if the user's not logged in, right? If the user can't access the page, we're gonna say redirect to equals, and we'll redirect them to the login page. Okay, so that's our first protected route. The second one's gonna look a lot like it, so I'm just going to copy and paste that and change the path here to notes. And that should be our notes route there. Okay, I'll just copy and paste that tag there as well. So right away, let's just test these two routes out. What we're gonna do, oops, it looks like we need to import route into our protected route. Actually, I already did that. I think I just need to refresh the page here. Nope, I stand corrected. Let's go back to protected route now. Uh, and sure enough, we need to import route. I was remembering importing redirect is why I was so confident that I had done it. Uh, so let's go back here. And what we're gonna see is that if we try and go to the notes page now, it will automatically send us back to the login page. And likewise, if we try and go to the home route, it'll do the same thing. All right, so let's move on to our other routes in our application. The next one here is the note detail page. For this one, we're gonna say can access equals is logged in. And this here will eventually be an example of a situation where we'll wanna make sure that the user can access the page, taking into account more than just whether or not the user is logged in or not. Right, so if the user is logged in, we'll still have to see whether or not they have access to this page by checking to see whether or not the user either created that note or you know has sharing privileges to that note. So that'll be something like note is shared with user or something like that, right? That's just an example of another piece of logic we'll eventually want to pass to each of our protected routes, okay? And with this one, we're gonna say redirect to, and we'll redirect the user to the login route on that one as well. We're gonna need to change this to a protected route as well, by the way. And that should be our note detail page. Uh, we'll go back and test that in a minute here once we've converted over our other ones. So next we come to our login page and our create account page. And these two are gonna use protected routes as well, except the logic here is going to be a little bit reversed. We're going to redirect the user 
to the notes page if the user is already logged in, right? Because there's no reason for a logged in user to go to the login or create account page. So what we're gonna do here, we're gonna say protected route, first of all, protected route, can access is going to be equal to not is logged in. And redirect to, as I said, we'll send them to the notes page. So we'll say slash notes. Okay, and likewise for the create account page, we're gonna do the same thing, protected route. Protected route, there we go. Can access here is going to be equal to uh, not is logged in and redirect to is going to be equal to slash notes. And that should be all we need to do. We're gonna leave the not found page as a regular route because this is the one page where we don't really care whether the user is logged in or not. We're just going to allow any user to access this page whenever they want to because uh, frankly, in the situation where someone gets a not found page, they usually didn't wanna be there anyway. And there's not really any information that we display about users on that page. So we just wanna make that page accessible uh, as a backup. All right, so let's test out this logic that we just added. We're gonna try and access our login page, which we should be able to do here. Uh, we can also access our create account page if we open that up. However, if we try and go to the notes page, we'll see that that will redirect us automatically to our login page. And if we try and go to the note detail page, right, notes one, two, three, that too will automatically redirect us. So that's our protected route component for now. We'll probably have to make changes to it uh, as we go on and as the logic for checking whether or not someone can access a page gets more and more complex, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've created our protected route component and added that to all of the routes in our application so far, the next thing we need to do is be able to actually compute this is logged in thing, which currently we just set to false. All right, so essentially what we're gonna need to do, if we look in our note provider component, remember that this is where we set up the subscription for authentication changes, and we basically just used that to load the corresponding notes for a user when a user logged in. However, this really isn't the place for this kind of logic. Where it belongs is really inside its own custom hook. So that's what we're gonna do here. We're going to create a custom hook for getting the user's data. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna create a new folder which I'll call hooks. And inside of here, I'm going to create a new file which I'll call useuser.js. And this is going to allow our components to get access to the current user in the application. And it's also going to set up this subscription. So let's take this stuff. We're gonna just delete it. Well, not delete it, we're going to cut it. And then we're going to paste it inside our new component here. Once we create it, we're gonna say export const use user or new hook rather. I said new component, but I meant hook. And we're gonna need to import a few things up at the top. Once we've pasted that, we're gonna say use state and use effect. And we're also gonna need to import those same things from Firebase Auth uh, here, so from React. And then from Firebase Auth, as I said, we're gonna need get auth and on auth state changed from Firebase Auth. Cool, and now all we need to do is return these two pieces of state variable from our use user hook. And we can actually change this to is loading if we want to and set is loading since there is no other is loading now that it's in its own custom hook. And then we're just going to return those things from our custom hook by saying return. Uh, and we'll return an object here that contains both user and is loading. Ah, and we need to also change set is loading here. Okay, and now we can use this custom hook in our notes provider by saying import use user there we go, from our hooks directory. And then down here, we're gonna say const user, and we're gonna have is loading as well, although I don't actually think we'll need that at this point. 
we're just gonna say const user equals use user. Okay, and that will give us the user, which will make it so that we can access uh, the UID of the currently logged in user if there is one. And that will also work down here in our create note function where we're using the user's UID uh, to create a new note. So now that we have this use user custom hook, we can also add that to our routes component and pass in whether or not a user is logged in accordingly. So let's see what that'll look like. We're gonna say, uh, here we'll import our use user hook up here from hooks use user. And then down here, we're gonna say const user and is loading. We are gonna use is loading because remember our protected route has a loading prop that will basically display a loading message if we're not sure whether the user can access or not so that we don't accidentally uh, redirect the user prematurely. Okay, so we're gonna say const user is loading equals user or use user rather. And once we have that user, we're just gonna say is logged in equals and then convert the user to a Boolean like that, okay? So now we just need to add is loading to each of our protected routes here. We're gonna say is loading equals is loading. Same thing down here, is loading equals is loading. Down here too, is loading equals is loading. And let's put a space there. Same thing for all of these. Is loading equals is loading. And is loading equals is loading. Okay, so we should be good to go now, finally. Let's go back and take a look at this. We're gonna refresh our page. And sure enough, we'll see that little loading message when we refresh it. And uh, if we log out, which you can simulate either by going into incognito mode here, which I'm just gonna do here, new incognito window. And if you paste that in there, you'll see that that brings up the login page automatically. Okay, and now if you log into here by saying john at gmail.com, bc123, and click login, we'll see that that will take you to the notes page, just like we wanted it to. Okay, so it looks like everything is working now. We have access to our user, and we know now if the user is logged in at any given point in time. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so the next thing that we're gonna take a look at how to do here is make requests that include the user's credentials along with the request. What this will eventually allow us to do is inside our routes, such as our create note route, we'll be able to make sure that users are adding notes to their own account and not to other users' accounts. All right, so essentially what we're gonna have to do here is get the user's ID token whenever they try and make a request and send that ID token along with that request and so that it can be processed by the server. Okay, so what this is gonna look like, there are a few ways to do this. One way would be to just go into our notes provider and modify each of our uh, create note, update note, delete note, etc., to include that information. So essentially that would look like this. We would just say const ID token equals blah, 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 right? We would use all that Firebase logic to actually load it. And another option for this would be to create a custom wrapper around Axios. And we saw this in the friend tracker application when we created a package called Authios to do this. Uh, but what I'm gonna do here, just to show you yet another way that you can do things in React, is we're gonna create a custom hook that will provide these functions for us, right? So this will be kind of similar to how if we want to navigate the user programmatically, we just use the use history hook, right? Let me just show you that here, right? And then we can just say history.push. Essentially what we're gonna do is define a custom hook, which we'll call something like use auth request or something like that. And basically our components will be able to access those functions off of that hook. You'll see what I mean in just a minute here, but basically let's go into our hooks folder and say new file. And we're gonna call this new custom hook, use auth request. Oops, and that should be .js there. 
And here's what this is gonna look like. We're gonna start off by saying import use user from our use user file. Okay, and we're also going to import Axios from Axios. Now essentially what we're gonna do is have a custom hook that returns all of the different requests our application is gonna need to, uh, you know, to make to the server on an authenticated basis. So what this will look like, we're gonna say export const use auth request equals, and what this is gonna look like, we're gonna define functions for get, okay, that'll be an async function, of course, and we'll define the logic that's inside of there in a minute. We're gonna have post, and this is gonna be async like that. We're gonna have put, which will also be async, and we're going to have delete, which, as you may have guessed, is also going to be async, okay? So what each of these functions here is gonna do is it's gonna automatically include the user's ID token when it makes a request. So, uh, oh, and actually we need to name this something other than delete because delete is a reserved keyword in JavaScript. So we'll just call it del for short, kind of our nickname for the delete request, I suppose. But once we've actually uh, implemented all of these, we're gonna say return, get, post, put, and delete. And that will make those functions accessible to whatever component uses this hook. All right, and also in this hook, we're gonna have to get the user by saying const user equals use user. And we're going to end up using this thing to get the ID token of the user when that happens. Now, what we could do for all of these functions here would be to get the user's ID token in each and every one. All right, so we could say const get equals async, blah, blah, blah. And that would look like this. We could say const token equals await user dot get ID token. Okay, and that would take care of generating the ID token for the user. And then to make our request, we would just have to say const response equals await axios dot get. And then we're gonna have to add some arguments to this function here. We'll have the URL. So we'll just say axios dot get and pass the URL straight through to that. And for the headers, we're gonna need to add a configuration object here, which will have headers. And then we'll have a header called auth token and set that equal to token. Okay, and then finally, we're gonna want to say return response. You can even say return response data if you want, which will make the life of the component that's using this a lot easier. Okay, and again, what you could do is you could just repeat this same thing over and over again for all of these, uh, for all of the functions in here. But what I'm gonna recommend you do is add a use effect hook and a state variable, which we're going to call uh, ID token or just token, I guess for short is fine. We'll say token set token equals use state. And that'll start off as null here. And essentially what's gonna happen is our use effect hook is going to keep this token in sync with the current state of the user. So if the user logs out, that'll be detected by use effect because we're gonna add the user as a dependency here. And it will automatically set the token to something else, right? To null if the user logs out, let's say. So what that's gonna look like is inside here, we're just gonna say const create token equals, and this is going to be an async function. Inside here, we're gonna say const token equals await user dot get token or get ID token that is. And then we're gonna say set token token. Okay, now of course we need to call this and we only wanna call create token if user exists. So we're gonna say if user then create token. And now instead of having to call this line each and every time inside of our functions, which I find to be a little bit of a pain, we're just gonna say const response equals await axios.post. Okay, we're gonna have the URL, we're gonna have the uh, request body, and we're gonna have the headers, same headers as before. We'll say auth token, token. And now we'll need to add the URL and body arguments here, URL body, and we'll return response.data. Okay, so now it's just gonna be the same thing for put and delete. For put, we can just copy and paste this and change this to axios.put. That's pretty much all we need to do there. And for delete, 
we're going to copy our get. All right, we're gonna add a URL argument here and that should be all we need to do. Oh, one last thing for put, we need to actually add URL and body arguments to the function as well. Cool, so that's our use auth request custom hook. So let's take a look at how to actually use this thing inside a component. Seeing as though our notes provider, uh, which you can find inside of here, is currently doing all of the loading and stuff for our notes. What we're gonna do is just convert this component over to use that custom hook that we defined. So let's import that custom hook. We're gonna say import use auth request from dot dot slash hooks slash use auth request. And then down here, since we're gonna need to use basically all of the different types of requests that we defined inside that custom hook, we're gonna say const get post put and delete, or we called it del, that's right, equals use auth request. And I spelled request wrong, didn't I? Did I do that inside the file? Let me just take a look here. Use auth request, use auth request. Let me just check here. Nope, it looks like I spelled it right there. So apparently that was only a typo here. Cool, so now all we have to do is use these instead of the corresponding Axios functions. And just to show us where those are. So what I'm gonna do is delete this import. And then we can go down here and say await dot get, or not even dot get, just get, because that is our new function. And we also don't need response data either. We can just say const notes equals await get user blah, 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 because remember we took care of the response.data thing inside each of those functions. So we'll say set notes to notes. We don't need to log anything out there. And that's all we need to do. Okay, so for our create note now, this is going to change from await axios.post to await post. And again, we don't need response data. We're gonna say const new note equals await post. We can delete this thing here. And that's it for create note. For update note, we're gonna change this to await put. We're gonna say const updated note equals await put, blah, blah, blah. We can delete this other updated note line. And finally, for delete note, we're going to say await del. And we don't need to really delete anything there because we weren't using the response anyway. All right, so let's see if all of this stuff is working so far. It should, but we might have to make one or two tweaks in order to get it to work. Ah, sure enough, we have use state is not defined inside our use auth request. There's always something that we miss. So use auth request, we're going to import use state along with use effect. And let's see if that works now. And there we go. So the first thing that we wanna check here is to see if our auth token is in fact in the request that's being used to load these notes. So if you open up your inspector, and go to network, and you might have to refresh this here, and notice here that I have fetch slash XHR selected, that just narrows it down to only network type requests, makes it a little easier to find what we're looking for here. So if we click on notes, right, this is the get request that we're sending to our server in order to load the notes for our user. So what we can do now, what we should be able to see if we go down to the request headers is the auth token, and actually, we see that the auth token is null. Now I'm not gonna lie, this took me a little while to figure out why it was happening when I first wrote this code. So what I'm gonna do now is show you what is causing this. So if we go back to where we're creating our use auth request custom hook, notice that when we create each of these functions here, these function definitions will change as this token variable changes. So in other words, the first time this use auth request custom hook is called, right? The first time that our notes provider gets the get post put and delete functions out of there. If the token is null, which is its starting value, so that's a definite possibility, then at least for our get function here, it's going to stay that way because we haven't actually added get to our dependencies for our use effect thing, right? So this function can change here, but according to our use effect right now, we're not actually looking out for changes. So the first thing we have to do here is say get and add that to our dependencies. And this is going to cause another interesting problem. And you can see that if we go here and if you have your network tab open, you're gonna see that it's continually making requests to the notes endpoint over and over and over again. 
Now, the reason that this is happening, and let's just remove that so that we can stop that for the time being. The reason that this is happening is that in React, and I believe we talked about this a long time ago when we talked about performance in React, but in React, when React checks to see if two values are equal, right, as it does when we add a value to the dependencies of our use effect here, if that thing is something like a function or an object like get is, well, what we're doing inside use auth request is every time something updates in here, we're creating a completely new function. And since no two functions are ever going to be equal to each other in React or in JavaScript, that's causing this thing to re-render and re-render and re-render infinitely because every time anything changes here, a completely new function that from the point of view of JavaScript is not equal to the previous one is created. That causes notes provider to load again and so on and so forth, right? It just creates a, a loop for us. So what we have to do to prevent this is we have to use a hook that we haven't seen yet called use callback. I don't think we've seen it yet anyway. Maybe I talked about it earlier. And all we have to do here is wrap our functions that we're returning in this use callback thing. And what this will do is make sure that if a function hasn't actually changed, we don't end up creating a completely new function with the same signature that causes an infinite loop in React. Now use callback, like use effect, has to take an array of dependencies. So the main dependency for this one is going to be uh, this token state. So we're just gonna add that. We're gonna say token. And we're gonna do the same thing now for post. We're gonna say use callback. Okay, we're going to add the token as a dependency, so array token. And we're gonna do the same thing for put and delete. So we'll say use callback async token. And same thing for delete, use callback token. All right, and one last thing that we're gonna do here is we're going to return another variable from this use auth request function, which we'll call something like is ready. Okay. Now, basically what the notes provider is going to do is it's going to look at this thing before using one of these functions to make a request to make sure that we're actually ready to call those functions with this token, because if the token's null, we already saw what would be the case. So back in our notes provider, we're just going to add is ready from our use auth request. And now we just need to set a state variable inside of here. We'll say const is ready and set is ready equals use state. And that'll be false initially. And then down here, we'll say set is ready to true. Okay, and now in our notes provider, again, we just need to add is ready and get to our dependencies here. So get is ready. And then we're gonna check if the user exists and we're ready to load, then and only then will we actually load our notes. So anyway, that seems like a kind of convoluted way to go about it, but you know, we learned a little bit more about React today, hopefully from, from that little fiasco. So let's try this again. We're going to refresh our application. There we go. And we can see now if we open up our notes request that our notes request has this auth token header on it under request headers, okay? So the next thing that we're gonna do now is we're just gonna check and make sure that this works on the rest of the operations. We're gonna, well here, I should actually probably leave that open so that we can make sure the token is on all of them. You never know. So let's try creating a new note. We'll say something like create a custom hook and we'll click on create. And we should see in the network tab here that this post request that we made, and if we scroll down, uh-oh, it looks like that one doesn't have it at all. It doesn't even have an auth thing. So I think what happened here, ah, yes, sure enough, we forgot to add the headers here. You may have noticed that again before I did. You probably will notice these things before I did. That's generally how that kind of thing works. <laughs> and then we're gonna add headers to the rest of these too because it looks like I forgot those as well. So let's add headers to all of these. Uh, our delete one has headers, so it was just the put and post that were missing it. So let's go back now and try this again. I'm going to delete, create a custom hook. I'm gonna say yes, and let's try it again to see if that shows up. So I'm just going to clear out this. We're gonna say create a custom hook as our new note. And we'll click on create now. And we should see if we open this thing up 
that it has the auth token. Okay, so let's test out deleting this thing. We're going to delete it, click yes. We should see this thing pop up here. This one sure enough has the auth token as well. And last but not least, let's edit a note. We'll type blah, blah, click save changes. And sure enough, we'll see that this one also has the auth token. Awesome, so that's how to create those functions using a custom hook. You may have found that this way was a little bit more complicated than what we were doing before. And part of the reason for this is that the notes provider is on the outer part of our application, right? It's outside any individual page. So while there are pages where, you know, we know that if a user is on that page, they must be authenticated, we don't actually know that from inside our notes provider, which is why we have to do weird stuff like have this is ready thing and check if the user exists before doing anything. So anyway, I hope that this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. Let me ask you a question. Would you use a site like Google Drive if you knew that any other user could see and access your files? The answer is probably no, and yet that's the problem that our note sharing application is dealing with right now. Because even though we're keeping track of different users' notes, right? Different users can log in, create their own notes, and we're keeping track of who owns what just fine we're still not actually preventing users from accessing each other's notes if they know the right request to make. And this is a pretty critical security vulnerability. So what we're gonna be taking a look at how to do here today is add route protection to our backend, right? In other words, we're gonna see how to incorporate logic that will make sure that users can only access, edit, delete, etc., their own notes. So that's our basic plan of attack. Let's jump right in and see how to do this. All right, so the first step on our back end in making sure that users can't access and modify other users' data is going to be to basically take this ID that we're including with all of our requests now. Let me just open up our use oft request file that we created. Okay, so remember, this is the custom hook we created that basically takes all of the common requests such as get, post, put, delete, and it automatically adds the auth token of the currently logged in user to that request. Now, essentially what we're gonna do on the server side, and we've seen this before, so it's not anything new, although this is absolutely going to be a new situation that we're using it in. What we're gonna do, let's just open up our list notes route as an example. What we're gonna have to do is whenever a user makes that request, we're gonna have to have our server take a look at that ID token that was included, right? So that'll be in headers dot off token. And essentially our server is gonna take a look at this and see if it's valid first of all, right? Because if it's not valid, that means that the user probably tried to change something about the data that the token contains. And second of all, we're gonna need to make sure that even if it is valid, this is the token for the user that we're trying to modify the data for, right? So in other words, this token here could be valid, but it turns out it's for user number one, two, three, when the request is trying to modify user two, three, four's data, right? Or trying to delete some notes or trying to view those notes, etc. So anyway, that's what we're gonna do for each of our routes. We're going to make sure that the auth token is valid. And to do that, we're just gonna convert our list notes route first. And to do that, we're gonna have to first import Firebase admin into here so that we can verify that data. So for that, we're gonna say import all as admin from Firebase admin. And then down here inside the handler for this route, we're gonna get the auth token that the user included in their request. Now we're gonna do this before we even access anything else because this is by far the most important thing. If a user doesn't have a valid auth token, then something's wrong, they're probably trying to hack the server, so we just wanna send them away as quickly as possible. All right, so to do that, we're gonna say const auth token equals request.headers. That's the auth token property that we included in the headers. And then to verify it, you might remember this from earlier, we're gonna say const user equals await admin.auth 
dot verify ID token, and then we're going to pass that auth token that was included in the header to this as an argument. So essentially what this is doing is it's taking the encoded ID token, which the user uh, included along with the request, right? It's a big long string as we saw earlier, and it's basically decoding that and turning that into the user information that we can use now inside our server route. So we are gonna want to wrap this in a try catch block because if the token is not valid, what's gonna happen is this will throw an error. So let's put that inside here. And then we're gonna say catch. We're gonna catch the error. And if there is an error, then that means that the ID token isn't valid. So we're gonna send back the status code 401, which as you may remember, means that this is not a valid request uh, for auth reasons. So now that we've done that, right? Now that we've gotten this user thing, we're gonna have to put the rest of our logic inside of here actually. So we'll just do it like that. And once we've verified that the user's auth token is valid, the next thing we have to do, as I said, is make sure that the user is trying to read their own notes here, right? So here's what that's gonna look like. After we've gotten the user ID from the request parameters, we're gonna say if user.uid does not equal user ID, right? So in other words, if the user is trying to access another user's data, then what we're gonna do is say response.send, and we're gonna send back a 403 status code. Uh, for that, we're gonna say send status, actually. And that will basically tell the client side that the request was valid, right? The uh, auth token was valid, but that user isn't allowed to access that piece of data. So that's what that means right there. And once we've done that, we should be pretty good to go. Uh, the one thing that's going to cause problems here right now is the fact that we have two things called user. So let's rename this one to auth user. Right, that's the uh, Firebase auth user uh, that's been decoded there. So we'll say auth user, and then we'll say auth user dot UID. And then we're going to load the user, get the notes for the user, and we're going to send that back to the client just like before. So if we test out this list notes route, everything should work just like it worked before, except now it's much more protected, right? As I'll demonstrate. So. Let's make sure our application is running. We're gonna do that with npm run dev. And once our front end starts up, it should correctly load those notes. Now, in order to prove that this will block other users and unauthenticated users from accessing this information, let's go over to Postman. And what I'm gonna try and do is send this same request, which is getting all of the notes for this user with the ID we set up, and if we take a look at our headers, there's no off headers or anything there. So let's click send now. And this is going to try and make this request to our server. And what we'll see is that we get back this 401 unauthorized status code, okay? So the next thing we're gonna do here, uh, well, just to show you how this is actually working behind the scenes in a little more detail, if we open up our console, or our network tab actually, and make some sort of request, which you can do just by refreshing the page. That should give us this notes request. If you copy this auth token here, which I'm gonna do just by, you can actually just right click here and say copy value. Uh, if we go into headers now and add a header that says auth token, and then paste that big auth token there, and you also have to check this uh, checkbox here, just make sure you do that because I was a little confused why it wasn't working the first time I did it. So now if we click on send, what we're gonna see is that we get back all of the notes for that user. Okay, now if we were to put in the ID token of a different user into here, which we don't currently have, that's something we'll take a look at a little later on. But if we were to do that, we would see the 403 status code coming from our server, meaning that yes, our ID token is valid, but no, we're not allowed to access that information. So anyway, that's how all of that works. And we've now protected our list notes endpoints so that users can only access their own notes. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've converted our list notes route over to protect users' data from unwanted reading, the next thing that we're gonna do is take a look at another route and protect that as well. So uh, just going in order of simplicity here, or in order of complexity rather, 
The next one that we're gonna take a look at here is the delete note route. This one is actually gonna be pretty straightforward to do because all we're gonna to have to do before deleting that note is check and make sure that the user owns it, okay? So in this one, just like in our list notes route, the first thing that we're gonna do is check to make sure that the auth token that the user included is valid. So let's import the admin package. We're gonna say import all as admin from Firebase admin. And then down here inside our handler, we're going to create a try catch block. We're gonna put all of our stuff inside that try block, of course. And the first thing we're gonna do is say const auth token equals request.headers. And once we have that auth token, we're gonna say const user, and actually let's call that auth user, just like we did in our list notes route. And for this, we're gonna say equals await admin dot auth dot verify ID token, and we're going to pass that auth token to this as an argument. Okay, so again, the same thing that we did before is going to happen here. If an error occurred, we're gonna just say catch error, and we'll say response dot send status and send the 401 status back to the user. And that should be all we need to do. So next thing, as I said, is we're gonna need to make sure that the user is actually the owner of the note that they're trying to delete. And for that, it's actually a little bit different than what we saw in the list notes route, because unlike in the list notes route, we don't just have this user ID URL parameter up in the path that we can refer to. So what we have to do instead is wait for ourselves to actually read the note from the database, okay? So we're saying find one and delete here. That's actually no longer what we wanna do. Okay, what we wanna do first is actually find the note that we're referring to and take a look at its created by property to see what user actually created it. And it should be equal to this auth user's ID. If it's not, that's when we're going to return a 403 status code and basically tell the user to uh, go take a hike because they're trying to delete another user's data. So what we're gonna do for this, we're gonna change this find one and delete to just find one. Okay, and this is going to become the note here. And once we have the note, we're gonna to want to say, if the notes created by property does not equal the auth user's ID, okay, so auth user.uid, in that case, we're gonna say return response.send status, and we're gonna send a 403 status there, signifying that they're not authorized to do what they're trying to do. All right, so now that we've verified that the user is in fact the owner of this note, now we can delete it. And the way that we can do that is, well, first of all, we can delete this deleted note thing because we already have the note. Okay, so instead of saying deleted note.id here, we're just going to say note.id. And then we're gonna say await notesdb.delete one. And we're going to delete the note with the ID equal to note ID only if this thing passed. And as I look at this, I'm actually wondering if we open up our list notes route. Ah, yes, I forgot to say return before this. Now, in the case of our list notes route, not having this return keyword before we said response.send status wasn't particularly bad because we're not actually doing anything. However, inside this delete note route, that could have been a little bit catastrophic, just a little bit, because if we don't put the return keyword Basically, our handler function will continue executing, so it will end up deleting this note and deleting the note ID from the user, even though we already sent back a status code to the user saying, nope, you can't do that, All right? So in order to avoid that, and oops, I realized I made a typo here. Nope, there we go, delete one. Uh, so anyway, in order to prevent that, we just need to make sure that we put this return keyword. It's just something that we have to remember to do. So. Anyway, now that we've done that, we should be able to delete notes correctly. So let's go back over to our application here and try out deleting notes and see if it works. So we're going to click on this delete button here. We're gonna click on yes, and it looks like something went wrong. So let's open up our inspector window here. And we see that it says it failed with a status code of 401. Now that doesn't necessarily mean anything currently besides that some sort of error happened in our try catch block. That's one of the downsides of having large try catch blocks like this is 
if anything fails inside of here, it'll just catch it here and send it back. So let's take a look at what this error actually is that's occurring so that we can try and troubleshoot it. I'm going to try and here, I'm just going to refresh this. Oops, it looks like something went completely wrong. We might have to take a look inside the database in order to figure this out. So let's open up our database now. I'm assuming something went wrong here with our users db.update one. Ah, uh, and that's it. This deleted note.created by thing uh, was what tripped it up. So we're going to have to change that to note.created by, and we are going to have to actually go into our database and fix this. So let's say use notes app db. We're going to say db dot users dot find and we're going to say dot pretty so we can take a look at it and sure enough uh, our note that we deleted is still in here so just to see which note is actually the one we deleted let's say db dot notes dot find dot pretty and it looks like this one is the one that didn't get deleted so what we're going to do here i'm going to copy this we're going to say db dot users dot find we're going to say ID equals, and actually we're going to need to copy this thing first here. We're going to say ID is equal to that. And when we find a matching user for that, we're going to say notes, and we're going to use the dollar sign pull property, right? Just like we did in our delete note route handler. And we're going to remove this ID here from the notes property. And to do that, we say notes and paste that thing there. And then let's make sure we close off all of our curly braces and hit enter. Oops, and it looks like I made a typing error. Ah, we need to delete this other notes thing here. I'm going to delete that here. There we go. Okay, and that's an error too. Oh, duh. The reason that I did that is that I didn't change this to db.users.update1. All right, so we have matched count one, modified count one. And if we open up db.users, uh, here, let's do db.users.findall, we should see that that has successfully been removed after a little bumbling on my part. But nevertheless, it should be working now, so let's try refreshing our front end. And that should now work. We don't have that same error that we were seeing before. And let's try deleting another note now. We're going to click on this. We're going to say yes. And there we go. It successfully deleted it because we got rid of that uh, deleted note dot something or other that we had here, okay? So that's how we modify our delete note route in order to make sure that users can only delete notes that they own. All right, and just to show you that this would not allow other users to delete this note, uh, let's go back here. We're gonna add another note. We're gonna say my note. We're gonna click on create. And let's just get the ID of this note here. Uh, we should be able to get that from the Mongo database by saying db.notes.findall.pretty. Okay, let's just copy this ID. And now if we go over to Postman and try and say delete the note with this ID, we're gonna say delete notes slash, and then we're going to paste the ID of that note without the double quotes, of course. And we're going to disable this auth token property because that is the auth token of our user. So we'll click on send now and we'll see that we get a 401 unauthorized from there. And if we re-enable this auth token and click send, we should see that we get back 200 OK instead. OK, so our delete notes route is now protecting our users' data from other users trying to delete it. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so the next thing that we're going to do now that we've implemented route protection on the list notes route and on the delete note route, we're going to move over now to our update note route. And this one's going to be pretty straightforward to do. There's not really going to be anything new here as far as I know. But we are going to have to do something similar to what we did with the delete route and change find one and update to actually finding one, making sure the user owns that note, and then updating it. So. Anyway, here's what all this is going to look like. We're again going to use a try catch block here. I'll show you uh, shortly how to prevent having to do this every time too, by the way. Uh, and we're going to say catch. The catch block is going to be the same thing as we saw before. We're going to say response.sendStatus 401. 
And now, first thing inside this try catch block, we're gonna get the auth token from the request headers. So const auth token equals request.headers. And underneath that now, we're going to verify it using Firebase auth, or Firebase admin that is. So we'll say import all as admin from Firebase admin. And then we're gonna say const auth user equals await admin dot auth dot verify ID token. And we're going to try and verify that auth token that we have here, all right? So now that we have that, we're gonna have to do what I said before and make sure that this user actually owns this note here. So we're gonna change find one and update to just find one. And after we've found the note with this ID, okay, I'm just gonna move this stuff down temporarily. After we've found that note, we're gonna to need to make sure that the user owns that note by saying if note, and here, let's change this from result to note since it's actually a note now. If note.created by does not equal the auth user's UID property, then we're going to send back a 403 status code by saying response.sendStatus403. Okay, and let's make sure to put that return statement before this to prevent any of the code after it from executing. And the next thing that we're gonna do, once we've made sure that the user actually owns that note, we're gonna say await notesDB dot update one. Okay, and we're going to update that note uh, where the ID is equal to note ID. So we're gonna use that same uh, query there, say ID equals note ID. And the updates we're going to make here is going to be setting title and content to whatever was specified in the request body. And we no longer need this return document after thing because that's only something we need when we're doing find one and update. All right, and to calculate the updated note, actually, now that I've deleted all of that stuff, what I wanna do is actually change this back to uh, find one and update. Okay, so we're going to say, there we go. We're gonna change this back to find one and update because we do need the updated note once we've actually updated it in the database. Now we could just compute this ourselves by combining the properties, but uh, generally it's better to know what you're getting in the database. So let's say find one and update. We're gonna leave that return document after and we're gonna make ID equal to note ID. And that should be all we need. So we're just going to say const result here equals await notes db, blah, blah, blah. And updated note again is going to be result.value. And finally, we're gonna say response.json updated note. So you may notice that what we actually ended up doing here was just inserting these lines in before what we had, right? This stuff is all basically the same logic that we had before, but we just added this safeguard up here to make sure that users can only update their own data. All right. So now that we've done that, let's test this out by going over to our application. We're going to add a new note, which we still haven't added any safeguards to, by the way. And what we're gonna do in here is say something like, hello, click on create, and let's try and update this note now. We're gonna click edit. We're gonna type something like, does this work? And click save changes. And sure enough, it looks like it updated that note correctly. So again, just to test and make sure that this doesn't work for users other than this user, let's open up Postman and try and make that same request uh, by saying put notes slash blah, blah, blah. We're gonna turn off this auth token. We're gonna go into body and add some updates here. So let's try and update the title to hacked and the content here, oops, which needs to be in double quotes there. Let's try and update the content to you have been hacked. All right, so we're going to click on send now, and it looks like we got null as a response and a 200 okay status code, which means maybe we did something wrong. So let's go back and take a look here. And first of all, let's see if we really did get hacked by reloading the page. And okay, so it looks like we actually didn't get hacked. So I wonder what we did. Oh, you know what, that happened because this ID belongs to a note that no longer exists. So let's try this again. What we're gonna do here is we're going to get the notes ID from MongoDB. So let's open up MongoDB again. So we'll say db.notes.find. We're going to copy this notes ID now, and we're going to paste it inside the URL in Postman. 
And there we go. So uh, one more thing here. I noticed that we had an error that was happening. I think that this is just the weird conflict error that I get every now and then. Uh, so let's try just killing it and running our server and front end again, and everything should work just like before. All right, so everything's looking good. Let's try sending this. And sure enough, we get 401 unauthorized. So now if we go back and add this auth token back to our request and click send, what we're going to see is that everything worked, except now obviously we didn't get hacked because it's us. Or a hacker got a hold of your ID token, which is a completely different topic here. So let's just change this back to, nope, it's just me. And we'll set the content to, it's all good. Okay, so we'll click send. That should take care of updating that note for us. And now if we go back here, we'll see that those changes are in effect inside our front end. Cool, so that's how we protect our update note route from unauthorized users changing our notes. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so to close out our route conversions here, the next thing we're gonna do is we're going to convert our create note route so that it makes sure users can only create notes on their own account. All right, so let's open up our create note route. And here's what this is all gonna look like. The first thing we're gonna do, of course, is import all as admin from Firebase admin. And once we've done that, we're going to wrap this in a try catch block. You probably know the drill by now. So wrap this all, I'm gonna copy and paste all of this into here. All right, we'll adjust the indentation as well. There we go. And then we'll say catch E and inside here, as we've done before, we're gonna say response.status or response.send status rather, 401. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is just like we've done before, we're gonna get the auth token header by saying const auth token equals request.headers. We're going to verify that token by using Firebase admin. And to do that, we're just gonna say const auth user equals await admin dot auth dot verify ID token. And we're going to pass that auth token. You know the drill again. And now that we have that auth user, what we need to do is make sure that that auth user's ID matches this user ID URL parameter up here, okay? So in order to do that, we just have to wait till we get user ID, which we have it now. Uh, and we're gonna say if auth user dot UID does not equal user ID, then tell them to take a hike, send them back a 403 status code. So we're gonna say return response dot send status 403. Okay, otherwise we're going to create that note with the specified user ID and the title and all that kind of stuff, putting the user's ID as the created by property and generating a new note ID. And finally sending all of that back to the client side by saying response.json blah, blah, blah. Cool, so that's our create note route. Uh, let's just test this thing out. That was pretty simple actually. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over here we're gonna make sure that this still works by saying, does this work? Click on create. And sure enough, it looks like that works. Um, and let's test and make sure that a user can't create notes on another user's account. And for this one, we can actually use our auth token header that we copied and pasted. And let's just try and add a note to another user's account. We're gonna say slash users slash one, two, three slash notes, right? User one, two, three doesn't exist here, but Let's just pretend. And here, this should actually be a post request. And for the body, we'll just say title hacked, just in case it gets through, because it's always fun to see hacked show up and know that it was you. All right, so let's click on send now, and we'll see 403 forbidden. And this is not because our auth token isn't valid, because it is. We're getting 403 instead, because the ID here doesn't match the ID of the user that the auth token belongs to. All right, now if we were to just not include an auth token at all and click send, we would see that 401 unauthorized again. So 
That's how we convert over our create endpoint to make sure that users can only create new notes on their own account. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so we have all four of our routes so far protected from manipulation by other users who don't own the data. Okay, now you may have found that all of the code we've written for these routes is a little bit repetitive, right? In other words, uh, we have this same try catch block, we have this same const auth token, auth user, blah, blah, blah. And we have, uh, in most of them anyway, some sort of logic checking to make sure that the uh, user ID of the auth token is equal to the user ID of the user we're trying to modify. All right, so you might have found yourself wondering, is there an easier way or a less repetitive way to do all of this? Now, previously, when we took a look at the friend tracker application and how to add this kind of protection to that, we saw that basically what we could do is instead of saying app.get, app.post, app.blah, blah, blah, we could say app.use and this would allow us to put in some so-called middleware that would apply the same logic to multiple routes. Now, this is one way of doing it, and if you recall, this saved us quite a bit of repetitive code, but this is not the only way to do it, and in particular, our needs for this application are going to be different than what we saw with our friend tracker application. Okay, so with this application, what we're gonna want to allow users to do is uh, a, share data, right? We're going to want to allow them to share their notes with each other. So in other words, at this point, we could simplify probably by pulling this kind of logic out into some middleware. But once we get to doing things like sharing notes, we're not going to want that there on every route because there are going to be instances when a user should be able to read or update a note where they don't actually own that note, okay? Now the point here is that we need something that will allow us to be a little bit more granular with the logic that we write inside our routes that protects them without being as repetitive as we've been up here. So what we're going to do, I'm going to show you a way to add middleware to different routes in an express application without having to add it to all of the routes. Now to do this, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to create a new folder inside our backend which we'll call middleware. And this is basically going to contain all of the code that will protect our routes in one way or another. Okay, there's going to end up being quite a few things that will uh, add to this. Okay, so the first thing here is going to be a middleware function that will make sure that the user has included this auth token and that that auth token is valid. And what we'll call that, we'll call that something like verify auth token dot js. And here's what this is going to look like. This is going to be a middleware function that we're exporting here. And if you recall from when we saw this earlier in our friend tracker application, when we create a middleware function, it has three arguments. So if we say export verify auth token equals, oh, and this should be export const verify auth token. Uh, this has three arguments request and response. These are the same things as we would have seen in any other uh, route handler. And additionally, it has a next function, which will basically turn control of the program over to whatever the next middleware or the corresponding route handler for the request would be. All right, so this is basically just a callback that we can call to say, okay, we're done. Whatever the route handler is, take it away. All right, and what we're gonna do inside this verify auth token thing is make sure that the auth token that the user has provided on their request is valid. Okay, so all that's gonna look like is we're gonna say try and catch, and this is going to look very familiar to you. We're gonna say import all as admin from Firebase admin, and then we're gonna go down here and say const auth token equals request.headers, right? We're able to access the request headers and all information about the request inside our middleware function, just like we were in our route handlers. And once we've got that, we're gonna say const auth user equals await admin.auth.verifyID token auth token. 
Okay, and then in the catch block, we're obviously going to say response.sendStatus 401. And that's it. The only other thing we have to do is uh, call the next callback from inside the try catch block, or inside the try block, that is. And that will basically say everything is good. You can continue executing, you know, the route handler or whatever's next can continue the program from here. Awesome. So that's our first middleware function that we've defined specifically for this purpose. So how do we add this thing to routes? Well, if we open up our server dot js file the normal way of adding middleware to all of the routes in our application which admittedly we would want to do in this case would be to do something like this we would just say app dot use and pass that middleware function here uh, what, what do we call it verify auth token we would pass that there and that would take care of basically making sure that the auth token was valid before allowing it to go on to the next route okay so that's one way of doing it however if we want to take a more granular approach and allow ourselves to add different middleware to different routes, there's a different way that I'm going to show you, and that is that we're able to add middleware onto specific routes simply by passing it as an argument in between the path and the route handler when we say app.get, app.post, etc. Right, so uh, in other words, we could say app.get. The first thing here would be the path, the second thing here would be a middleware function of some sort. So res request, response, next, etc. Blah, blah, blah. And then we would have the actual handler for the route, which would be request, response, etc. Now that might seem a little silly to have these two things in a row. And the main advantage of that is it allows us to define middleware in its separate file and reuse it with different routes. So what we can do with our verify auth token middleware if we want to add it to all of our routes right now, we can just add that right in here by saying verify auth token. And that will take care of verifying the token on all of our routes without us having to include that same logic over and over and over again like we've been doing. Okay, so one thing I want to do before this will actually work is this auth user thing, in order for us to not have to call this same exact function inside the rest of our routes, we're gonna have to make this available to the rest of our routes. And as you might remember from our friend tracker application, we can set this auth user as a property on the request itself by saying something like request.user equals auth user. All this does is just sets a user property on the request that we can then access from inside our routes that are behind this middleware function, okay? So in other words, routes that don't use this, as we'll see later on, will not be able to access request.user because it won't have been set. Okay, so now what we can do, now that we've added this middleware to all of our routes, we can actually go into each of those routes. So we'll start off with create note route, I suppose. And instead of having to get the auth token and get the auth user, we can just say const auth user, oops, there we go, equals request.user. And everything should work just like before without us having to uh, use the try catch block. And we can even remove this try catch block, which I highly recommend. And we can also remove the catch response.send status thing down at the bottom here because that's all taken care of for us inside this verify auth token uh, middleware function that we created. All right, and we can also remove the Firebase admin import since we don't need that anymore. So let's do our list notes route now. This is gonna be the same kind of thing. We're gonna remove these two uh, lines up here at the top. Instead of saying auth user .uid, uh, we're going to say const auth user equals request.user, since we've already done that calculation, and everything should work there. We can just remove the try catch block here as well, and that's all we need to do. All right, next up for our update notes route, we're going to do the same thing, remove the try catch block. We'll remove the catch statement here and the logic there. Uh, we're going to unindent this, and instead of saying auth token auth user, we're going to say const auth user equals request.user. And last but not least, we're going to do that for our delete note route. We're going to delete the try catch block. All right, so delete this here, delete this here, unindent this, and remove the top two lines and replace them with const auth user equals 
oops, there we go, auth user equals request.user. And there we go. So let's make sure that everything's working. It looks like I have a Babel error, and I think that, ha rephrase, and I think that that has to do with not putting async on our um, middleware function here. Yep, sure enough, we need to say async, and that should take care of that. So there we go, we see that our server's running, so let's go back and test all of our routes using our uh, application here. Let's refresh it. It should load all our notes. We can click on one, we can edit it, we can save it, that works. We can now go back here and delete a note, and that works too. And likewise, if we create a note, we'll say hello and click create, and sure enough, that note shows up. So everything is working just the same way as before. If you wanna test out the uh, protection mechanisms using Postman, feel free to do so. Um, I'm just gonna send one here and we'll see that we get the same thing back. Feel free to go through all the routes with that if you wanna be a little bit paranoid, which is a good idea when working with user authentication. And that's basically all we need to do. So the next thing that I wanna show you here, now that we've added this verify auth token middleware, and added it to all of our routes. Here, let's just go back to our server file. In general, we're gonna want to be able to add middleware to specific routes. So what I'm gonna recommend we do instead of what we did here, right, just putting the middleware function directly in uh, when we're mapping through all of our routes, what I'm gonna recommend we do is on each specific route object that we define, in addition to having path, method, handler, etc. What we're gonna do is we're going to add another property to these objects, which will be called something like middleware. Oops, let me spell that right there, middleware. And what this will do is it'll allow us to define what middleware functions this route wants, right? So this is going to be an array. And inside here, we're going to say verify auth token because we want that on this route. Uh, and we can also delete this admin thing here. We don't need that anymore. And once we've done that, we're gonna go back through the rest of our routes and do that later on, but uh, just to show you what this will look like, once we've done that, we can say dot, 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 route, dot, middleware. And since this is an array, what this uh, spread operator here will do is it'll take all of our middleware and put it as multiple arguments in between our path and our handler, which we're allowed to do in Express Apps, right? We're allowed to pass multiple middleware functions as arguments in between path and handler. All right, so we can remove now verify auth token from our imports. And let's go and add this verify auth token uh, middleware to the rest of our routes. I'm just going to copy this. We're gonna open up create note route. We'll paste that here. I'll open up our update note route. We'll paste that here. And I'll open up our list notes route and we will paste that here. Okay, and let's delete the admin import from these as well since we no longer need it. There we go, we got it all. And that should be about it for verifying the auth ID token. We've been able to pull that stuff into a single reusable function that we can simply set on all of our routes. So just to make sure this all works still and that I didn't mess something up, let's try loading some data and making some other operations. All right, looks like everything's working so far. Let's add some content, save changes. Looks like that worked. Let's uh, try adding a note, blah, 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 click create. And let's try deleting that note. Yes, and it looks like everything is working. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so one last thing that I wanna take a look at here, now that we've seen how to add a middleware function for verifying auth tokens, and we've seen how to apply that to specific routes just by the way we specify our route settings in each route file, the next thing I wanna do is take a look at how to reduce our repetition even more by adding more middleware to specific routes, okay? So if we open up our routes and just take a look at some of the code that's in there, I'm just gonna open up all these files. One of the things that we see in a few routes is checking to see whether or not a user actually owns a note. Okay, so we have it in our update note route. We have it in our delete note route. It's the exact same code, right? In fact, you can flip back and forth between these and see that that part of the code doesn't actually change. Okay, and also this part above it doesn't change either. So 
What we're gonna do is we're gonna create some middleware that will take care of checking that for us. And what that's gonna look like is this. We're gonna create a new file in our middleware folder. And what we're gonna call this new middleware, we're gonna say something like user owns note.js. Okay. All right, and inside this file, we're gonna write our middleware function, which will look something like this. We're gonna say export const user owns note. And what this is gonna do, it's gonna take the request, response, and next. And we're gonna have to make some assumptions inside this middleware that will probably be true, right? It's just something that we'll have to make sure of when we add this to different routes. The first assumption that we're gonna make is that the path has a note ID in it. Okay, so our path is gonna need to have a URL parameter called note ID that will allow us to actually figure out what note um, the user is trying to access. So that's the first assumption, all right, assumption number one. The second assumption is that this middleware is going to come after the verify ID token middleware. So what that means is that we'll already have access to the verified user inside this middleware on the request argument, okay? So we'll say after ID token middleware. And those are our two assumptions for now. I think that that's it, but maybe there will be one or two more. We'll see when we get there. So anyway, knowing that we have access to the note ID URL parameter, all we're gonna do is I'm just going to go into update note route and copy this stuff here. And I'm going to put it inside this user owns note middleware now. And additionally, we're gonna have to get the note ID by saying const note ID equals uh, request.params. Okay, so anyway, that's what the middleware is gonna look like. The last thing we need to do is just say next, and that will send the program on to whatever the corresponding route is that comes after this middleware. Okay, so let's add this to the corresponding routes and remove that logic that was inside of them. So for our update note route, we can just remove this part here. And in middleware, oops, which I've actually spelled wrong here. Let me try that again. Uh, let me make sure I didn't, oh no, it looks like I made the same typo all over the place. Let's change this, that's awful. All right, yeah, middleware, I forgot the E and I copied it and pasted it. Genius, Sean, genius. All right, so let's add the uh, user owns note middleware to these routes now. And I removed all of the corresponding uh, logic so far. And the same thing is gonna be in our delete note route. We're gonna add user owns note middleware. And down here, we can delete this same logic from there. Okay, and we are still gonna need our note ID thing, but we won't actually need this auth user thing now because that was the only place we were using it inside this, uh, inside this delete note route. Okay, and for update note route, the same thing is true. We no longer need auth user, but we do still need this verify auth token middleware because we still need it to protect our route from users who aren't authenticated. So anyway, uh, one last thing that I'm noticing here just from the syntax coloring is that we didn't add the async keyword to user owns notes. So let's add that there and let's test this thing out now. I don't think that there's anything else we need to do, although we might want to add something for this as well, since it looks very similar and we're doing the same thing in our create note route. We'll come back for that, but let's first check our user owns note middleware. So what we're going to try and do again is we're going to try and uh, just load a note that only this user should have access to. Oops, it looks like we have some kind of error going on here first. Verify auth token is not defined. Ah, that's because we need to actually import it. So let's say import verify auth token from middleware verify auth token. I think we might have to do that for some of these other ones as well. Okay, import verify auth token and for update, we're gonna have to do the same thing, import verify auth token. And we also have to import user owns note, which apparently wasn't imported either. Okay, so for that one and for this one, we're gonna have to import those user owns note. And that should be all for now. Uh, oops, it looks like we still have a babble parse error. What's going on here? Ah, it looks like I re-imported this in delete note route. So, oh yeah, there it is. All right, so I can delete that. 
Anything else? All right, it looks like I might have done the same thing here. Yep, sure enough, I missed it. I don't know what I was thinking there when I did that. So I'll delete that again. Anything else? All right, it looks like we just got that address and use thing. So let's restart our app and everything should be working now, hopefully. All right, so we're just gonna test it in our user interface here first, and then we'll try and hack it using Postman. So first of all, we'll try adding a note. It looks like that works. We'll try editing a note like this. Looks like that works. Oops, looks like that doesn't work actually. So let's see what's going on here when we try and update our note. What are we getting back from the server? Looks like that's just pending, so some kind of error is happening here. And that error, oh, it just says notes DB is not defined, so we need to import that as well into our user owns note. So we're just gonna need to say import notes DB. Man, I really was not on it with the imports here, was I? We're just gonna import notes DB, and is there anything else that we need? I don't believe so. It looks like that's probably it. So let's try this again, all right? Server's listening on port 8080. Let's go back to our front end and try and edit this note again. We're gonna click on save changes. And it looks like we're still not getting it. Let's see what's going on again. Okay, auth user is not defined. Ah, yes, because we forgot to say const auth user equals request.user, right? Because this comes after the other middleware. So once again, let's try and edit this note. We're gonna click on save changes. And there we go. So we can edit our notes now to our heart's content and everything is working there. So let's try uh, deleting a note now. That's our last thing we're gonna have to check. And if we click on yes here, it looks like something went wrong. Let's click on inspect and see what's up. All right, let's go to our network tab and we're gonna click the delete button again, click yes. And let's go back to here and see what's going on here. Ah, so it looks like in our delete note route, it says note is not defined. And that's because we actually removed the logic for loading the note inside of here. So this brings me to something else I wanted to talk about. And that is, while we're saying whether the user owns the note or not, why don't we just take this note and stick it onto the request object? We can do that by saying request.note equals note. And then inside our delete note route, instead of having to load the note again, what we're gonna do is say const note equals request dot note. And that should get rid of the error we were seeing. Let me just do a quick scan and see if there's anywhere else we were doing that, like in our delete note route uh, or in our update note route. Nope, it looks like all of those were good. So let's go back and try deleting this note again. We're gonna click on the delete button, click yes. And it looks like something happened again, so. Can I read property created by of null? Oh, you know what? This is just happening because the note was actually deleted from the database, but it's still in our front end. So let's refresh our front end here. And yep, we're getting that same kind of error that we got from before. Basically when it's deleted from the notes database, but not from the user's database. Now I will admit that I was very tempted to cut this stuff out in the editing process, but I wanted to leave it because honestly, this is the kind of error that you run into quite frequently in full stack development. And sometimes you just wanna pull your hair out. So I wanted to show you how I would go about troubleshooting this thing. And I really want you to be familiar with this kind of uh, perma crash sort of error that's caused by inconsistent data in the database. So to fix this, we're just gonna have to go back into our database and do something like what we saw before. We're gonna say db.users.findPretty. One of these note IDs here doesn't exist anymore, so let's say db.notes.findAll.pretty. And let's see here, which note no longer exists. It looks like it's this CF blah, blah, blah one. So let's copy this, and we're going to remove that note from our user's notes property. So we'll say db.users.find or dot uh, update anyway, dot update one. We're gonna need the user's ID, so I'm gonna have to copy that first actually. Oops, and that should be ID, there we go. And now we're going to update this note by saying dollar sign pull, and we want to remove from the notes property the ID, this one right here, which I'm going to copy and paste. 
oops, there we go, paste that here, and close off our curly braces and hit enter. And now our user should no longer have that ID on there, which means we should be able to go back here, refresh, and have it work just like before. So let's test out our delete function again. We're gonna try and delete one of these notes, and sure enough, it works now. So after that fiasco, our middleware is now working just the way we wanted it to, and our code is a lot less repetitive, although perhaps some would argue a little more error prone. The choice is yours at the end of the day over whether you wanna do these things or not, and whether or not you think that these really add to your code. If you find that things like this make your code harder to maintain, then by all means, just write that repetitive code in your, uh, in your routes. So anyway, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. A little while ago, we saw how to allow users to create accounts in our application just using Firebase Auth on the front end. But the thing is that now that we're storing user data in our database and relying on that data actually, you know, being there when the user is accessing our application, we need to make sure that we keep the data in our database in sync with the user data on Firebase Auth. So what we're gonna do today is take a look at some of the options that are available for us in, you know, just ensuring that this kind of data synchronization happens. And that's going to involve adding some special endpoints to our backend. So that's what we're gonna take a look at here today, as well as just a few other stray topics about user management in the context of a full stack application. So without further ado, let's jump right in. All right, so to get started here, I wanna do a quick demonstration of our app so far and how it allows us to keep users' data separate from each other, All right? So currently, we've just been developing our app with a single user, and I have the Firebase console open here. I'm just gonna go into authentication. And basically, all of the notes and all of the interaction that we've done with this app have been done through this single user. But now that we've actually implemented basic data segregation, so to speak, we can actually create more users and have each of those users log in separately, manage their notes separately, and, you know, we shouldn't run into any problems. So just to demonstrate that this all works, let's click on add user and add a new user to our application. Let's do uh, jane at gmail.com and we'll do abc123 and we'll click on add user. And now we should be able to log in with this user instead of with john at gmail.com as we've been doing. So let's run our app. Okay, if you don't already have it running, I'm just gonna do npm run dev. And there we go, our front end is up and running. Okay, so notice that we're logged in as john at gmail.com right now, and we have this one note here, all right? And just to make this demonstration a little bit more dramatic, I guess, let's just add a few more notes. We're gonna add a note here, we'll say, uh, just another note, click on create, we'll add one more, we'll say one more, click create, and there we go, right? So these are John's notes. Now, in order to log in as a different user currently, since we don't have a logout button, we're gonna have to add that shortly. Uh, what we're gonna do is we're just going to copy this URL up here, go into incognito mode, which doesn't have any of the credentials and stuff saved like it does in the regular browser mode and we're going to paste this and open up our login page, right? So let's type in jane at gmail.com now and the password, which just so happens to be the same as john at gmail.com's password. And now we're gonna click login and that should take us to the home page. And right off the bat, we're gonna see that something isn't quite right, right? We have this loading message and it looks like some kind of error is occurring. Now this error, is actually something that's going on in the server and it has to do with the fact that unlike with john at gmail.com, we haven't inserted a corresponding user object into uh, the user's database for our new email that we created in uh, Firebase Auth. So what we're gonna have to do is the same thing that we did for john at gmail.com. We're gonna have to say db.users.insert1 
Okay, and we're going to insert a new user with the ID property equal to whatever the Firebase user's ID property is equal to. So to get that, we can just go back here. We're gonna copy this ID. Oops, there we go. And we're going to paste it inside of here. Okay, and after that, we're gonna say email. That's going to be, of course, jane at gmail.com. And then we're gonna say notes, and we'll start this off as an empty array. I, you don't actually need double quotes around that. I'm just gonna say notes, empty array. And that should be all we need for our user. We should see acknowledge true and inserted ID, object ID, blah, blah, blah. And now if we say db.users.find.pretty, uh, we'll see that both our users are in there and that both of them have pretty much the same information. So we should be able now to refresh our page back in our incognito browser. And we should see that everything loads successfully and that it displays there are currently no notes. Let's add one. So if we click on add a note and say my first note and click on create, we'll see that that works just fine. And of course, if we go back now and take a look at John's and refresh the page, we're gonna see that that note doesn't show up here, of course, right? And that has to do with the protective measures that we put in place on all of our routes. And just another thing that I wanna show you here is that let's say Jane is a hacker, all right? And wants to get at John's notes. Maybe, uh, maybe Jane wants to see what John's been up to, see if John put any passwords in the notes, etc. Our current server setup would protect John's data from that. And you can see this if you open up the inspector window here and go to network. And we're just gonna get the user's auth token from here. I'm gonna do copy value. And back in Postman, we're gonna try and make a request to load John's notes with uh, Jane's ID token. Okay, we're gonna turn that on. Okay, and let's say that we just wanna load John's notes. So we're gonna need to replace this here with John's ID. And to get that, we just have to go into the database. Now, this is something that Jane wouldn't necessarily have access to unless this was somehow exposed in our application. But just for the fun of it, let's pretend. We're going to paste John's ID in here now. And if we click on send, we'll see that instead of 401, which we get when we don't include an auth token, we get this forbidden thing, which uh, basically means that yes, your token is valid, but no, you're not allowed to access that data. All right, so this definitely reinforces that the data inside our database is fairly well protected from prying eyes. And this also has demonstrated that the user's data is indeed separate, right? Now, when I say separate, the interesting thing about this, if, if we go back to our Mongo shell here, is if we load all of the notes and say db.notes.find.pretty, we'll see that all of the notes for all of the different users are stored right next to each other in the database. And this is kind of the interesting thing about segregating our data uh, according to user, because even though the notes for different users are stored right next to each other in the database, users only have access to the notes that they themselves own. Now, really the only security measures in place for this are in our server-side logic. And this is one of the reasons that I generally recommend doing test-driven development when you're developing a secure server like this, just to make sure that all of your bases are covered and you don't accidentally change some kind of logic that gives users access to other users' notes all of a sudden. This could happen, for example, if, I don't know, uh, maybe the intern is rooting around in the code base, and maybe the intern makes a change that says const notes equals await notes db dot find, you know, something like that, or find many maybe, and then dot to array. Okay, maybe the intern thinks that the purpose of this endpoint is just to list all of the notes out of the database. Well, now all of the users have access to all of the notes in the database, as you can see, if you go back here and refresh. Oops, and oh, yeah, that's not find many, that's just find. I don't know what I was thinking there. I was thinking insert many, but whatever. All right, so if we go back here now and refresh the page, we're gonna see that all of a sudden, all of the notes that are in the database, including Jane's note here, shows up on John's profile. So that's kind of the potential danger 
of storing all of the data in the same database. Now, there's not really a way around this. Now, there are different ways you can implement your data structure in the database to help avoid this problem. But in general, the best defense is just writing tests for your application. Now, we're not going to go through that process here right now, but just know for future reference that I highly recommend having some kind of mechanism in place to tell you if the logic has been messed up in your routes in a way that would expose users' data. Okay, so anyway, that was just something I wanted to point out. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've seen a brief demonstration of how our data is segregated according to user in our application, the next thing that we're going to do is allow users to create new accounts through the Create Account page. Now, before we jump into this, what I want to do is add a logout button to our application because currently we're kind of stuck logged in as John unless we go into incognito mode. And, you know, at some point we're just going to have to allow users to log out of our application. So... In order to do that, we're going to create a logout button, and we're going to add that to the nav bar. So what I'm going to do here is in the front end, in our components folder, we're going to create a new component called logout button, and it's going to be a pretty simple component. We'll just say logoutbutton.js. Inside here, we're going to import the get auth function and the sign out function. And those are imported, of course, from the Firebase slash auth package. And once we have those two things, we're going to say export const log out button. And this is just going to be a very simple button. What we're going to do is say return. It's going to just be a button here that says log out. And when this button is clicked, it's going to actually sign the user out. So we'll say on click equals, and we'll define our own function up here that will be log out. And all that's going to do is say await, sign out, and pass the get auth function to that, like that. And that's pretty much all we need to do. Our routes should take care of automatically routing the user back to the login page once the user is successfully logged out. So let's pass this logout function to our logout button now. And let's add our logout button to our navbar. So let's open up navbar. We're going to import our logout button component. And once we've imported our logout button, we're just going to say logout button and display that inside of there. And now all we need to do is we're going to go to index.css here. And we're going to add display flex to our nav bar. And we'll also add justify content space between. And that should take care of uh, spacing out our heading and our logout button, right? So we see that our heading is now all the way over to the left-hand side and our logout button is all the way over to the right-hand side. Okay, so we can click on the logout button if we're logged in, of course, uh, as we just saw. Let me just log in here real quick to demonstrate again. We can click on the logout button now up in the nav bar and that will automatically send us back to the login page. All right, so now that we've allowed our users to actually log out, and this will allow us, of course, to see the create account page, let's talk in a little bit more detail about what exactly needs to happen when a user creates an account. Okay, we already saw what can happen if we do it wrong, right? When we just added that user directly to the Firebase auth in our Firebase auth console, we saw that that actually caused an error on the server because we didn't have a corresponding user for that ID in the users collection in MongoDB, right? So in other words, we had a user over here. You know, that's the way I'm drawing a user here, I suppose. Basically, whenever a new user is added to Firebase Auth, which I'm just gonna draw as this box here, we need to make sure that a corresponding user is created over here in our users collection uh, that will basically keep those two things in sync. Right now, the user in Firebase Auth has an ID that Firebase automatically generates for it, right? It's a big, long string of numbers, letters, etc. And that's going to be what we use to link up the users in our users collection with the users in Firebase Auth, right? So uh, each of our users here is basically going to have that ID property, as we saw, that's equal to this property here. So essentially what we need to do is whenever a user creates a new account, we're going to need to both create a new user in Firebase Auth, 
We're going to need to get the ID of that new user we created, and we're going to need to create a corresponding user object in our collection. So we've kind of seen this process earlier when we added create account functionality to our friend tracker application, but this implementation here is going to contain a few, you know, sort of special cases, so to speak. So let's take a look at what this is all going to look like. All right, let's go back here to our code. And what I'm going to do here is open up the create account form or the create account page rather that we created. And we already have this create user with email and password function being called. But again, as we've seen, if we actually do this, this will end up causing errors once the user is logged in because we won't have corresponding data in MongoDB. So what we're going to need to do here is get the ID of this user we just created and make a request to our backend with that ID saying, here you go, we want to create a new user now. Okay, so what this is going to look like is we're going to say const result equals await create user with email and password. And this is going to give us a lot of information about the user that was just created in Firebase Auth. Now among that information, of course, is going to be the user's ID, which is what we'll be sending to the server. And we're also going to get the user's ID token to make sure that it really is a new user that logged in that's creating the new item in the database, right? And this is necessary, right? It's necessary to send along the user's ID token because otherwise anybody could just send a request to our server saying, you know, hey, create a new user. It'll probably look something like this, post slash users. And, you know, they could create users in there in our database that don't actually have a corresponding user in Firebase Auth. So in order to prevent that, we're going to have the user send along their ID token and only allow them to create a new user if that ID token is actually valid. Now, this will also allow us to make sure that the email property that we're setting on our users in MongoDB matches the email in Firebase Auth. And the reason for that is that we can get this email property of a user from the ID token when we say verify ID token on the server. You'll see what that looks like shortly. So now that we've gotten the result of calling create user with email and password, the next thing that we're going to do here is we're going to say const token equals await result.user.getID token. All right, now you might be wondering why we're getting the token here when we have perfectly good functions inside that one hook that we created that automatically include the token in the headers. Well, the reason for that is just because of the way this is all working and the fact that we're calling this create account function before the user is logged in, we wouldn't actually be able to use those functions because as we saw, those functions have to update to reflect the current user. All right, so what we're gonna do here instead is we're just gonna get the token by calling result.user.getID token. And we're going to use Axios here directly by saying await, and here, let's actually import Axios up at the top, import Axios from Axios. And here, let me just put this thing down on the bottom there. I usually like to have my relative imports below my uh, actual package imports. Just a preference of mine. We're going to say axios.post, and we're going to send a request to a route that we haven't yet created, which is going to be slash users. Basically, uh, just like we can send a post request to slash notes to create a new note, we're going to send a post request to slash users to create a new user. So... Uh, the actual request body of this is going to look like this. It's going to include the user's ID. So we'll say user ID result.user.uid. And that's pretty much all we need to include for now. The rest of the information we'll be able to get from the header. And that's going to look like this. We're just going to say headers auth token token. All right. So once we've made that request to the server, we should be all good to go and send the user to the notes page, which will probably be blank for them at that point. All right, so now that we've modified this create account function to take into account, uh, no pun intended there, the new flow and the fact that we actually need user data behind the scenes in the database, what we need to do is create this corresponding users route for creating new users, okay? So let's open up our backend and go into source and routes, and we're gonna create a new route in here, which will be called create user route.js. Oops, and I put a space at the beginning of the file name there. Thanks for letting me know IDE. And what this route is gonna look like, we're gonna say export const create user route equals, 
And just like other routes, this is going to be an object. And the path here, as we've already established, is going to be slash users. The method is going to be a post request. And we're going to have the handler here, but also we're going to have middleware for this route, which will take away the uh, responsibility of actually verifying the ID token from this route handler. Now, if you recall, earlier we created this verify auth token middleware function that takes care of verifying the auth token that was sent along with the request and setting the user that corresponds to that auth token on request.user. So what that allows us to do inside create user route, well, first of all, we're gonna need to add that middleware. We'll say middleware, and we're gonna put in the verify auth token middleware there. Here, let me just change the quotation marks on here. And now we can simply access the user's information by saying const auth user equals request.user. And we know that the information on there is legit, right? We know that that contains the actual email address of the user. We know that that contains the actual ID of the user. So we don't really need to do anything else. And actually, now that I say that, we don't really need to send along this user ID in the request body, right? We can just say headers auth token token. And for the body here, we'll just put an empty object. And then we'll just be able to get the ID for the new user from this request.user thing. That's a little bit safer of a way to do that as well, since we know that that can't have been tampered with. Cool, so the next thing we're gonna do now is insert a new user into the user's DB. And for that, we're gonna need to import the user's DB by saying user DB from dot dot slash DB. And then down here, what we're gonna do is say, const new user equals, and we're going to create the new information for this new user by saying ID. The ID property here is going to be the auth users ID property or UID property that is. The email is going to be the email on the auth user. So we can say auth user dot email. And we're also gonna insert an empty array for notes. Okay, so that's our new user object. Next, what we're gonna do is say const result equals await user DB. Oh, this should be users DB actually. There we go, I named it wrong up there. Glad I caught that one. Okay, so users DB, oops, that should be users DB, there we go, dot insert one. And we're going to insert the new user into our user DB, all right? So now that we've done that, we have this result and this result contains the inserted ID of this record that we just inserted into our database. So in order to send back to the user the updated user information, what we're gonna do is say response.send, or response.json rather, and we're going to insert all of the information from the new user, like that. And additionally, we're gonna add the underscore ID property, which will be result.insertedID. Okay, so that'll send back to the client side the complete new user object uh, so that if the client side needs to do something with it, it can. Now, as it happens, we're not really going to need to do that right now just because of the way our application works. But nevertheless, it's a useful thing to send back just in case we need it. So that should be all we need to do, the basics at least, for our create user route. There are a few more things I want to add to this shortly. Uh, so let's export this from our index.js file. We need to do that in order for this route to actually become part of our server, remember. And what I'm going to do is keep the note routes separate from the user routes, just, uh, you know, by putting a space in between them. So let's say import create user route from its file, and we're going to export it. I'm going to do the same thing here and say create user route. And that should add the create user route to our application now. Okay, so let's give this thing a try. What we're gonna do is try creating a new user from our create account page. So let's, uh, I just need to restart my application here because I was getting that one error that we see from time to time. And it looks like our server's running correctly and it'll open up our front end and we should be able to create a new account now. So let's try creating a new account. We're gonna say john2 at gmail.com. We're gonna have the password be abc123, same thing for the confirm password. And now if we click on create account, we should be automatically navigated to the notes page and we should see that we have no notes currently. All right, so let's test out adding a note now with this new user. We're gonna say, hello, this is my first note. 
We're gonna create it. Sure enough, that one is there. We can edit this note and say, I'm not sure what to write yet, but this is fun. Click Save Changes. Looks like updating the note is working. And of course, if we wanna delete it, let me just actually create a new note here called Delete This. And we can delete that by clicking the Delete button. All right, so everything's working with this user. And if we go and take a look at our Mongo database, uh, which we can do by just saying db.users.findall.pretty, we should be able to see that john2 at gmail.com has a link to the note that we just created. And if we go into our notes, we're gonna say db.notes.findall.pretty. We should see that that note is in there and that it was created by uh, the user we just created. Okay, you can see that by looking at that user's ID there. And that's how we allow our users to create new accounts. All right, so that's obviously a very important part of uh, you know, any application is allowing users to actually create new accounts because we're not gonna just go into Firebase off and create them manually all the time. Uh, now, there are some more things that I wanna add to this, however. One of those things is we need to make sure that a user doesn't already exist with that email address. That could cause a little bit of confusion, as you might imagine. So the way that we're going to prevent that is we're gonna start off by finding if any users are in our database with that email address. And the way that we can do that would be by saying const existing user equals, and we'll say await users db dot find one. And we wanna find a user whose email, uh, whose email property equals the auth user dot email property. And if that user exists, we wanna make sure that we don't accidentally create a new user with that email by saying if existing user, right? So if there's already an existing user with that email, what we're gonna do is send back response dot status. And the status code that I usually use for this kind of situation where we, uh, where we just want to say that something already exists is 409. So I'm gonna say response dot send status 409. And that will send back an error to the client side saying that that user already exists. Okay, now on the other hand, if that user doesn't exist, then we're free to create this new user, insert it into the database, etc. We do wanna make sure, again, that we add the return keyword to uh, response.sendStatus so that it stops everything after this from executing. And in fact, I've already done this return thing a few times already, but you might actually want to just put everything else inside an else block to be safe, right? You don't have to, but uh, that's something you could do if you wanted to make extra sure that nothing else executed after returning some kind of status code. Great, and what we'll see now is if we try and create a new account with an email that already has an account, all right, we're gonna log out here and say john2 at gmail.com and try it again. Oh, here, let's try uh, creating an account. There we go. We're gonna go to john2 at gmail.com. We're gonna put in a password again. And if we click on create account now, what we should see is we're gonna get this auth email already in use thing. And as a matter of fact, this is coming from Firebase itself, right? Firebase auth doesn't want duplicate emails either. So in most cases, this logic here will never be called unless somebody is maliciously trying to insert new user data into our server, or if our database somehow gets out of sync with Firebase auth. Now that shouldn't happen and there are different ways to prevent that from happening. But for now, this is good enough. So anyway, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we have our app set up so that users can actually create accounts and the endpoint that does that, remember, will help keep our database in sync with Firebase off, the next thing that we're gonna do is take a look at how to do error handling in an application like ours. Okay, so currently there are a lot of things that can go wrong in our app and when they go wrong, the user doesn't actually get any feedback or worse, it actually causes our app to crash. And we saw that this was the case, for example, if the user tries to create an account with an email that already has an account on Firebase Auth, right? If we try and create another account with john at gmail.com, for example, and click create account. Uh-oh, our app is gonna crash with this error saying auth email already in use. 
Now, obviously, this is not the best thing for user experience. We want to tell our users uh, when they did something wrong without our app crashing. And that's what we're going to take a look at how to do right here. So another thing we're going to have to take a look at is when the user tries to log in, I believe that the same thing might happen if the user puts in the wrong password. If they say john at gmail.com and then just type in the wrong password. Yep, sure enough, we get another error, which is auth slash wrong password from Firebase auth. And, you know, just in general, besides these ones that are happening on the front end, there are also quite a few errors that are happening on the back end as well, potentially, right? We saw that one error that occurred when the user tried to access notes and our user database was out of sync. And just as a reminder, that was caused inside our list notes route when basically we would try and get the user. We're just kind of assuming that the user exists here and we're saying user.notes.map and that right there would cause an error if the user doesn't exist. Okay, and the thing about these errors is that it's pretty easy to just pretend that they can't happen because the logic in our application doesn't allow them to happen, right? Currently, our create user route makes sure that the user database is kept in sync in theory. Okay, and that phrase in theory is something that applies quite heavily when you're designing an app that's as complex as this one and actually building it out, right? Because there might be some edge case that we haven't thought about that will cause our user database to be out of sync with Firebase auth. And in that case, we don't want thousands of errors happening in our server when, you know, a bunch of users do the same kind of thing that causes that error. Okay, so what we're going to take a look at how to do is prevent errors like that from happening. And, uh, you know, it's just going to be a fun time. So let's start off here with our login and create account pages, because those are the first page that a lot of users will actually run into in our site, and we want it to be perfect. So let's open up our login page and login form. And we're going to open up our create account page and create account form. All right, so... First of all, there's a few ways that we can go about this, but all of them are going to involve us displaying some kind of error above our login form when some kind of error occurs, right? So that'll probably be a little div here with, uh, you know, uh, a red background that says something like error and then a description of the error, right? So that's what we're going to want to do, and we can choose essentially where we want to display that, right? Do we want to display that in the login form, or do we want to display it in the login page? When we were first designing the login form, uh, we were very explicit about keeping things like the login title and uh, basically anything else that might not go along with the login form if we were to change the situation where the user is logging in, right? In other words, if the user were to log in through a modal instead, okay, we might not want to have this H1 heading and we also wouldn't want to have this uh, create account link to the create account page because that wouldn't be how that would work if we were displaying this form inside of a modal. So with displaying errors though, I'm gonna argue that this is something that belongs in the login form because it's something that we're always gonna to want to do when the user tries to log in, right? There's never gonna be a time when the login form isn't going to have to display some kind of error uh, if you know something goes wrong during the login process. So here's how we're gonna do that because currently, the login functionality here is in the login page, right? It's not actually in the login form. So the first way that occurs to me anyway to add an error to our login form would be to have our component use an error prop. Okay, so we'll say error and on submit. And then if any errors occur inside our login function here, what we'll do is we'll have a state variable which we'll call errors. We'll say const error and set error equals use state, and this will just be an empty string to start with. And if an error occurs while logging in, we're going to wrap this in a try catch block so that we'll catch any errors. And then we'll say catch E. And whatever error occurs, we're just going to say set error to E. All right. And then what we can do is we can just pass this error state variable down to our login form like this. We can say error equals error. And then our login form can take care of displaying that. Now, we're going to want to display this error above the inputs here. So here's what that's going to look like. We're going to say paragraph, and we'll just display the error string inside of there. And we only want this to display, of course, if an error exists. So we're going to say error and error. 
and that will hide it if there is no error. So, so let's go back and check on this so far. Let's see how it works. Oops, we need to import use state in our login page apparently. Uh, here, let's move this down to there. We'll import use state up at the top here from React. All right, and if we go back now, what we're gonna see if we log in poorly, all right, if we log in here, ah, it looks like we're getting an error because the error that's occurring that we're catching is actually not a string as I was assuming it would be. So the way you do this actually is by saying e.message. That'll give us the message of the error. And let's try this thing again. We're just gonna input stuff like that. And we can see this error here. Now, in general, you're not gonna want to use the raw Firebase string. And as we saw in the friend tracker application, the way that we can change this is by actually having a mapping between the corresponding Firebase error and whatever we want the actual message to be. So let's do that here in our login uh, form. What we're gonna do is we're going to say const, oops, let me try that again. Const error message map. And what this is gonna be is the strings that we get from Firebase auth. So I'm gonna copy this one here and I'm gonna paste it there. And as the mapping here, we're gonna give it the string that we want our app to actually display. So uh, for that, we're gonna say something like, please enter a valid email. All right, uh, so let's just play around and get some other errors. Let's enter a valid email, but one that doesn't exist. We'll say at gmail.com, click login. Okay, we get this other one that says auth slash user not found. So let's paste that there and we'll say an account does not exist with that email. All right, so um, what else can we do? Uh, let's do an actual user that exists, but with a password that's wrong, right? Just, and we might have to refresh that here. Let me just try that and say john at gmail.com. And then for the password, we'll say blah, blah, blah. Click log in. And here we go, we get wrong password. I'm not sure why it stuck the last time, but uh, anyway, this gives us the wrong password message. So I'm just going to paste that in there now, and we'll say incorrect password as our string. Okay, now there might be a few other errors that could occur, right? Uh, I would imagine there's an error for if uh, the request times out to Firebase or something like that. But for now, we're just gonna keep these three, and if we get any others, we'll just display that raw string. So here's how this is gonna work. We're gonna use our error message map down here to display whatever the corresponding error message up here is that we want to show above our input. So we'll say error message map and try and find that error inside of there. Otherwise, what we'll do is return the string an error occurred. Okay, not a super helpful error string, but hopefully if all goes well, we should never see that one. And now if we go back here, we'll see that incorrect password is displayed instead of the actual Firebase auth error. And if we enter in stuff that doesn't exist too, we'll see that that says, please enter a valid email. If we enter a valid email that doesn't exist, oops, dot gmail.com, we'll see that we get an account does not exist with that email. So let's just add a little bit of styling to this thing here to make it uh, you know, a little bit more uh, appealing visually. What we're gonna do, Oops, I don't know why I just closed all of those. Let's try this again. Let's open up login form. And what we're gonna do is add a class name to our error message here, uh, which will be something like, we'll just say error. And then we'll open up our index.css. And for this one, we're going to add an error class that says dot error. And for this, we'll say background color and we'll set that background color to red and we'll set the actual color here to white. So it'll be white text on red. Might be a little bit too intense and uh, you know hard on the eyes, but let's take a look and see what that looks like. Ooh, yeah, that's kind of uh, it's kind of hard to read there. Um, you know what? Let's just do background color and do something like pink. That'll actually look surprisingly good, I believe. And we'll remove color. And yeah, that's that seems to fit with the error theme there. So let's just put a little bit of padding around this error by saying padding. We'll do something like eight picks. See how that looks. Yep, that's looking pretty good. And then as pretty much all of the other square elements in my applications generally have, we're gonna say border radius and we'll do eight picks. Okay, oops, there we go. And that is what 
our error message looks like now on our login page. Cool, so let's go do this on our create account page. And our create account page is gonna have some different kinds of errors than what we saw on our login page. So uh, what we're gonna do for this one is we're gonna open up our create account form and our create account page, which I opened and then closed again earlier. And we're gonna do the same thing that we did with our login page and login form. And inside our create account page, we're gonna have uh, a state variable called error and set error, and we'll set that equal to use state, and it'll start off as an empty string here. So now when an error does occur when the user is creating an account, uh, what we're gonna do here, we'll just wrap this entire thing in a try catch block, and we'll say catch error, and if an error occurs, we'll say set error to error.message, and what that will allow us to do here is check to see if the password is equal to confirm password. And if it's not, then we can throw an error and have this error flow that we're gonna set up here take care of that just the same way as it would take care of Firebase auth errors, as you'll see. All right, so essentially what we're gonna do, I'm gonna say if password does not equal confirm password. Oops, let's try deleting those here. I'm gonna just change this around a little bit and say if that's the case, throw a new error with the message. And we'll just put a message in here uh, saying something like password and confirm password. Don't, uh, here I gotta use a backslash here, don't match. And there we go. Okay, so that should throw an error message. This thing will pick up on the message and we're gonna have to have another uh, error message map for our create account page, just like we did in our login page. So we'll say const, oh here, that'll actually be in the form. Uh, let's go into here. And first of all, we're gonna add an error prop. And then inside our create account form, we'll say const error message map equals. And now we just have to generate some errors. So let's display this error first. We'll say if error exists, then we wanna display a paragraph tag with the error inside of it. Uh, or here, we'll do error message map error, like that, or the string an error occurred as the backup. Oh, and actually that's not gonna work yet. Let's just display the error itself for the time being. I'm just gonna comment that out. Oops, I didn't wanna do that. You know what? I'll retype that in a minute. <laughs> We're just gonna display the error for now so that we can see it. So we'll say error. And that should be all we need to do besides passing this error state through to our create account form component. We'll say error equals error. And we should be good. Oh, we need to import use state. I made that same mistake before. We'll say import use state from react. And there we go. All right, so let's test out our create account with some uh, dumb stuff here. We're just gonna enter that, no password. We'll click create account and we see that that says internal errors. So we'll just copy that. And actually let's take a look at what that error was. All right, we should be able to uh, click this again and see that happen. Okay, so we're getting a 400 request, which means that the request was malformed and that's because we're not including any kind of a password in the request. So for this one, we're just going to copy that and paste it into our create account form error message map. And this will say something like, uh, Please double check your information and re-enter. Okay, we'll do something like that. That should be good for now. And the next one, let's try actually entering some passwords, but ones that don't match. Okay, and this will be an error message that's coming from us. And that one we can just leave, right? So that one we'll just put in an entry here. Uh, oops, let's try that again. We'll just paste that. Oops, I meant to copy that. I guess I didn't get it. Let's try it again. Okay, we're gonna paste that now. Uh, and I'm gonna have to insert a backslash there. And then we'll do the same thing, which I can just copy from here and paste. And we gotta add those single quotes there to make that work. And now if that happens, that'll give us the same thing. And now if we enter in passwords that do match, I'll just do ABC123. ABC123, 
And if we enter in uh, an email that isn't an actual email and click create account, we'll see the invalid email thing again. So that one we can just copy from our create or uh, from our login form. And okay, we'll just copy this one here and paste it in here. Okay, so please enter a valid email it will be displayed for this one. Uh, let's enter in a valid email now, but one that already has an account for it. And now if I click on create account, what we're gonna see is that we'll get this email already in use string, which we can use to say a user already exists with that email address. All right, so those should be all of the major errors that we'll run into. Let's just convert this now to display messages from our error message map instead of just plain errors. We're gonna say error message map error. Or, and I've actually been displaying, uh, you know, just a standard message like I did in the login form, but since I did that, I've changed my mind. I wanna just display the error message itself if we get one that we haven't put in here, just in case there's one that we've forgotten about um, so that we're not just displaying a, a pointless message. So let's just say error message map error, or we'll display the error message itself. And that should be all we need to do. So let's try and do this again. We're gonna see that this says a user with that email address already exists. If we add some extra stuff and make the passwords not match, we'll see password and confirm password don't match. Uh, if we put in something that isn't an email address uh, and make the passwords match because the password matching comes first, we're gonna see please enter a valid email. And I believe that's it. So uh, now we just have to add the correct class name to this paragraph tag. So we'll say class name equals, and then this will be error, just like our other one that we saw. Okay, we see, please enter a valid email now, looking good. So that should be all we need to do for the error handling on our login and create account pages. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. At this point, we're pretty far into our note sharing application series, and you may have found yourself wondering, when are we going to see how to allow users to actually share their notes with other users, right? That's a pretty critical piece of functionality in a note sharing application, as you might imagine. Well, if that's what you've been wondering all along, then your wait is over. That's what we're gonna take a look at how to do today. So specifically, we're gonna be seeing how to add basic note sharing functionality to the front end. In other words, we're going to be creating the basic components and logic for actually allowing users to share notes with other users. So that's our basic plan of attack here. Let's jump right in. All right, so to get started with implementing the sharing functionality in our note sharing application, which admittedly has taken us a little bit of time to get to, Let's first talk about how exactly we're going to allow users to share their notes with other users. Okay, now the basic concept of it is this. Currently in our notes database and in our users database, we have the concept of who owns what note. And the way we do that is in our users database, for example, we might have a few different users and each of these users, of course, has a notes array, which is just an array of the IDs of the notes that that user owns. Okay, so those will sort of point to notes in the note database, so that if we have a bunch of notes over here like this, we can use those IDs in the user's notes array to actually find the notes that belong to the user and, uh, you know, make sure that certain users can only access the notes that they own. Okay, so what we're going to do to implement this concept of sharing notes with other users is, well, it's gonna be something very similar, actually. What we're gonna do is, in addition to each of these notes here having a created by property, right, which is the user that actually owns the note, or the ID of the user that owns the note, that is, we're gonna also give each of our notes a shared with property, which will be an array of IDs of all of the users that this note has been shared with, right? So uh, if it's been shared with one, two, three, we'll have one, two, three. If it's been shared with two, three, four, we'll have two, three, four, et cetera. All right, and you might be wondering if we're going to add a shared notes 
or something like that, right? Notes shared with user property on each of the users. That's an array of all the notes that have been shared with that user. But in reality, we don't really need to do that, and here's why. Let's assume that the user does have a shared notes property that contains all of the IDs that have been shared with the user. Well, in our server routes, what that would look like is we would have to load the user from the database, and then we would have to say user dot shared notes Right, and we'd have to actually load all of the shared notes from the database by saying map and mapping each shared note ID to you know an actual database query, right? By saying notes db dot uh, find one, etc. Now we already did this when we wanted to get all of the notes that belonged to a user, right? That the user had created, but let me show you an easier way. What we're going to do instead, and this really would have worked just fine for. Uh, displaying all of the notes that a user created as well. So maybe we'll end up changing that a little later on. Uh, but what we can do instead is we can just say notes db dot find. And we're going to find all of the notes essentially whose shared by property or shared with property rather contains the ID of the user that we're getting all of the shared notes for. Okay, so that would just be, if we wanted to get all of the notes that were shared with user 123, we would just say shared with 123. And MongoDB will automatically, uh, when this property here is an array, MongoDB will make sure to check and see if that property contains this value instead of if the property is equal to that value. That's just something that MongoDB automatically does for us. So you'll see what I mean shortly. But anyway, this to me just seems a little bit easier than having to go through actually loading the user, loading the shared notes, etc. And all we have to do once we've done this is just assign it to a variable and stick it into the user data that we're sending back to the client, right? So we would just say something like dot, 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 uh, whatever user data we just loaded from the user database up here. And then we could just say shared notes. And that would be this thing right here, right? So that's going to be our basic plan of attack for implementing sharing functionality in our application from a database standpoint, right? And again, this is something we could even do with just getting all of the notes that a user created. We could just say, uh, you know, notes db dot find created by and find all of the notes whose created by property is equal to the user, right? So maybe that's something we'll take a look at later on. All right, so we know how that's going to be implemented in the database now. So let's talk a little bit about how all of this is going to work on the front end, okay? So essentially what we're gonna do is in the note detail page, which you know contains the title of the note, contains the text of the note, and currently it just contains an edit button here that when we click on it, changes these things into text inputs and lets the user actually edit the values of those. What we're gonna do is add another button and these will probably be reversed, right? This one will probably be edit here, and this one will probably be share. And what this share button that we're gonna add will do is actually take the user to a different page where they can edit the sharing settings for this note. Okay, now that page is gonna look a little bit like this. And of course, we're gonna be building this shortly, so don't worry too much about it if you don't understand it right off the bat. But what we're gonna do is this page is just gonna say something like, share, and then it will have the title of the note, right? So share my note, for example. And underneath this, it's going to have a list of all of the users that this is currently shared with, right? So probably just their email addresses, etc. right? So blah, 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 at blah, 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 at blah, 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 and so on. And it's also going to have a form that we can enter users' emails into to share it with specific users. So we'll be able to enter in something like that, and it will add that user to the users that can actually view this note. All right, and that's actually another important thing as well, is that we're not going to allow the users to edit these notes, at least not yet. That's something that we'll probably learn about later on when we talk about how to implement different levels of permissions in a sharing app. Okay, for now, we're just going to allow other users to view our notes. So obviously we're gonna have to also make some changes to the note detail page to make sure that if a user isn't the creator of a note, they don't see this edit button or the share button. They'll just be able to see the contents of that note. 
All right, now in addition, each of these items here, each of these user emails that a note is currently shared with will of course have that little X button component we created that will allow a user to unshare that note with them. All right, so that's what the front end is gonna look like. And what we're gonna do is actually implement the front end first, and then we'll talk about all of the different server endpoints that will be needed for this flow. Maybe just as an exercise, you could write out all of the different server endpoints that you think that this will need and start planning that out in your head. That would definitely be a good exercise, but that's something we're gonna take a look at a little later on. So let's jump right into it. So let's go into our front end now. And the first thing we're gonna do is create a new page that will allow us to edit the sharing settings for a given note. And we're gonna call this something like note sharing settings page.js. Okay, and here's what this page is gonna look like. We're just gonna, for now, say export const note sharing settings page equals, and then the JSX is going to look something like this. We're gonna say return, and oops, I spelled sharing wrong. Let's fix that there. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna display an H1 heading up here at the top of our page, which will say share. And just for now, I'm going to put in quotation marks, my note. This is where we're gonna have to actually get the title of the note that the user is editing the sharing settings for. All right, we'll see how to get that uh, shortly. And the next thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna display that component that I talked about earlier, which is gonna be a list of all of the emails that the note is currently shared with. So, uh, you know what, for now I'm just gonna put a div that says this is the note or the uh, shared emails list. And we're gonna have another one, uh, maybe these will even be the same component, that will be that form component that the user can type new emails into and you know actually add those to this list. So for that we'll say this is the uh, email sharing form. Okay, we'll come back and implement those once we're a little further along with our sharing settings page. And actually, that's about it. All we have to do now is wrap this thing in a React fragment, and that should be all we need to do. So let's create a route for this page now. And to do that, we're gonna go to uh, routes.js. We're gonna import that page by saying import note sharing settings page. And we're going to define a route here. Uh, we'll just put it underneath our note detail page, I suppose. And for this, we'll say protected route because we do want only authenticated users to be able to access this. And we're gonna say is loading equals is loading and can access is going to be equals is logged in. All right, and then we're gonna say redirect to equals and for that, we're gonna say slash login, right? So send them back to the login page if the user isn't logged in. And the actual path for this uh, route is going to be slash sharing slash note ID. Uh, you know what, let's do sharing settings. Why not? Okay, great. So that's our new route. Let's just put our new page inside of it. So we're gonna say, uh, first of all, slash protected route. Inside here now, we're gonna say note sharing settings page. And that should display that page at this route. So uh, let's actually go into our note detail page now and add that button that will link the user to the note sharing settings page. So here's what that's gonna look like. We're gonna scroll down here to uh, our edit button, which is only displayed if the user is not editing. And we're gonna add another button next to that. And this button here is gonna say share. And then inside of here, we're gonna say on click equals, and what this will do is actually send the user to the sharing page. So I'm just gonna say uh, history.push. Do we have history inside of here already? Let me just take a look here. History.push. Uh, it looks like we're gonna have to add history to our component. So let's just import that from React Router DOM. We're gonna import the use history hook. And down here, we're gonna say const history equals use history. And then we can say history.push inside that button. And of course, we're gonna send the user to the sharing settings page with the same ID, right? The same URL parameter as the one that we're using for our note detail page here. So that's gonna look like this. We're gonna say slash sharing settings slash, and then the note ID, which we can get by saying note.id. Or I suppose if you wanted to, you could just use this note ID URL parameter. 
Either one works, it doesn't make that big of a difference. And that should allow us to go to this note sharing settings page. So let's open this up. Let's log in as someone, I don't know, we'll just do john at gmail.com, abc123, log in. And John currently has no notes, so let's add one. What we're gonna do, we'll say this is a test note. We're gonna create it. Oops, and it looks like something is wrong. So let me just take a look at, oh, duh, the app isn't running. Let me run that and say npm run dev. I was a little confused at first, I'll be honest. And there we go, we have all of the notes that I remember creating before. So let's try sharing one of these now. We're gonna click on share. And sure enough, that will bring up the sharing settings page with the ID of the note that we're trying to share with other users. Cool, so before we move on, I want to adjust the styling for these buttons. What we're gonna do is use the evenly spaced class uh, that we created in our index.css a little while ago. Basically, all that that does is make sure that all of the child components inside of that div take up an even amount of space. So this'll give us the same kind of effect as, uh, here, let me show you. If we click on the delete button, for example, of a note, we see that these buttons are evenly spaced. That's what that CSS class does. So let's do the same thing for our share and edit buttons, just to make it a little bit more, uh, I don't know, make it look a little bit better, I guess. What we're gonna do is just wrap this in a div with the class name of evenly spaced. Put those buttons in there and that should be all we need to do. So if we take a look, yep, sure enough, our buttons are now displayed exactly like we want them to. And I think that looks pretty darn good. Awesome, so now that we have our note detail page taking us to the sharing settings uh, page here, the first thing we need to do is get a hold of the URL parameter which will allow us to display the actual title of the note that we want to display. Now, this is actually fairly simple. All we're going to do is just like we did in the note detail page, we're going to find the note with that ID, just like here. And in fact, you can really just copy this if you want to. We're going to copy that. We're going to go to note sharing settings page, and I'm going to paste that code that I just copied with the use context, with the note ID, with everything. That should all work just the same inside of here. Provided, of course, we import everything we need to. So let's import the use context hook. Uh, let's also import the notes context by saying import notes context from notes context. And we're also going to need use params. So we'll say import use params from React Router DOM. And that should give us our note all right, but we're also gonna to need to do the same kind of logic with is loading an update note that we did in our note detail page, right? Well, not update note, I suppose. We can get rid of that one, but we are gonna to need to know if the note is loading so that we don't prematurely display the 404 page or the note not found page, okay? So here's what that's gonna look like. I'm just gonna go into the note detail page to get an idea of what is gonna go on here. Uh, basically, we're just gonna copy these two things here and put them in our note sharing settings page. And basically, these two things here are going to tell us whether or not the notes are currently loading, right? And in that case, it would just display a loading message and whether or not the note exists after we're done loading. If it doesn't, just like in our note detail page, we're gonna want to display a message saying, you know, we couldn't find this note, sorry about that. All right, so now that we have our note, the next thing we're gonna do is just display the title in here. We're gonna say note.title and that should be all we need to do for our note sharing settings page. Oops, note not found page isn't defined. Let's import that as well. Uh, we're just gonna say import note not found page and that should import that and get rid of that error. And just as we wanted, it's now displaying the uh, title of the note that we're editing the sharing settings for. So if we go into another one now and click share, we're gonna see the title of that one. And you know, if you wanna test a few more of them, you'll see that it's there as well. Awesome, so that's the basic routing setup and logic for our sharing settings page. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we have our note sharing settings page created, the next thing we're gonna do is implement the list that should be on that page as well as the form for sharing a given note with new people. So here's what this is gonna look like. We're gonna create a new component. 
I'm just gonna put the form and the list in the same component for now. We can always split it out later. Oops, in our components, there we go. We're gonna call this something like shared emails.js. All right, we'll just call it something like that. And we're gonna export our component now, which we'll again call shared emails. And this is gonna need to take a few props from the parent component, because first of all, we're gonna want it to be the parent component that actually passes in the emails that should be displayed in the list. And we're also gonna want it to be the parent component that actually contains all of the functionality for sharing a note with someone else and for removing access uh, if we want to. Okay, so we're gonna have the emails as a prop. And additionally, we're gonna have two more props which are gonna be functions that uh, the parent component can listen for. And one is going to be on add, and we'll have another one called on delete. Now on add will be, of course, when we want to add a new email to our list and on delete will be when we want to remove one. So here's what all of this is gonna look like now. We're gonna say return and inside React Fragments, we're gonna say emails.map. And for each email address, we're just going to display it inside an item, uh, probably like a div or something like that. We'll just say div. And for now, we'll just say h3 and display the person's email inside of there. Okay, so we'll come back and add some styling to this later on, of course. But the next thing we're gonna do is add a form for adding new emails to a notes list of shared people, all right? So what that's gonna look like, we're gonna say input, and this input is going to have a value which will be equal to a state variable. So let's add the use state hook to this component up here at the top. We'll say import use state from React. And then inside our component, we're gonna say const new email and set new email. This will be the value inside, oops, set new email that should be. This will be the value inside that input. And it's going to start off, of course, as an empty string. And then down here for the value of our input, it's going to be new email. And on change here will be equal to E set new email. There we go to e.target.value. Awesome. So that's our input. And for the uh, placeholder, let's just add a placeholder here as well. For the placeholder, we'll say something like enter a new email to share with. Okay. So now that we have the input, we're going to add a button underneath that. And this button here is going to have the text share. And when the button is clicked, we're going to say on click it will actually call this on add thing with the value inside our new email input. Okay, so we'll say on click and we're gonna say anonymous function on add and pass the new email that we wanna share with to the function. Okay, so that'll allow the parent component to take care of making a server request, that kind of stuff. All right, now as far as this on delete thing goes, we're gonna need to import our X button component that we created a long time ago. And for that, we're gonna say import X button from X button. And we're going to display that inside each of our emails. And what that's gonna look like, we're just gonna say X button. And when this thing is clicked, we're going to call on delete with the email on which that button was clicked, okay? So that'll look like this, we'll have an anonymous function. And then we'll say on delete email. And that is our shared emails component. So let's display this thing inside our page. We're gonna open up our note sharing settings page. There it is. And we're going to import our component we just created. We'll say import shared emails from components shared emails. And then down here, we're gonna replace these two divs and we're going to put shared emails in their place. Okay, so the emails for now, just to you know, give this a test run because we haven't actually implemented any of this data stuff in our backend, uh, right? We don't have any emails to actually share our notes with yet. We're just gonna pass an array of fake emails here. So we'll say uh, bob at gmail.com, betty at gmail.com, and uh, I don't know, one more. We'll say barry at gmail.com. Cool, so we have our shared emails and as far as the functions for adding and deleting shared emails, we'll get to those a little later on once we've actually implemented our server endpoints. So we should be good to go. Let's go take a look at what this thing 
is looking like so far. All right, everything is looking decent. We're gonna need to do a little bit of styling tweaks here to make it look really good, but it does seem to be working so far. And if you wanna test and just make sure that the on add and on delete things are hooked up correctly, uh, we could always just add those props and have them do something, you know, boring like display an alert. So we'll just say on add, we'll have this display an alert that says adding, and then we'll insert the email that we got passed up from that component. So we'll say, uh, you know what, let's change this to back ticks here. There we go. We'll say adding email to shared users. Cool, and then we'll do the same thing for on delete. We'll say equals, and this is gonna be the email we wanna delete, so we'll say alert. And again, for now, we're just gonna use back ticks and say removing email from shared users. Okay, so let's just make sure that those work out correctly. We're going to enter in an email here. We'll say hello at gmail.com, click share. And sure enough, that's getting passed up correctly and calling the right function. And if we delete one of these, we see that that's calling that function with that email. All right, so that's our basic list. Let's just add a little bit of styling here to make it look better. The first thing we're gonna do is make it so that the X button and the email address are displayed on a single line here. So to do that, we're just gonna open up our shared emails. And for each of our emails, we're gonna give this div a class name of, we'll just say something like shared email item. And then if we open up index.css and add that style, I'm gonna do that down here. We'll say shared email item. And we're gonna want this, first of all, to be display flex. That will make sure that the things are actually displayed in a line here. We'll also say align items center, and that will center everything vertically here. Okay, so we see that that's all displayed nicely. And we're also going to say justify content space between, which should put the maximum amount of space between those two elements and uh, basically display the X over on the right-hand side of this box. So additionally, we're also gonna to want to probably add a border to the bottom here. So we'll say border bottom and we'll say one pix solid, and we'll do a nice light gray color here, which will add a nice border to the bottom of all of these so that we can tell where one starts, where one ends. Another thing that we're going to do is just add a little bit of padding here. Let me just move border bottom, and then we'll say padding, and we'll do padding of eight picks. Let's see how that looks. Cool, so that's looking all right so far. The next thing we're gonna work on is this form here, and that's gonna be pretty straightforward. So let's open up our note sharing settings page again. Oh, our shared emails uh, component actually. And one other thing that we're gonna wanna do is clear the input when the user clicks on share, right? We, want, we don't want this hello at Gmail thing or whatever the user enters there to hang around after they've already clicked on share. So to do that, we're just gonna say button. And then after we've called on add with new email, we're gonna say set new email to an empty string. Okay, and that should work now. If we click on share, we'll see the modal displayed from our page component. And when we click okay, we'll see that that is now cleared, which is exactly what we wanted. All right, and now to add some styling to this form, essentially what we're gonna do is something very similar to what we did with our create note form, or what do we call it, new note form, there we go. And all we're gonna do is just use our full width class to uh, make that work. So let's go into shared emails. And to our input, we're just gonna say class name equals full width. Oops, let me try and spell that right. And then we'll do the same thing for our button. We're gonna say, oops, we're gonna go into here and say class name equals full width. Awesome, so let's indent these things a little bit. And we're gonna indent that as well. And we're gonna want to add space below as a class to this input as well because we need to leave a little bit of space between that input and the button. So if we go back now, we should see enter a new email to share with. We have this big share button here now that will take care of that. Uh, oh, one more thing. Let's actually add some space after this, uh, this list here so that we don't see that nasty little line resting right on top of our input. 
So to do that, we're just gonna wrap up our emails map thing inside its own div with the class name of space below. We're gonna put our emails.map inside of there and that should take care of it. Cool, and that's looking pretty good if I do say so myself. Now, one last thing that I wanna add here is a back button at the top of this page that the user can click on and go back to the note detail page, right? Because there's not really a place to do that right now. If we click on this, it'll take us back to the home page, and we'll have to remember what note we were on and, you know, yeah, it's just not the best user experience. So let's add a back button. And here's what that's gonna look like. We're gonna go into note sharing settings page. And up here at the top of our page, we're gonna have a button with text that says back. And when this button is clicked, we're gonna navigate the user back to whatever page they came from. So we're just gonna say on click and we're gonna use the use history hook. So we'll say use history from React Router DOM. Down here, we're gonna get history by saying const history equals use history. And then when this button is clicked, we're gonna say history.push and send them back to the corresponding note detail page. So we'll say slash notes slash, and then we're gonna get the note ID from our URL parameter here. Cool, so that's our back button up here. If we click on that, it will take us back to the note detail page, all right? And actually what I'm gonna do is go into here. I'm gonna add a class to our button and we'll call this class something like uh, inverse button. And basically what that's gonna do is just be the button, but only the text, right? The background color will be set to white and the text will be black or some other color. And that will make it so that it's a button without being this giant, you know, sort of eyesore on our page. So let's go back here. We're going to add an inverse button. And this is something we'll be able to use on all pages if we want to. We're just gonna say background color is going to be white and the color is going to be black. And we're gonna add a hover style for this too so that when a user hovers over this thing, uh, it will actually change color slightly. So in that case, we'll set the background color to a nice light gray. We'll just do EEE. -E -E. Oops, I wanted to do inverse button hover. There we go. So now whenever we hover over this button, we get that little styling in there. And I think that that looks pretty good. All right, and that's how the back button works. And we have this entire page uh, working at least from a user interface standpoint. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so the last thing that we're gonna take a look at here is how to actually have the changes reflected when the user either tries to remove an email or add an email to this list. Now, in order to make this work, what we're gonna do is we're gonna modify our notes provider component and we're gonna give it a few extra methods, right? Or functions inside of it. All right, so in addition to doing things like creating notes, updating notes, deleting notes, etc., we're gonna add functions for sharing a note and for unsharing a note, okay? So we'll say const share note. And this is gonna be an asynchronous function which takes an email as an argument, right? The email that we're sharing the note with. And eventually what this is gonna do is make a network request to our server to update that, right? We'll have a special endpoint on there for sharing notes and for unsharing notes. But for now, all we're gonna do, just to simulate this and to get it working, at least on the front end, is we're just gonna modify this notes state variable in order to incorporate the sharing stuff into it. Okay, so what we're gonna do is share the specified note with this email, and basically to do that, we're just gonna have to add that to the notes, uh, to one of the notes properties. And, oh, additionally, we're also gonna need the ID, of course, of the note that we're sharing with. And you know what, we'll just call that note ID to make it super clear what that's supposed to be. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna say set notes and we're basically going to map through all of our notes. You're probably familiar with this by now. We're gonna say notes.map. And for each note, if the notes ID equals this note ID that we're sharing, then what we're gonna do, here we're gonna say note.id equals note ID. And if that's the case, then we're going to get all of the properties from the note 
Plus we're going to have a shared with emails property on that note. This will be something that we'll get from the server eventually. And here, let me just uh, indent this a little bit so that it's more readable. I'm gonna just indent at the question mark there. And the shared with emails is going to be the current shared with emails property on our note, plus this new email that we're adding here. So the way we do that here is by saying note.sharedwithemails.concat, and we're going to add that email onto there. All right, cool. So if the note isn't that matching note, we're just gonna return the note and that is our share note function for now. Now, one thing that isn't going to work about this quite yet is this shared with emails thing. Since that doesn't exist, we're gonna get an error. Uh, so what I'm gonna do, this is going to be tremendously ugly right now, uh, but it'll just hold us over until we actually add this logic to our server. We're just gonna say if note.shared emails doesn't exist, we're going to return an empty array. And basically what that means is that if a note doesn't have any shared with emails yet, or even have that property, we'll just be creating a new array with this single email inside of it. You'll see what I mean shortly. Okay, so next thing we're gonna do is create our unshare note. And what that's gonna look like, we're gonna say async note ID, and we're gonna specify the email we want to unshare that note with. And here's what this one's gonna look like. It's gonna be the same basic logic as we had up there, but instead of adding that email to our shared with emails array, we're going to say shared with emails equals, and then we're gonna do that filter thing that you're probably familiar with by now as well. Uh, we're gonna say note.sharedwithemails.filter, and we want only the emails, we'll just say E here, only the emails that are not equal to the email uh, argument that's getting passed in here. Cool, so we have share note and unshare note. Uh, I think that the logic in here is fairly sound. We'll have to put that to the test shortly. And the next thing we need to do is make these two functions available to uh, any of the components inside this provider by passing these two functions to the value object. So we're gonna say share note and unshare note. And let's just indent this thing a little bit because it's getting kind of ugly. We're gonna do this and that and that, and we're gonna do that again with all of these things that we're providing to the components inside this provider. Okay, cool. So now that we've done that, let's actually use this share note and unshare note function. And then we're gonna open up our note sharing settings page. And in addition to getting the notes and is loading from the context, we're going to say share note and unshare note. Okay, and now that we have those, we're gonna go down here and we're gonna swap out on add and on delete with the corresponding functions that we just got from the context. So we're gonna say share note with that email when an email is being added, and we're gonna say unshare note with that email when a given email is being removed from the list. Now, as for these emails that we're passing to shared emails, we're gonna need to actually get these from the note itself, right? Remember, we're now using this shared with emails property here. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna say, note.shared with emails. There we go. And because this could potentially be undefined on a given note, we're gonna add a backup value here, which is just gonna be an empty array, all right? And that's actually what it will start out with because our note isn't going to have that property yet. That's something that we're gonna have to add to the back end for this. Cool, so let's make sure we've saved everything and let's go take a look and see if these functions actually work. So I'm gonna go back here. We see that we don't have any emails right now and right off the bat, we might want to just add some text there saying uh, something like this note currently isn't shared with anybody. So let's do that. We're gonna say paragraph. This is going to have the class name of week, right? So that it will be displayed as kind of an italic uh, message. And what we're gonna do is say this note is not currently shared with anyone. And there we go, okay? So let's enter a new email to share this note with. We're just gonna say something like abc at gmail.com. And if we click on share now, it looks like that didn't work. All right, so <laughs> let's go back here and take a look at what's going on. We're gonna go back to our notes provider and, oh, I see what we did. We didn't pass the note ID. So we need to go back here now. And for share note, we need to pass in the note ID. 
which we have from the URL parameter, and same thing for unshare note. All right, so glad we figured that out. Let's give this another try. We're gonna say abc at gmail.com, click on share, and sure enough, that email shows up. Let's add a few more. In fact, they don't even have to be emails at this point. We can just uh, type in anything we want. And now if we click remove on that, ah, did you see what just happened there? I didn't actually mean for that to happen, but since we had the same value in multiple items because of the filtering logic we're using, it removed all of those items. So in other words, if you have two items that are equal to each other, because of our logic, when you delete one, it's gonna delete the other as well. Now that may or may not be something we want, and when we actually add backend logic, we'll probably wanna add in some kind of logic to make sure that you can't add a user's email twice. But uh, here, if we add something else now, we'll just say xyz at gmail.com and click share, and now we can delete those things and add them and you know everything else just like we want to. Another thing to notice is that if you just click share without typing anything into the input here, it's gonna create an empty item. So eventually we're gonna to want to prevent that from happening as well. But anyway, we've really got the front end working with this whole note sharing thing. So what we're gonna be doing next, of course, is adding all of this backend logic and network requests that are necessary for making this thing really work with multiple users. But before we move on, there are actually two more things that we need to fix here. One is you may have noticed that this, this note is not currently shared with anyone message didn't actually disappear when we added someone to our list here, right? So we're gonna have to go back into our React code and fix that. And to do that, let's open up our note sharing settings page. And we're gonna find that little message, right? This note is not currently shared with anyone. And what we're gonna want to do is make this message disappear when there actually are shared emails. Now, in order to do this, all we really have to do is we have to say in curly braces here, we're gonna say note dot shared with emails, and we can say dot length. And if the shared with emails array is longer than zero, right? So if the length is greater than zero, then and only then will we display that thing. Oh, and actually that should be reversed. That should be if this thing is equal to zero, then and only then do we want to display this message. So if we go back and take a look now, that thing should have disappeared. And if we remove this shared email, then we should see this, this note is not currently shared with anyone message. And of course, if we add another one here, xyz at gmail.com and click share, we should see that show up. Now, the second thing that I want to fix here is I wanna make sure that what the user enters inside this input is actually an email address, right? Well, and first of all, we also wanna make sure that the user has actually entered in something at all, since what they can do is just click share and as we can see, that will enter in an empty, uh, an empty item to this list, which is definitely not what we want. It just looks bad when our application allows users to do that sort of thing. So what this is gonna look like, we're gonna have to go back here and we're gonna have to open up this shared emails component. So let's open that component up right here. And then what we're gonna want to do here is when the user has entered something into the input and actually clicked on this button, instead of directly calling on add new email, right? when the user clicks on that button, we'll first want to check to see whether or not the value that the user has entered is valid, right? So we're gonna wanna check and make sure that first of all, the user has entered something at all. And we're gonna want to also check to make sure that that something is an email. So instead of just calling the on add prop directly, what we're gonna do is we're going to say on click add, and this is of course gonna have to be const on click add. And what it's gonna do is it's going to call on add if the value of new email is valid. So first of all, what we're gonna do is we're gonna define an error message, right? We're just gonna do this as a state variable. So we'll say const error message and set error message. And of course, we're gonna want to display this error message above the input if the user enters in something that's not valid. Um, and the starting value, of course, of this error message is gonna be an empty string. And then what we're gonna do is first of all, we're gonna check to see if the user has entered anything at all for the email. So we'll say if new email, right? That'll just check if the string is longer than zero characters. And if that's not true, we're actually gonna want to put a not in front of that. Then we'll want to say return set error message. 
And then what we'll do is we'll set that to please enter an email value. Or you know what, we'll just say please enter a value, period. Cool, so otherwise, the next thing that we're gonna wanna do is check to make sure that the new email is actually an email address. And in order to do that, we're going to use the email regular expression. Now, you might remember this from earlier when we looked at creating reusable forms in React. Basically, I'm just going to copy and paste that. You can find this using an easy Google search. Just look up email regex. And what we're gonna do is just up here above where we define our component, I'm going to paste that email regular expression and then we can check to see if this new email state variable here is an actual email address by saying if not email regex dot test. And we're going to test the new email value here. So in other words, if that's not an email, what we're going to do is say return set error message. And we're going to say, please enter a valid email address. All right. Now, on the other hand, if neither of those things, right, if neither of these errors occurs, then we're going to want to just call this on add function. And to do that, we just say on add. And just like we did down here, we're just going to say new email and we're going to say set new email to an empty string again. So I'm just going to copy those and paste those here. And now we should be able to uh, adjust the indentation and that should be exactly what we want there. Now, one thing to note is that this set new email to an empty string and on add won't be called if either of these errors occurs, right? So if the new email doesn't exist or if it's not an email address, then we won't be calling, right? So this prop here is only going to be called if everything goes well, right? If the value is actually valid. Cool. So now that we have this on click add function, the next thing we're going to do is simply replace the on click prop for our button. And we're going to change that, of course. Oops, let me try that again. We're going to change that to this function and we're going to say on click add. And there we go. All right, that should take care of all of that logic for us. Now, as far as actually displaying this error message, we're going to want to do that above the input. So what we're going to do there is we're just going to check to see if the error message exists. And if it does, we're going to display a paragraph tag. And this will simply have the error message inside of it. So we'll just say error message like that. And that should take care of everything for us. Now, we are going to want to add some styling to this, assuming that we already have some CSS styles for this. Yep, and sure enough, we have this error style. So what we're going to do is just go back to this paragraph tag and we're going to say class name equals error. And that should take care of styling that nicely for us. Cool, so let's give this thing a try now. What we're gonna want to do is go back to our application and we'll try just clicking share now. And what we should see is that this error occurs saying, please enter a value, all right? And if we try and enter something in that's not an email address, we'll see that the value of that error message changes accordingly. And likewise, if we actually do enter in a valid email address, uh, like abc at gmail.com, then we see that that will uh, show up in the list. Now, one more thing, we will want to also reset this error message, of course, if the user enters in a valid email address because right now it's just kind of hanging around. So let's go back here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, up at the top of onclick add, set error message to an empty string, right? So that will basically clear out whatever the error message was before and uh, run the rest of the logic for us. So just to check this again, let's try, um, abc2 at gmail.com and click on share. And sure enough, we'll see that that error message disappears and abc2 at gmail.com shows up in this list. Awesome, so now that we've added those two other things, I think we're probably ready to wrap up here. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. Now that we've seen how to add basic note sharing functionality and components to our front end, it's time to take a look at how to do the same thing on our back end. Now, this is where things start to get really interesting because what we have to figure out is how do we extend the concept of ownership, right? Who owns what note to include sharing as well, right? Who owns what note and also who can access that note as a viewer or something like that. 
That's what we're going to take a look at here today. We're going to discuss several strategies for doing this in our database and see how to incorporate that into our uh, server's endpoints as well. So without further ado, let's jump right in. All right, so to get started here, let's just review a little bit our basic plan for adding the concept of data ownership to our backend. Okay, so we already have the concept of ownership, like who owns what notes, who created what notes in our application. And in order to add the concept of sharing to our backend, we're basically going to use a similar approach, right? So for ownership on the backend, right, who owns what note, remember that each of our notes had this created by property which contained the ID of the user who created that note, right? This determines which user this note is going to show up in the My Notes list for. Okay, and what we're gonna do here in order to allow users to share notes on the back end, now that we've set up all of the basic uh, components on the front end for this, is we're going to add a shared with property to all of our notes. And that property is simply going to be an array of the IDs of the users that this note has been shared with. All right, now a few things I wanna mention here. The main thing is that storing the ID of the user that this thing is shared with is just one possible option. What we might wanna do in fact instead, and we'll actually take a look at this in more detail when we get there. What we might wanna do instead is actually store the emails that, uh, this note is shared with instead of the IDs. Now, there are some trade-offs here, of course. One benefit is that storing the email instead of storing the actual user ID is going to make it a lot easier on the sharing page for a given note to just display the emails that a given note is shared with, right? So in other words, we'll just be able to load the basic information for that note and we'll already have an array of all of the emails that that note is shared with. Now, on the other hand, if we were to store IDs, and again, I'm just kind of talking this out with you here because this is the kind of stuff that you'll need to think about in situations like this. If we do decide to just store the ID in our shared with property, we're gonna have to actually populate this whenever the user wants to load, you know, uh, find out what emails that note is shared with. We're gonna have to actually go through and for each of these IDs, find the corresponding email uh, for the user with that ID and send that back. And that's definitely something we can do. Maybe we'll even take a look at what both ways look like and see, uh, you know, which way is best. But that's just something to keep in mind that that's going to make it a lot more difficult. Now, on the other hand, storing this ID thing in the shared with property of our notes is probably going to make the other side of things, right? Where we wanna find all of the notes that have been shared with a given user a little bit easier because we'll just be able to look at the user's ID and get all of the notes that have that ID in their shared with array uh, to send back to the user. So there's some trade-offs here and one possible compromise even is instead of storing just an array of single values, in this shared with property, we could actually store objects that contain both the ID and the email, as well as whatever other information we might need. Now, this does add a little bit more complexity because we would have to make sure that those things are kept in sync, right? If a user were to update their email and we were storing this in, a, uh, in an object like this, so ID, blah, 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 email, blah, 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 that just makes it that much more cumbersome to actually go in and find an object with that email in the shared with property, change that to the updated email, etc. right? Whereas if it was just an array of emails, it would be a little bit easier to just find the email in there, remove it and replace it with the new one. Okay, so there, there are trade-offs no matter what we choose. So really to start off with here, we're just going to pick one of these and roll with it until we run into problems, if we run into problems. But anyway, that's our basic plan. So the first thing that we're gonna do here is we're actually going to open up our notes provider and just take a look at some of the things that we're going to need to implement in here, since this will give us an idea of sort of what kind of functionality we need to implement on the back end first. So we see that we already have this share note and unshare note properties. And additionally, when we actually load the notes in the first place, 
we're gonna need to add some functionality to that so that this note that we're loading has its sharing settings already baked in, all right? At some point, we're also going to need to uh, add loading functionality to get all of the notes that have been shared with a given user, and that'll be a whole thing in itself. So that will actually require us probably to break some of the functionality out into its own uh, shared notes provider or something like that. Now we'll cross that bridge when we come to it, but just to get a basic idea of the things we're gonna do here, right? just to uh, create a little bit of a list, we're going to A, need to allow ourselves to get all of the users that a note is shared with, and that will probably just be done in this existing endpoint, and that will probably just be done in this existing endpoint that we load the user's notes from. So that's the first thing we're gonna need to do. B, we're going to need to allow the owner of the note to share a note with an existing user's email, okay? And C, we're going to need to allow the user to unshare that note with that user, right? So in other words, remove a user's email from the emails that a note is shared with. Oh, and one additional one that I mentioned as well is eventually we're going to need a way to load all of the notes that are shared with a given user so that we can, uh, here, if I just open up the notes page, what we're gonna want to do here is in addition to having the notes that belong to a user, we're gonna want to have the notes that have been shared with the user. And that'll make it possible to reuse this notes list that's currently just displaying a user's notes that they created. We're gonna reuse that with different data and display the notes that have been shared with a user. So now that we have that basic list of functionality we're gonna to need to add, the next thing we're gonna do here is go into our backend, open up our routes, and let's start off by adding a route for sharing notes with a given user. So we're going to uh, call this share note route. And what this is gonna do, it's gonna look something like this. We're gonna say export const share note route equals. The path for this is gonna be something like slash notes slash note ID. And then we'll add a final suffix on here, which will be something like shared emails, right? Because basically what we're doing is we're adding a shared email to this note. Okay, so that's what our path is gonna look like. It's just one of several different paths we could have chosen, but you know, it seems to work for me. So let's uh, just leave it there, I suppose. And the next thing we're gonna specify here is the method. And that's going to be a post method because we're, you know, in essence, creating a new shared email on that note. You could make this put as well. That, you know, the case could be made for that, but uh, we'll just make it post for now. And next up, we're going to have some middleware. Now for this one, we're going to use similar middleware to what we've used for all of our other notes. We're gonna just take a look at the update note route, I suppose. And we're gonna use the verify auth token and user owns note. Uh, middleware that we created in our share note route as well. So we'll say verify auth token and user owns note. And those do have to be in that order because of how those things work behind the scenes. And here I just need to change the double quotes here to single quotes. And since I've got four of them, I'll just do a find and replace. There we go. And now we can specify the handler. So the handler, of course, is going to be async like most of our handlers are these days. Uh, and it's going to take the request and response as arguments, again, like every single handler we've seen so far. And the next thing that it's gonna do, we've already verified the user's auth token with this middleware here. We've already made sure that the user owns the note, so we don't have to worry about either of those things. What we do have to worry about, though, is finding the user that corresponds to the email that the owner just entered, right? So in other words, what we're doing is we're adding an email here to shared emails. So the body of this post request is gonna look something like this. It'll probably just have an email property, which will be the email that our user wants to share that note with, right? So john at gmail.com or something like that. So seeing as though we're just receiving the email, which the user has typed in, what we're gonna want to do here is load the corresponding user with that email. Now, if we did just want to store emails that the user had shared this with, that would be a slightly different story potentially, right? Because we could basically just take this email and stick it directly into our shared with property on our notes and we'd be good, right? 
However, what we're going to do here is we're still going to load the corresponding user for this email, primarily because we want to make sure that a user with that email actually exists. Okay, so at this point, we don't want to allow users to just share their notes with arbitrary emails. Those emails have to actually be legitimate users on our site already. Now that might not be exactly what you want. And later on, what we're going to see how to do is actually check and see if there's a user with that email. And if not, we'll actually see how to send an email to their email address saying, Hey, this person on note lab has shared this note with you join note lab to see it. Something like that. Right. Everybody's gotten those, uh, those kinds of emails from sites like Trello or Gmail or, or, you know, other sites that want you to join and create an account essentially. So anyway, we're going to load the corresponding user for this email just to make sure that that email actually belongs to a user in our application. Okay. And then once we have that, once we have verified them, uh, we're going to decide then whether we want to just use IDs or whether we just want to store their emails. So here's what that's going to look like. We're going to have to start off by importing the users DB, right? That will allow us to make queries to the user DB to uh, get a user with a given email, right? See if that user exists. So again, we verified that this request had a valid auth token. We verified that the user already owns the note and they're therefore permitted to do this. So the next thing we're going to do is get the email from the request body by saying const email equals request dot body. And the next thing to do, of course, is to load the user with that email, see if they exist. So we're going to say const user with email equals, and then we'll say await users db dot find one. And we're going to say email. And basically what we're checking here is if a user exists with that email in our database. So now that we've gotten that, what we're going to do is just check to see if that user exists. So we'll say if user with email or here, let's actually check if that user doesn't exist. And in that case, what we're going to do is we're going to say response dot send status, and we're going to send back a 404 status code. But additionally, we're going to send a message with this specifying that we're not returning a 404 because the note doesn't exist, but rather because a user with the email provided doesn't exist. So uh, we're actually going to change this to response.status400. And then we're going to say dot JSON. And for that, we'll say message. And the message here is going to be something rather helpful. We'll say something like uh, a user with that email does not exist. All right. Now, on the other hand, if a user with that email does exist, what we're going to want to do is add that email or the ID to our database. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say await notes DB, and we're going to need to import that as well. That was just imported for me up here. And the query we're going to make here is we're going to say update one, and we want to update the note with the note ID that we got up here. So uh, and again, since we've already verified that the user here owns the note, uh, we should be perfectly safe to ignore that logic inside the handler. So we're going to say const note ID equals request dot params. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say await notes DB dot update one. We're going to find the note with that ID. So we'll say ID note ID. And the update that we're going to make is we're going to say dollar sign push. And we're going to basically push this user's email or ID. Uh, I guess we have to make a decision now. So let's just, uh, let's just use the user's email. I suppose we're going to say dollar sign push. We're going to push the user's email onto the shared with property. And what that looks like in MongoDB is we say shared with, and we're going to put the user's email into that. All right. And as a matter of fact, there's two extra things that I want to mention here. One is that we don't want to allow duplicate emails here, right? If a, a user tries to share a note with the same email twice, there's not really any purpose with that. And it's a little messy. So we want to block it. So the way that we actually do that in MongoDB is instead of using dollar sign push, we're going to use dollar sign add to set. Right. That might sound like kind of a confusing name, but basically a set is sort of like an array, except it's not ordered and it doesn't have duplicate, right? It's kind of a discrete mathematics term for those of you who haven't worked with sets before, but all you need to know is that that will add this email to the shared with property. If the email isn't already on there. So 
Uh, what we're going to do here too is instead of using update one, we're going to change this to dot find one and update. And then we're going to say const result, oops, not request, result, there we go, equals await notes db dot find one and update. And what we're going to do here is we're going to say const updated note equals result dot value. And now that we have the updated note, what we're going to do is we're going to send back the updated emails to the client. So all we need to do for that, and I guess we could just send back the entire updated note if we wanted to, but just to save bandwidth, let's just return the emails, the updated shared with emails for that note, because that's all the client side is going to need. And that will allow us to avoid doing the same kind of removing duplicates logic on the front end. Okay. So what we're going to do is say response dot JSON, and we're going to send back the updated notes shared with property. All right, so that's our share note route. Let's open this up and we're going to export it from our index.js file. We'll just add it to its own new section here, I suppose, in routes. We'll say share note route. And here, let's just do that up here as well. There we go. Okay, so we have share note route added to our routes. Let's just uh, run our application to make sure that everything is working there so far, that we don't have any uh, syntax errors. So we're going to say npm run dev. And that should load our app and everything should work just as before, right? We shouldn't see any errors on our back end. That's really all we're doing this to uh, uh, make sure of. We should see servers listening on port 8080. Okay, so that's how we create the share note route on our back end. And we've also taken a look at a lot of things to keep in mind when implementing this kind of functionality. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've added an endpoint for sharing notes, the next thing that we're gonna do is convert our front end to actually do that. So let's open up our notes provider here. And the logic inside our share note function is gonna just have to be rewritten a little bit to make a request to the server instead of just uh, doing all of the logic inside of here. We are still gonna use a bulk of this logic. We're gonna use the map thing here to make sure we update the correct note but we are going to update this part here. We're just gonna remove that and set it to the updated emails that we're getting back from the server endpoint. So in order to do this, what we're gonna do is we're going to say try, we're gonna put all of this in a try catch block just to make sure, and we're gonna say const updated emails equals await, and we're making a post request here to the endpoint we just created, which is going to be slash notes slash and then we're going to insert the note ID and we're gonna say slash shared emails. Okay, so that is our basic request there. And uh, let's actually change this here because there might come a time when we don't want this to be emails. So just to make this easier, we're going to call this property shared with. So we're just gonna say update shared with to the updated emails. And that should be all we need there. So let's add a catch block now. And remember that this catch block could catch errors where the email doesn't actually exist. So currently there's not really a good way for our user interface to get this error. And that's something that we'll look at later on. Uh, so just don't worry about it too much right now. Uh, we're gonna say catch and here for now, we'll just log out the error. Okay, kind of a useless uh, response there, but we're just gonna do that for now. Okay, so one more thing we need to do here actually is we need to include the email that the user is sharing this note with in the request body of our post request. So we're just going to pass email like that and that should allow us to get that email inside our server endpoint. All right, and that should allow us to update a note in our server. So let's test this thing out. And actually um, I'm gonna just find shared with emails and replace those. So actually we just need to say shared with, and we'll change this to shared with dot filter and shared with email should be shared with instead. And that's all we should need to do. So let's test this thing again. It looks like everything is compiling successfully, right? We were getting a syntax error when we didn't have a catch block, but other than that, everything's looking good. 
So let's give this thing a try. We're going to open up one of our notes. Uh, we're going to click on share and let's try adding some emails for this. So actually let's take a look and see what accounts our application actually has. We're gonna open up a Mongo shell by saying Mongo and we're going to use our note sharing DB and we'll say db.users.findall.pretty. Oh, that's because we called it uh, notes app DB, not note sharing DB. Let's change that back, notes app DB. And the same query will give us uh, some of the users in our application. So we have John, we have Jane, we have John Two, we have Jim, a lot of J's there. So let's, um, I don't know, let's just pick Jane at gmail.com. And that should work out nicely. We're gonna say jane at gmail.com and we'll click on share. And it looks like nothing's happening. So let's see what happened to that request. We're gonna open this up. Uh, we'll try and do it again, I suppose. Actually, let's just uh, refresh this to make sure. Oh, it looks like it was added. So something might just be wrong with our logic when we're, um, uh, when we're actually making that request. So let's open our notes provider up again and take a look at what's going on in here. So we should be getting the updated emails back from the server endpoint. So let's open up our share note route again. Uh, I see what's going on. When we do find one and update, we need to include that return document after option, as you may remember from before. So we're just going to add that here. Basically what was happening is we were getting the document returned before we modified it. Now, honestly, I don't know why anyone would really want to do that, like to get the previous document before updating it. I've never had to anyway, but who knows? Uh, we just need to remember to add return document after here. And that should uh, make everything work the way we want it to. So let's give this another try. We've already shared it with jane at gmail.com. So let's try jim at gmail.com and click on share. And sure enough, jim at gmail.com gets added to this list here. And that actually reminds me that another thing we want to uh, make sure of in this list is that the user doesn't add their own email address to the sharing settings. Not that there's anything that would really go wrong with that, but it's just kind of a cleanliness thing for our data. We don't want to, you know, we don't want data that doesn't belong there being in our database. So uh, the way that we're going to add that is in our share note route, we're just going to get the user's ID that's making this request or the user's email that's making this request rather. And the way we can do that is by saying const user, uh, let's say auth user here, equals request.user. Remember that we're getting this from our verify auth token middleware. And then what we're gonna do is before we actually uh, make this request and find the user with the email, we're just going to check to see if the auth user's email matches this email property in the body. So we'll say if auth user dot email is equal to email, then what we're gonna do is send back a status code. And there's a few that we could use in this case, but I'm gonna use 409, which stands for conflict. So basically there's just a conflict between the data that a user is sending to the server and the data that's already on the server. So uh, we'll just say send status 409, and that'll just throw a corresponding error. We might wanna add a message here like we did down here just to explain it, but you know, for now that's not really necessary. So anyway, I don't really even remember what user was logged in here. And now that I think about it, that could be a good opportunity to add the currently logged in user to the nav bar. So real quickly, this is gonna be easy to do. We're just gonna say nav bar. We're going to use the use user hook here to get the currently logged in user. So uh, we'll just import that up here. We'll say import use user from our hooks. And then down here, we're gonna say const is loading and user equals use user. Okay, so now that we've done that, what we're gonna do is right next to our logout button here, we're going to display a paragraph tag with the user's email inside of it, if that user exists. So we're gonna say user.email. And of course, we're only going to show that if the user exists, right? So we'll say, um, well here, we'll say if is loading, then what we'll do is display a loading message in this spot. There we go. Otherwise, we'll display the user's email, but we wanna make sure that that exists first. So what we'll do for that is we'll just say, 
here, let's just indent this so it's a little bit more apparent what's going on. Uh, what we're gonna do is just say is loading. And then if it's not loading, we'll check if the user exists. And that'll be another ternary operator here. You can tell I like nested ternary operators. Otherwise, what we're gonna do is just display nothing, okay? So that'll display loading. If it's loading, it'll display the user's email if there is a user email, and it will display nothing if it's not loading and the user isn't logged in. Uh, and here, let's just add logged in as, as the text here, and let's see what that looks like. So we're gonna go back here. We see logged in as john at gmail.com, and if we try this out now, we're gonna say john at gmail.com, click share, and that's actually going to give us an error if we take a look in the network tab here. Let's try it again, at gmail.com, click share. We see that we're getting a 409 status code back, and we see that that error is actually being logged out here. So request failed with status code 409. Awesome, so one more thing, let's just uh, restyle this a little bit. Uh, what we're gonna do is open up our index.css file and change our navbar styling just a little bit. Actually, what we can do is just wrap these in a span or a div probably. So let's give that a try and see what that looks like. Okay, so we'll say span, span, and oh, actually that should be below the logout button. Okay, so let's just indent these because those should both be inside the span. And now we just need to uh, change the styling of this a little bit. All we need to do is for our span inside the nav, we're going to the sloppy way of doing this, which is what I'm gonna do is say nav span. And for this one, we'll just say display flex. And that should display the email and the button right next to each other. And if we want that centered vertically, we can just say uh, align items center. And that should line them up nicely. And let's just add a little bit of space between them. Uh, to do that, we can just say something like nav paragraph, I suppose. So we'll just say a paragraph inside a nav. Uh, we'll just add some a margin to that. So we'll say margin, right, and that should be something like eight picks. All right, if you wanna go through and add your own class names and stuff, feel free to do that, but that gives us that nice spacing. Actually, let's do a little bit more. We'll do something like 16 picks. Okay, so 16 picks. And there we go. All right, cool. So we know who we're logged in as now, and we've also seen how to share a note with different people via the sharing settings page. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so we've allowed our users to share their notes with other users by email. So the next thing that we're gonna do, we're going to see how to unshare a note with a user uh, by clicking on this delete button. Now, currently this looks like it works, but it's not actually hooked up to the back end. So if we refresh, we'll see that that shows up. And actually, I just noticed something that we did wrong before. It looks like this email that we were testing this thing with before wasn't actually prevented from being added to this note. Uh, and the reason for that if we go back to our share note route is because we forgot the return keyword here. All right, so let's add that and that should prevent that from happening in the future. Basically what happened is we got this send status thing back. So our front end didn't update, but after that it continued to update and all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of a dangerous thing to miss as you can see. And we, uh, we missed it here, but we fixed it now, so we should be able to get rid of it once we add the unshare functionality. So to unshare something, what we're gonna do is create a new route, and this route is going to be called the unshare note route. And what we're gonna do for this one, we're gonna say export const unshare note route. It's going to have a similar path to our share note route, so we're gonna say, path slash notes slash note ID slash shared emails. But we're also going to add another section to this, which is going to be the email we want to unshare that with. Now, if we wanted to, we could have used a similar path for our share note route here and uh, just said shared emails slash email. And that uh, URL parameter there could be the email of the user that we wanna share this with. And we would have just done that instead of putting the email in the request body. But th you know, there's not really any reason 
to choose one over the other besides just the conventions that I've seen. So what we're gonna do here on our unshare note route, the method that we're gonna use is gonna actually be a delete method. So we're basically saying delete that email off of our note with this ID. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's basically the signature for our route here. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna add the customary middleware. So we'll say middleware. We're gonna have verify auth token and user owns note. We're obviously gonna need those two because we wanna make sure that users can't unshare a note with other users when the note doesn't belong to them, okay? So here I just need to redo the uh, double quotes to single notes again. I'm gonna need to change that setting at some point. You're probably getting tired of seeing that. And now let's implement the handler for this route. So we're gonna say handler async request response. And inside here, there's a few things we're gonna need to do. The first thing we're gonna need to do is get the note ID and the email from the request parameters. So for that, we'll say const note ID and email equals request.params. And then all we really need to do is call update one on the notes DB. So for that, we're gonna say const and we'll say result because we're gonna be using the find one and update method on MongoDB as we've done before. So we're gonna say equals await notes DB. Okay, and that's gonna be imported for us automatically up there. Notes DB dot find one and update. And the filter for this one, we're gonna to want to find the note with that ID. So we'll say ID equals note ID. And the query we're gonna use here is dollar sign pull, right? That's the opposite of push. And we're gonna remove that email by saying shared with email, right? So that basically says remove this email from the shared with property of the note with this ID, okay? And just like we saw before, we're gonna have to add the return document after setting to this query by saying return document after. And that will make it so that we get the updated emails uh, back from the server. So now we just need to say const updated emails. There we go, equals result dot value. And then we just need to say response.json and send those updated emails back to the client side. So there we go. And uh, let's add this thing to our server officially by going into the routes index.js file. And we're gonna add the unshare note route setting to this thing. And that should be all we need to do. So let's go into our front end now and add this functionality. We can just do that in one fell swoop because it's gonna be very similar to what we saw in our shared note function. What we're gonna do is just say try. We're gonna say set notes. We're gonna be making one small change to that in a minute here, but uh, we'll also say const updated emails equals await delete, right? Remember that this is a delete request here. We're gonna say await delete, and we're gonna send this request to notes slash note ID slash shared emails slash email. All right, so that is our request there. And what's this complaining about? Ah, yes, we didn't call this delete, did we? We called this del. Delete is a reserved keyword in JavaScript, so we didn't use that as our function name. All right, so we have our updated emails now. The next thing that we're gonna do is just set the shared with property to those updated emails inside our unshare note function here. So let's say shared with updated emails. And now we just need to add a catch block. And for now, this thing is just going to print out the errors that occurred. So we'll say console.log E. And that's pretty much all we need to do. So let's try unsharing this thing now by removing some of these emails from our note just to refresh and make sure we have the most up-to-date version. And let's also just check our server to make sure that we don't have any syntax errors. It looks like we did on our front end, but again, that was just when we only had the try block. So it looks like we should be good. Let's open up our application and try clicking this delete button on some of these, especially john at gmail.com we wanna get rid of. So we're gonna click on that. And uh oh, it looks like emails.map is not a function. Oh, and the reason for this is in unshare note route, we need to say, instead of updated emails here, this is actually the updated note that we're getting back from find one and update. And then we just need to say response.json updated note dot emails. Okay, so there we go. Let's try this thing again. 
uh, we should see that that email got removed because the error occurred after that. So let's try removing another one of these. And oops, it looks like that removed everybody. So, hmm, wonder why that happened. Oh, jane at gmail.com is still there. So the uh, faulty functionality is in our front end. Let's open up our notes provider. And it looks like we might be getting back the wrong updated emails from our back end. So let's just open this up here. Oh, duh, that's not emails, that's shared with. Whoops, okay, well, updated note.shared with, that should give us the right thing back. Just to test this, let's add jim at gmail.com back to our note. And let's click delete again. And sure enough, that should work just like we want it to. So perfect, we're able to share our note and unshare our note with other users of our application. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. All right, so now that we've allowed our users to share and unshare their notes with other users, the next thing that we're gonna do, right, the last thing that we're gonna take a look at here is how to add another section to our application that will allow users to see all the notes that have been shared with them, right? This will say something like shared with me. And it'll use the exact same component that we saw up here. Well, it'll use a similar component as we'll see since we won't have the uh, delete buttons, obviously. It'll use the same component though, and we'll just have to add a setting onto it. Okay, now there's a few ways we could go about this, and uh, each one, of course, has its benefits and drawbacks. But what we're gonna do for the time being, just because it's easiest, is add this logic to the initial endpoint for loading notes for a given user. So essentially what we're gonna do is, let's open up our list notes route. What we're gonna do in this route is instead of just sending back only the notes that belong to that user, right, that the user owns, we're gonna also send back the notes that have been shared with that user. So in other words, instead of just sending back a single array of notes, we're gonna send it back in an object like this. So we'll say something like owned notes and shared notes or something like that. And then we'll just have to modify our notes provider slightly to take that into account. So what this is gonna look like here we already have all of the notes that belong to the user, so we can call those something like owned notes. We'll change that name uh, just to make it a little bit more self-explanatory. And to get the shared notes for a user, this is actually fairly straightforward the way that we have it set up currently. We're gonna say const shared notes, or you know what, let's call this something else. We'll call it uh, shared with user notes, right? Not the most poetic name, but it does its job here. and. The way that we're going to query those is we're gonna say await notesdb.find. And what we wanna do is find all of the notes whose shared with property contains this user's email. All right, so we already have our auth user up here. So that means we have access to their email. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say find shared with colon auth user dot email. And what this will basically do, MongoDB will automatically detect when this is an array property, and it will convert this to mean something like auth user email is included in that array, right? So we're saying shared with should contain auth user email in order for a note to be returned. So that'll give us the shared with user notes. And then we just need to convert this to an array by saying dot to array. And let's send these things back now to the client side by saying response.json. And we'll send back just what I showed before. We'll say owned, owned notes, and shared, shared with user notes. Okay, so now we need to open up our notes provider component here and change the way that we load our notes just a little bit, all right? So first of all, we're gonna need to add another state variable to our component here because we have the notes that the user owns. The other state variable that we're gonna have is, we'll just call it, I guess we'll call it shared notes, right? That's a little bit ambiguous, but just in the interest of not creating these huge, nasty variable names, we'll say shared notes. All right, so, and then we're gonna have set shared notes. And these are both going to start off as an empty array and we're gonna to want to also return shared notes or provide shared notes 
from our notes context provider here. So we'll say shared notes. And that basically means that whatever pages need this are gonna be able to access it via the notes context. So all we need to do now is modify how we're getting this data uh, from the server. So we're saying const notes. We need to change that to const owned and shared. It's like we were sending back from our server endpoint. And what this is going to be, we're gonna say set notes to owned and we'll say set shared notes to shared. All right, so that should take care of everything for us assuming that we've done everything right so far, which is a rather large assumption. But nevertheless, let's head over to our notes page. And basically, we're just gonna display another notes list using those shared notes instead. So first things first, up here where we're getting the data from our notes context, we're gonna say is loading notes and we're gonna get shared notes as well. And then down here, we're gonna add another notes list uh, we'll add it below our add a new note thing, I suppose. Well, first of all, let's add another H1 heading. We already have my notes, so let's call this one shared with me. And for this one, we're gonna do something very similar to what we did up at the top, where we said there are currently no notes, add one, except instead we're gonna say there are currently no notes shared with you, okay? And we're not gonna say add one because there's really nothing the user can do in this case. So there are currently no notes shared with you. And then below that, of course, we're gonna add another notes list component. And the notes for this one are going to be the shared notes. And on request delete, we're not gonna add anything there because we don't want anything to happen. On click item, we will allow the user to actually see that note. So we'll just say on click item. And that should be all we need to do. Let's test this thing out and see what updates we need to make, if any. Okay, first of all, let's test to make sure there's no uh, uh, syntax errors. It doesn't look like there are. So let's go back to here and try reloading. And of course, there's not gonna be any shared with me notes currently because you know we haven't actually shared any notes with this email. Uh, one thing though that needs to happen, this needs to show that text underneath it and it's not doing that because we didn't change this to shared notes dot length, right? We just left that as what we copied and pasted from above. So uh, anyway, we see there are currently no notes shared with you. So if we wanna see some actual shared notes, let's make sure to share some notes with someone. All right, so we're sharing it with jane at gmail.com. So we'll go back to our notes and share another note with Jane as well. So jane at gmail.com, click share. And now let's log out and log back in as jane at gmail.com. Okay. And we should see those shared with me notes in the shared with me section that have been successfully loaded. And if we click on these things, we're gonna see that it says, uh-oh, looks like that note no longer exists. Now the reason for this, this is actually somewhat of a deeper problem, but uh, there is a fairly quick fix for this. The reason for this is that when we're getting the note by ID, Let's open up our note detail page to see that here. When we're getting our note by ID, we're only taking into account the note. So if we wanna find that note in the notes and shared notes, what we could do is say shared notes. And then we could combine our notes and shared notes by saying notes, shared notes, and using the spread operator there, which combines those two arrays into a single array. And you know, then we would have to do that on all of the other pages as well. And you know, now this should work if we go back to our page, right? We see, does this work? This note currently has no content, which is actually the correct content for the note. Now, one thing that you'll notice here, which is what we're gonna have to make some changes to later on, is we're gonna have to make it so that the share button and the edit button aren't visible when the user doesn't actually own the note. And more specifically, we're gonna be seeing how to add permissions to our sharing because, you know, maybe we do want another user that we've shared a note with to be able to edit it. In that case, we would want them to see this edit thing. And maybe we want other users to be able to share our notes with other users. In that case, we would want them to see this share button as well. So there's lots of possibilities here, obviously, but uh, in general, we're gonna to need to hide these things 
for users, which means we're going to have to add some more logic. And that's something that we're going to take a look at a little later. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. Now that we've seen how to add basic note sharing capabilities to both our front end and our back end, it's time to take a look at how to add user permissions to our application. So any of you who have ever worked with something like Amazon Web Services are probably familiar with this concept where different users are going to have different permissions, right? Different things that they're allowed to do on the same project. Now, in the case of our note sharing application, this is going to manifest itself as uh, whether or not a user is allowed to view a note, whether or not they're allowed to edit it, whether or not they're allowed to share it with other users, etc. So that's what we're going to be taking a look at here today. And this is going to take us one step further than basic note sharing, right? We're going to have to come up with some concept of how to determine who's allowed to do what with which notes. So we're going to be discussing that in a lot more detail shortly. Let's jump right in. All right, so our first step here is gonna to be to make sure that only owners can see the share and edit buttons that we have on the note detail page, right? When a user who the note has just been shared with visits this page, we want them to just see the note and the content and not these buttons. Now, there are several ways to go about this as usual, of course, but the strategy that we're gonna use is this. If we go back to the notes page, Notice that there are two separate ways that the user can get to the note detail page, right? They can either click on uh, one of the notes under my notes, which will take them to the note detail page, or they can click on one of these notes under the shared with me section, and that will also take them to the note detail page. Now, what we're going to do essentially is instead of having both of these actions take the user to the same exact route, we're going to create two separate routes right, according to whether the note was in the user's My Notes section or whether the note was in the Shared With Me section. And this is just one of several ways to do it. We'll probably take a look at other ways later on to do this, but uh, for now, let's just open up our application and open up our note detail page. Okay, now I mentioned that essentially what we're going to do is we're going to reuse this page on two separate routes, and we're going to make it display a little bit differently depending on whether or not the user owns uh, the given note. So the way that we're going to go about that is inside the note detail pages props, we're going to add a prop called is owner. Now you might be picturing that we're going to make some kind of network request to the server to figure out if the user is the owner or do some kind of logic here to determine what this prop should be, but it's actually going to be a lot simpler than this, as you'll see. Uh, what we're going to do is let's open up the routes component here. What we're going to do is we're basically just going to create another route, just like we did for our note detail page here, except the path is going to be different. Now, the way that we're going to determine what the path will be is basically just which item here the user clicks on, what list that item is in. We'll get back to that in a second here, but uh, first let's create that extra route. What we're going to do, we're just going to say protected route and we're going to say is loading equals is loading. Can access will be equal to is logged in, just like with the regular note detail page, is logged in. Redirect to will be the slash login route. And the actual path of this, instead of being notes slash note ID, like our regular note detail page, this is going to be slash shared slash note ID. Okay, so it's actually going to be an entirely different route that we end up sending the user to. So inside this route, we're going to display the note detail page without the is owner prop. And we're gonna add the is owner prop to this note detail page up here because that will make it basically get displayed with those buttons. So now that we've done that, sort of bringing this full circle, let's go back to our note detail page and what we're going to do now is we're going to use this is owner prop to hide the pieces of the DOM that we don't want if the user isn't an owner. Okay. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to go down beyond this 
is editing thing because this thing just won't be shown at all if the user is not the owner. And we're gonna go down to this div here with the two buttons, the edit and share button. Now what we're gonna do is we're going to use curly braces and say is owner and, and that will basically take care of hiding these buttons if the user is not the owner. So just to demonstrate here, uh, if we click on one of these notes here and just change this to shared slash that note ID. Oops, so we need to actually run our application here. We'll do npm run dev. There we go. We see that this version of the note detail page now has no buttons on it. Whereas if we go to uh, just notes slash note ID, we'll see that that now has the buttons. Okay, so which version the user sees of this page is gonna have to be determined by the route that we send them to when they click on one of these items here, as I said. So the way that we're going to do that is by opening up our notes page. And if we scroll down to the bottom here, where we have our shared notes list, all we need to do now is we need to change this route to slash shared slash ID. Okay, so basically that'll just make it so that when the user clicks on one of the items in the shared with me list, it takes them to this shared page with the version of the note detail page that does not have, uh, you know, that does not have any buttons. So let's click on that. And sure enough, we see that that takes the user to uh, a page without buttons. If they click on one of the ones they own, that one has buttons. Now I probably should mention here that this strategy isn't super secure just on the front end. The only reason we're really able to do this at this point is because we already have mechanisms in place on the back end to make sure that only the owner can edit a given note, right? So if we open up the update note route, for example, we're making sure that the user actually owns the note. And this is important here because if we go back to our note detail page without the buttons, right? If we didn't have any protection in place on the back end, a user could just go in here, change this to notes slash note ID, right? A savvy user here could do that. And then they'd be able to click on edit and actually make changes to that note. Okay, and that's definitely not an ideal thing. But currently, since our server does have this user owns note thing in place, uh, if we try and do that, right, if we say hacked and click save changes, nothing's going to happen, right? If we refresh, we'll see that uh, no changes were made. And in fact, if we take a look at the inspector window here and take a look at the network tab and try and edit this, just do something there, say save changes, we're going to see that we get a 403 saying, yeah, you're not allowed to do that. Okay. So... That's the idea here, and I just wanted to clarify that the only reason we're able to use this strategy on the front end is because we already have that mechanism in place on the back end to prevent unauthorized users from editing that note. So I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so at this point, users are able to share their notes with other users, and those users can actually go into the note and take a look at the content it contains without seeing the buttons that would allow them to share and edit that note. And we have protection on our back end so that even if the user figures out that they can just go to slash notes slash ID and see these buttons, they can't actually make changes, right? We saw that earlier. So what we're gonna take a look at next is we're gonna see how to actually add the concept of permissions to these notes so that instead of just sharing read-only access with other users, an owner can actually allow other users to edit their notes as well if they want to. Okay, so this is gonna be an interesting process, but the first thing we're gonna do here is remove this delete button from the shared with me because we don't want users to be able to delete these things when they don't own them. And in fact, right now we haven't even specified an on request delete function for uh, our notes list components, so that wouldn't happen anyway. But regardless, let's go back here and what we're gonna do for our notes list here, we're gonna say notes list, and basically what we're gonna do is if this on request delete function is specified, then and only then will we actually display that button. Okay, so all we need to do for this is we just need to say 
on request delete and X button, right? Otherwise, that thing is just going to be hidden. So if we go back here, we should see that that X button is now hidden on the shared with me notes so that the user just can't delete them, right? So the next thing that we're gonna do here is we're gonna make it so that a user can actually give different levels of access to other users to their notes, right? We're gonna have like read-only access, and for now we'll just have edit access as well. Obviously there are other levels of permissions that we might wanna assign as well, but for now we're just gonna have two. So here's gonna be our basic strategy for doing this, okay? Remember that currently what we're doing is inside our database, which we can open up here. There we go, I already have it up in fact. Inside our database for each of our notes, if we say db.notes.findall.pretty, remember that each of our notes that's actually been shared with someone has this shared with property, which is a list of the email addresses that that note has been shared with. Now I talked previously in quite a bit of depth about the different options that were available to us with you know, sharing notes with other users and how we might format that in the database. And in order to implement this level of permissions, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna make some changes to how our data is structured. Now, first of all, let's just talk about the fact that there are still a few options available to us, as is often the case. One way of implementing this permissions thing that I just talked about would be, instead of having a shared with property here, we could have two separate properties, one being can edit and one being can view. And each of these properties would just be arrays of either emails or user IDs of the users who were able to edit that note and users who were able to view that note. Now there's nothing wrong with doing it this way, but since we can foresee possibly adding more and more permissions in the future, it's gonna actually be easier for us to structure this in a way that looks like this. Instead of having each of these just be an email address, we're gonna have it be an object with the properties email, okay, and that'll be the email of the user. And additionally, we're gonna have a property called role, okay, this is something that's sort of stolen from uh, Amazon Web Services and other places where you have lots of user management, role, and this is basically going to be either edit or view for the time being, and this will actually allow us to add in different roles as time goes on, right? So if we want to allow the user to share with other users, we'll have role share, right? So there's going to be a few different levels. The first one is going to be view, where the user can just look at the note, they can't edit it. The next level up is going to be edit, Okay, where the user can actually edit the note and eventually we'll add another level here which will be share uh, and that'll mean that the user can share that note with other users. Cool, so that's our basic plan here. We're gonna convert our database to uh, you know, store its sharing data in this way instead of just as email addresses. And additionally, we might want to, just while we're at it, add the ID of the user into this object just to make things easier in the future if we ever need to use that user's ID. So to get started here, now that we know our basic strategy, what I'm gonna recommend we do first is unshare this note with jane at gmail.com from, I believe this is john at gmail.com's ID, because that'll make it so that we don't have to go into our database and manually change this. So what we're gonna do is go back to our application here, we're gonna log out, and we're gonna log in as john at gmail.com. Okay, and we're just going to change the share settings on our notes so that it's not shared with anybody. All right, so if we go back here, we're gonna delete jane at gmail.com and let's do the same thing here, same thing. Okay, it looks like that was the only note that was shared. I thought there was another one here. We might have to actually go in and do it manually just for uh, ease of use. Uh, yeah, here we go. So it looks like shared with here. What I'm gonna do here is just copy this notes ID and I'm gonna say db.notes.update1. We're gonna update the note whose ID matches that thing that I just copied. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna say uh, dollar sign set and we're going to set 
the shared width property to just an empty array. Okay. Oops, and let's close that. Uh, let's close those parentheses there. And sure enough, if we say db.notes.find again, we should see that the shared width property, if it exists on a note, is just an empty array. Uh, there's a lot of notes that it's just that it just doesn't exist on for now, which is perfectly fine. So the next thing that we're going to do now is we're going to rewrite some of our server endpoints to change that uh, that structure of our data behind the scenes. So first of all, we're going to want to open our share note route. And what we're going to do, we're getting this email for a given user from the request body, right? When a user wants to share a note with another user, they send a request to slash notes slash note ID slash shared emails with the email address that they want to share it with. And we're already checking to make sure that the user owns the note and we're already verifying their auth tokens. So we don't have to worry about those things. What we are going to have to do though, is instead of just saying shared with email and add to set, we're going to actually change this to push. And instead of just pushing their email onto the shared with array, we're going to say email and it's going to be an object. And we're also going to add the role thing that I talked about. And this is going to be, well, for now, we'll just say view. Now, what we're going to need to do is, well, two things, really. We're going to need to add something to the request body when the front end makes a request to the share note route to specify what the role of the user that we're sharing with should be, right? So that this won't have to be hard coded like it is. Okay. And we're also going to need to add another endpoint here for editing this permission, right? If the user doesn't want to unshare a note with another user, but they do want to change their permissions. So we're going to have to create another route for that a little later on, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. So for now, we're just going to add role view and we're going to have email and we're going to also want to add the user's ID, which we can get from user with email here. So let's just say ID user with email dot ID. All right, we've already made sure that the user with email exists up here in this if statement. Cool. So that should work. Uh, but what we're going to need to do now is we're going to need to rewrite our unshare note route, as well as some of the other routes to take into account this new structure in our database. So let's open up our unshare note route. And what we're going to have to do here is we're going to say pull, but instead of saying shared with email, we're going to have to say shared with and put curly braces around this, which will basically tell MongoDB we want to remove the object from shared with whose email property equals the email that we're trying to remove here. All right. So it's basically just a, just a subtle change in the MongoDB query that we're making that will make that happen. All right. So that's all the changes we need to make to our unshare note route. The last one I believe that we're going to need to do is going to be the list notes route because this is where we actually decide what notes to send back to the user, which ones have been shared with them, etc. So what we're going to need to do here, we're already getting shared with user notes right up here in this query. We're going to need to, first of all, change this query a little bit. We're going to say, instead of notes db .find shared with blah, 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 we're going to need to say shared with, and then in curly braces, we're going to need to add an extra set of curly braces around this auth user email thing. We're going to have to change the query a bit and say dollar sign lm match, right? That's element match. And inside here, we're going to need to say email auth user email. So basically what this is doing, and we do have to add an extra set of curly braces there. You might want to indent this just to make it a little more readable. In fact, I'll do that right here. Just so you can see kind of what's going on. Basically the situation where we need to use this element match operator is when we have an array of elements as a property in one of our objects in MongoDB, right? Such as when we have an object like the one we're having here, which has a shared with property. And this itself is an array of objects, some of which have an email property, etc. When we have a nested structure like this, we need a way to tell MongoDB we want all of the notes in this database whose shared with property contains an object that matches this query right here. So that's basically what that query is saying. All right, and that should be good to send back the right notes to the user. Um, assuming I got everything right, we might need to make one or two adjustments, but um, you know, let's just give this a try first, I suppose. 
And one more thing that we're gonna want to do here is once we have the shared with user notes, in order to make it easier for ourselves on the front end to know what buttons to show, okay? In other words, if the user can only view it, we wanna hide the buttons. If the user can edit but not share, we only wanna show the edit button, etc. We're gonna want to add some sort of property to each of these shared with user notes that will allow our user to know or allow our front end to know what permission the user has over that note. So the way that we're gonna do this, uh, we're just gonna say const shared with notes or shared with user notes formatted, I guess we'll call it. And for that, we're gonna say equals shared with user notes dot map. And for each note here, what we're gonna do is add a property directly to that note that will allow the user to know what permission they have over it. So uh, what this is gonna look like is something like this. We're just gonna say dot, 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 note. Okay, so we're getting all of the original properties from the note. And then after that, we're going to add a permission level, I guess we'll call it. We'll say permission level. And this is going to be edit or view or whatever based on what that user's permission is inside this note. Now, the way that we're gonna do this, it's gonna be a little bit tricky. We're gonna say note dot shared with dot find, and we wanna find that shared with setting with the user's email. So we're gonna say setting. We want the setting where the setting dot email property is equal to the user's email. So we'll say user dot email. And once we've gotten that, we wanna get the role property. So we're gonna say dot role at the end of that. And hopefully that should work. If not, we'll have to come back and adjust it a little bit. So let's change this now from shared with user notes to shared with user notes formatted, right? The formatted just has these extra properties added to it. And let's give this thing a try. So first of all, let's make sure that we don't have any syntax errors. Nope, it looks like we're doing all right there. And let's just go back to our front end and make sure everything is still working so far. We're gonna just refresh this. It looks like that works. Let's try a user. Let's, let's actually try sharing notes with the user. So we'll go back to john at gmail.com. Oops, let's try that here. There we go, log in. And let's click on this and click share. And we'll try sharing it with jane at gmail.com. And if we click share now, Ah, okay, so we're getting an error now because we didn't adapt our front end to the new structure of our data. So let's go back into our front end here and we're gonna open up the share settings page. Okay, so note sharing settings page that is. And what we're gonna need to do inside of here is instead of just blindly getting the note.shared with property and trying to display that as the emails, we're gonna need to say note.shared with dot map and map each setting here to setting dot email. Okay, so that should make it so that it works. Yep, sure enough, we see jane at gmail.com there. Let's just uh, share another note as well. Oops, we're gonna go back. Let's do this one here. Ah, okay, so this now says cannot read properties of undefined reading map. That's just because I put map on the wrong place. We're gonna need to actually take this from here. And what we're gonna do is wrap this in parentheses and put the dot map on the end. Okay, so let's go back here now, and we see that that's working like we want it to, so let's try sharing this with jane at gmail.com, and click share, and sure enough, it looks like it works. So let's log out now and log in as Jane to see the shared notes, so we'll say abc123, log in, and sure enough, we see the shared with me notes. So let's click on one of these and see what happens. It looks like everything is still working just the way we wanted it to. All right, and that's all there is to it. We've now restructured our database in such a way that will allow us to add different permissions to our users. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so now that we've reformatted our database a little bit to incorporate our new levels of permissions that we want to allow users to assign, the next thing that we're gonna do here is allow users to set those different permissions in the first place from the front end and also change those. 
So our basic strategy, first of all, is gonna be when the user goes to the share page for a note, right? And they can get there by clicking on share when they're on one of their own notes. What we're gonna have in addition to this text input here that allows them to enter in a user's email is we're gonna have a radio button group. All right, and I'm just gonna draw it down here, but it'll actually be above this button. We're gonna have a radio button group that will allow the user to select whether that new email, right, whether the user with that email should be able to edit, right, or whether that user should be able to just view the note. So it'll be something like can view. And obviously we'll be able to add more options to this as time goes on, which will be very handy for being able to extend the permissions of our application. So what we're gonna wanna do here is open up the shared emails component, which is where we're currently displaying that form and stuff. So let's open up shared emails. And if we scroll down here to our share button, right above that, we're gonna want to add a radio group. So here's what that's gonna look like. We're gonna say div. Okay, so we're gonna put everything inside of a div, first of all. And we're gonna just have the text permission level above that. Maybe that's a little bit of a technical term, but you know, we'll just leave it there for now. We can always change that later. And now under that text, we're gonna display all of the different options for, uh, you know, for selecting a permission. So the first one here, we're gonna say label, and there's gonna be a radio input inside of here, but for the text, we're gonna say can edit. Actually, let's make can view the first one here. We'll say can view, and under that's going to be the input. The type here is going to be radio. The value here is going to be the string edit. Okay, so we'll say value edit. And actually, let's just do a uh, lowercase e. Under that, we're gonna have a checked property. We're gonna need to actually calculate that and add a state variable to, uh, to this component in a minute. So we'll just leave that for now. On change is gonna be the same thing. We're gonna need to add a state variable and you know add the logic to the on change prop. And that is actually it. So. Let's just close that tag. And that should be what our radio inputs look like. So I'm just going to copy this thing now and paste it down below again. And this one's going to be can edit. Okay, so we'll say can edit. Oh, and this, uh, this value here should actually be view. I was just kind of on autopilot there. That should be value view and this edit one should be value equals edit. Cool, so now let's add a state variable that will keep track of which one of those radio buttons is selected, right? We need to add state variables to our React components for radio buttons, just like we need to add them for text inputs. So uh, under here, what we're gonna do, we're gonna say const selected permission and set selected permission. And the default value for this one is going to be one of the valid permissions. We're gonna set the default value to view. So uh, we'll say equals use state and the string view. Now, we might wanna actually make a constant for these uh, strings here, just to make sure we don't commit some kind of typo or something like that. Um, so, I mean, for now, I'm just gonna say const edit equals edit and const view equals view. And then we can just replace these things just to be extra safe. So we'll say view. And then we'll go down here. The value here is going to be view and the value in edit is going to be edit. Okay. Just to make sure that that uh, string stays the same across all of the logic in our component here. So we have our selected permission now which means that we can add our logic to checked and on chain. So checked here is gonna depend on whether or not the selected permission is equal to view. And on change, what we're gonna do is say set selected permission to uh, whatever the value is here. So we're gonna say set that to view. All right, and for edit, we're gonna do the same thing, but with edit, so for checked, we're gonna say selected permission equals edit. And for on change, we're gonna say set selected permission to edit. All right, so that should hopefully all work if I did that right. So let's give this thing a try. We're gonna go back to our application here and it doesn't look super good, but it should at least work. If we click on one of these things, we'll see can view, can edit. 
right? It switches between them. Ah, and it looks a little bit confusing because the radio button is actually after the option, which is not what we want. So let's go back to here and we're actually going to just move the text down below the input. There we go. And there we go. And that makes it a little easier to read in my opinion. Now we can always put these things on their own line by just adding a div around each label. Okay, so if we, oops, let's try that again. If we take the label and put it inside a div, and same thing for this one, we're gonna say div, put a label inside of it. That will put each of those radio items on its own line, which can be a little bit easier to read. So that's just the way that I'm going to leave it. And now that we have these radio buttons here, what we're gonna need to do is allow the front end to send the selected radio button option along with the request to the server. So what that's gonna look like is when this thing is submitted here, all right, when the user clicks this share button, we're gonna need to change this a little bit. And instead of just calling on add, which if you'll recall is a prop that's being passed in from the parent component, right? Instead of just calling on add with the email, we're gonna have to uh, add another property to this. So we'll say email, new email, and the other property is going to be role, and that's going to be the selected permission. All right, so now let's go up to our note sharing settings page, which is the one that's displaying this shared emails component. And inside on add, instead of just getting the email, what we're gonna have to do here is we're gonna have to also get the role. And we're gonna have to include that when we say share note. So we're gonna have to say share note, note ID, email, and role. And remember this shared note is something that we're getting from our uh, note context here. There are a few layers here that we have to change in case you haven't noticed. So let's go up into our notes provider and we're gonna find shared notes and basically all we need to do is make sure that we take that extra argument into account and include it with the network request that we're making here. So this should be role. And we're just going to include that alongside email in the request body. Cool, so now all we have to do is go into the back end and take this extra piece of data that we're sending along from our front end into account. So let's go to our share note route. And up here where we're getting the email from the body, we're gonna say email and we're also gonna get the role and we're going to insert that role down here. So instead of saying role view, we're just going to say role. And that should be about it. So everything should work now just like it was working before. So let's actually try adding edit permissions for a user to this note. Let's give John edit permissions to this note. So we're gonna say john at gmail.com. We're gonna select can edit and let's click on share. And we see that john at gmail.com is now displayed. Now, one thing that we might wanna do here is actually display somewhere in this, uh, you know, in this list item, what kind of permissions this person has. So in order to do that, it's pretty easy, the data is already there. Let's just open up our shared emails component. And we're gonna actually need to change this component so that instead of taking emails, it actually takes the sharing settings. So we're gonna change this to sharing settings. And we're gonna have to change this to sharing settings.map. And each setting is going to have an email property, of course, but it's also going to have the role property, which we're gonna to want to display. And in order to display that, right after the email, we're gonna have a paragraph tag here that will say role, all right? And that's just gonna be edit or view for now. Cool, so let's just make sure there's no other emails here that we uh, need to change. No, it looks like we're all good. So we just need to go back up into the note sharing settings page and change the name of that prop that we're passing into our shared emails. So this is going to be sharing settings. And for this, we're just going to pass in note.shared with, and we can delete everything else, okay? But, oh, actually we will want to add a backup property here. So we'll just add an empty array to that. Cool, so let's see if that worked. What we're gonna do is go back here and sure enough, we see john at gmail.com. We see that John has edit permissions. If we add someone else, like let's add jim at gmail.com and click share, we see that that gives Jim view permissions instead of edit permissions. And that's how we add that sort of functionality to the front end. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.
Okay, so now that we're able to actually add different permissions to different users from the front end, the next thing that we're gonna do is make it so that those users actually see different things on the note detail page when they look at them. All right, so we already made it so that when a user goes to the note detail page, those buttons are hidden, but we no longer want to do that necessarily, right? If a user has edit permissions for a note, we want to show that edit button and we want to allow them to actually edit that note. So there's gonna be two main pieces of this. The first part is gonna be deciding whether or not to show the buttons here based on a user's permission. And that's going to be fairly straightforward. The tricky part is going to be on the back end. Okay, so let's head over to there. The tricky part's gonna be on the back end, right? If we open up the update note route, essentially what we're gonna to have to do in order to check if a user can update a note isn't just whether the user owns the note or not, right? Because that's no longer a prerequisite for this route. Essentially what we're gonna to need to do is create new middleware for deciding whether or not a user has the appropriate permissions for a given route. And that's going to be a little bit trickier, so we'll get to that shortly. For now though, let's open up the note detail page. And we're gonna make it so that in addition to this is owner prop, we're also going to look at the permission level on the note in order to decide what buttons down here to, uh, to display. Okay, so first things first, what we're gonna do is delete this is owner thing from here. And we're just gonna add that to the share button for now, right? Because currently only owners are able to share a note with other users. And for this edit button, here, let's delete this closing curly brace there. For the edit button, we're gonna wanna check whether the user has the correct permissions. Now we're gonna actually create another variable here, which we'll call uh, can edit. So we'll say can edit and that button. And in order to figure that out, we're just gonna need to go up here where we get our note. And we're gonna need to take a look at the permission level property that we added to our note inside the list notes route, right? We added this permission level thing, which is either, you know, edit or view or whatever. And actually, let's change this to role. That probably makes a little bit more sense, seeing as though we're using role for this in literally everything else. So let's make sure that we haven't uh, put permission level anywhere else. No, it looks like we're good. Okay, so we should be good there. It looks like we just weren't using permission level yet anywhere. So back in our note detail page now, we're gonna say const role equals note dot role. Okay, assuming of course that the note exists. And oh, that should actually be note. Okay, so const role equals note. And now what we're gonna do is say const can edit. And for this, we want to check and see if the role is equal to edit, all right? And again, we might wanna pull this out into a constant, just like we did in our other page. Uh, for now though, I'm just gonna leave it. So can edit is just determined by whether or not the role is equal to edit, and that will determine whether or not this edit button uh, is visible. So let's check on this, all right? If we go back to uh, one of our notes here, Ah, you know what, I actually forgot about that. We want to show the edit button if is owner or can edit. Okay, so we'll say is owner or can edit. All right, in both of those situations, we want the user to be able to edit the note. Okay, and if we go back now and click on share, let's go take a look now at john at gmail.com. John has edit permissions, so we're going to log out we're going to say john at gmail.com, abc123, log in. And let's take a look at this note, which was shared with John. And sure enough, we see that we have this edit button, which allows us to actually edit the note. Now, this won't work yet if you try it, because we haven't actually added that extra logic to our back end. But we can at least see that button and go to the editing state of this component. Now, on the other hand, if we log in as jim at gmail.com, okay. Oops, it looks like that's the wrong password. Let's try another one. There we go. Okay, so let's take a look at this note that was just shared with Jim, and sure enough, we see that there is no edit button on this note, right? So this is the same note that we were looking at on John's account, but since John had edit access, John was able to see the button and click on it, whereas Jim is not. So that's pretty much all the changes we need to make now for our front end. 
The next thing that we're gonna do here is we're gonna go make those changes to our backend. We need to make our update note route and possibly other routes as well, less strict, right? We need to sort of open them up so that in addition to the owner being able to edit the note, we wanna allow users with edit access to be able to edit that note as well. So let's create some new middleware for this. What we're gonna do is inside the middleware folder, we're gonna say new file, and we're gonna create a new middleware function called can edit note dot js. Actually, let's call this user can edit note, sort of like user owns note. We'll say user can edit note.js. And here's what this thing is going to look like. We're going to say export const user, oops, I spelled that wrong here. Let's try that again. User can edit note. All right, so we're going to say user can edit note. This is going to be an asynchronous function that takes request, response, and next as arguments here. And here's what this logic is going to look like. Basically, what we're going to do is find the note with the ID that's in the request URL parameters. Okay, so this is going to be sort of like what we did in user owns note, so we can open that up as reference. So we're going to get the user, which will already have been set by uh, the verify ID token or verify auth token middleware. We're going to get the note ID from the request parameters. We're going to find that note, and really the only thing that's different is that we're going to change this logic here so that uh, instead of having to be created by that user, that user is either the owner or has edit level permission. So I'm going to just copy all of this here and we'll paste it inside user can edit note. And of course, we're going to need to import this stuff as well. We're going to need to import notes DB. Okay, so we'll go up here, paste that. And then the logic here is going to be a little different. So note.createdBy does not equal authuser.uid. That's no longer going to be the case. What we're going to want to say is if the note wasn't created by the user, in other words, if the user is not the owner, and actually, just to make it a little more readable, we'll say const is owner and separate that logic out into here. So we'll just paste that up there. And we'll also say has edit permission. And then the logic for this one is going to be note dot shared with. Okay, and since that could potentially be null, we're going to need to say shared with and note dot shared with dot find. And we want to find the setting with the same email as this auth user. In fact, since we're using the ID, let's actually get this by the user's ID just to make sure there's no like funny business with that. So we're going to say setting dot id is equal to auth user dot uid. Okay, so we're getting the notes sharing setting for this user. So the final thing we need to do here is if this thing exists here, right, note dot shared with dot find, if that returns something, we want uh, to check and make sure that the permission is edit, right, that the role is equal to edit there. So uh, I'm actually going to rewrite this a little bit to make it less messy. We're going to say um, here, let's change this to user permission. Okay. And what we're going to do is say const has edit access. And that's going to be equal to, uh, first of all, we're going to make sure that user permission actually exists. And then we're going to say, and user permission dot role is equal to edit. All right, so now that we know whether the user is an owner and whether the user has edit access to that note, what we're gonna do is just say if the user is not an owner and the user does not have edit access, then we want to return this status code. Otherwise, we want to allow the user to do whatever it is they're trying to do, all right? So now that we have this middleware, what we're gonna do is change the middleware on our update note route to that, so we're gonna get rid of user owns note and we're going to import instead user can edit note. And we're going to swap this out here with user can edit note. And that should allow users with that permission now to edit the note in just the same way as the owner used to be able to edit that note. So let's give this a try. What we're gonna do here is log in with a user that actually has edit permissions for that note. So we'll log in as john at gmail.com. 
ABC123, log in. And let's go into shared with me here. And remember that john at gmail.com has access to uh, editing this note. So let's click on the edit button. And we're going to try and edit this. We'll say, hi, Jane. Thanks for sharing the note with me. And we'll click Save Changes. And it looks like something didn't quite work there. Let's take a look at the inspector window and try that again, see what uh, went wrong. All right, if we click Save Changes, we see that we got a 200 status code, which is a good sign. What happens if we refresh this page? Whoa, and it looks like something went wrong here. Ah, we just need to add a backup value for note in case we didn't find anything there. So let's go into our note detail page here. And up at the top where we're getting the role from the note, we just need to say role equals note or empty object. Okay, so that should get rid of that error. Oh, and it looks like that updated correctly now. So um, it looks like what's happening. Let's actually change this now and click save changes. It looks like it's successfully updating everything on the server and we're just not seeing those changes yet on this page. So let's go take a look at why this might be. All right, if we take a look at our update note route here, we see that we're getting the updated note back from the server, which is good. So let's take a look at our notes provider, I suppose, where we're saying update note. Okay, we'll go up to here. It looks like we are getting the updated note when we make that request. So essentially what we're going to need to do here is create another one of these statements for set shared notes. So we'll say set shared notes to shared notes dot map because the note that was just edited could have been in the shared notes instead of in the notes. All right. So basically one of these is going to do nothing because that note won't actually be in that array. And the other note is going to take care of updating that appropriately. Okay, so that should correct the weirdness that we were seeing here. Let's just close this. We're going to click edit and we'll try and like uh, just edit some of this here. Click save changes. And sure enough, it looks like that works, except that it looks like that got rid of the edit button. And the reason for that here is that our update note route is sending back the note without that role property that we were setting. So what we're probably going to want to do is add that to our update note route as well. So what I'm going to do is open up the list notes route. We're going to take this logic that we had in here and we're going to create our own helper function that will take care of this for us. So I'm just going to create a util folder and we'll create a new file in here, which we'll call format shared note .js. And I'm going to paste that logic in there. And essentially what I'm going to do here is we'll say export const format shared note equals, and this is going to take both the note and a user as an argument. And inside there, what we're going to do is we're going to simply return this logic here. So uh, what this should look like, there we go. We're going to say return, and we're going to return all of this logic that we saw from before. All right, so now we should be able to just use this format shared note function inside our update note route as well as in our list notes route so that we can avoid actually uh, duplicating this logic. What we're going to do is just import that up here. We're going to say import format shared note from its file. We're going to map through our shared notes by saying shared notes dot map. And for each note, we're going to map this to format shared note with the note and the user as arguments. And that should work for that. Now for update note route, we're just going to say updated note. We're going to say format shared note updated note and user, which is going to need to be request.user because we haven't gotten the user anywhere else in here. And then we just need to also import the format shared note function up here. So we'll say import format shared note from its file. So that should work now. Let's refresh this thing. And sure enough, it looks like we have the edit button back. So let's try editing it. Oh, and look at this. You know what? This is something I think that's been happening for a little while. Uh, and you may have noticed it yourself. Basically what's happening is when we refresh the note detail page, the values inside these inputs aren't updated correctly. Now, this is a separate problem from what we were seeing before. 
However, uh, it's a fairly simple fix. All we need to do is add a use effect hook to this component that makes sure to keep those things in sync with the note. All right, so all we need to do here is for our updated title and updated content, we just need to keep those in sync using the use effect hook. We're gonna say use effect. And basically what we need to do is watch for changes in the note. So we're gonna say note as the dependency here. And once we've done that, we're gonna need to just say set updated title to note.title. And we're gonna say set updated content to note.content. So uh, basically that will keep these two text field values in sync when we reload the page and we have to load this note thing and the role, all that kind of stuff. So anyway, that should get rid of that problem. Let's give this a try. Oh, and we might need to actually uh, make sure the note exists before doing that. So we'll say if note, then do those things, okay? So let's try this again. We're gonna go back and sure enough, if we click edit, cancel, right? If we reload the page now, click edit, we should see that everything is now in sync. So anyway, let's get back to our other problem of clicking edit and the edit button disappearing uh, by, you know, we'll just add something here. We'll say, thanks for sharing the note with me and click save changes. And now we see that everything is fixed. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. Have you ever found yourself wondering, how do I add email verification flow to a full stack application? Well, if you've ever found yourself wondering that, then you're in the right place because that's what we're gonna be taking a look at here today. More specifically, what we're gonna be doing is adding an email verification flow to our note sharing application. And what this will do is prevent users from signing up with email addresses that they don't own. So. This is kind of an interesting process because there's so many different ways to do it. And that's one of the things we're gonna be talking about as well, okay? And we're also gonna see how to add uh, something called SendGrid to our backend, which will allow us to send emails from Node.js to real live email addresses, which is gonna be pretty cool. So that's our basic plan of attack. Let's jump right in. All right, so to get started with email verification here, what I wanna do is just get everybody on the same page here and talk about the basic email verification flow. Because the thing is that there's a few different ways we could possibly go about this, as you might be used to hearing by now. And a lot of this depends on the amount of functionality we want users to be able to access before they've actually verified their email. Now the first way, and probably the easiest way, is to only allow users to access anything except the login and create account page if they've already verified their email address, right? So essentially what that would look like is the user would create their account, okay? They would put in their email, their password, their confirmed password, and they would click on the button to create an account. And what this would do is it would simply show them a page that says, thanks, you need to verify your email now in order to uh, actually use any of the app. And once they've done that, then, and only then would they be able to log into our application and use all the functionality that it provides, right? So only then would they be able to access all of the other pages. So that's the easiest way to do it. And that's probably the way that we're gonna start off with, but just to show you that there are in fact other ways and how those things might work, let's discuss some of the other things you could do, right? One thing that I see quite often nowadays is basically websites that let you use the entire site and simply have little pieces of functionality here or there that you can't do unless you're logged in. All right, so an example of that that comes to mind would be something like uh, Zillow, where you can see all of the houses and stuff on there, right? But it's not until you actually want to say, I like this house, that they make you create an account. Okay, and the same thing is probably true with sites like Airbnb, right? Other sites like Spotify, for example, let you listen to songs, uh, I believe without creating an account. 
But if you want to actually save any of those songs or if you want to listen to it without advertisements, then you have to create an account and in most cases pay. So in that situation, it's a little bit trickier because you can use and access all of the different pages on the site, but basically each page is looking to see is the user logged in, right? And if the user is logged in, then they'll maybe display a little uh, uh, heart button that lets you like things. Maybe over here, it will display your, your profile picture. Maybe over here, it will display some kind of button that only logged in users can click, etc. right? Or maybe it shows all of those things, and only when those things are actually clicked does it show a modal asking you to log in, right? So if the user clicks on these things, it says, cool, you want to do that? Create an account, and the create account page might pop up in a modal where the user can just enter in all of their information, etc. cetera. And, uh, you know, then, of course, they would have to verify their email at some point, right? And that's kind of what I'm getting at when I talk about uh, how restricted do we want our site to be for users who haven't verified their email address. Well, in my experience, a lot of it comes down to how likely you think it is that someone will try and hack your site or manipulate your site or just bother users on your site, right? As an example here with our note sharing application, uh, essentially what users are allowed to do through our app is share a note with anybody just by entering their email. Now, this is probably something that's pretty prone to hacking and abuse because essentially what somebody could do is just go on and uh, try and advertise by sending this to a lot of different emails, send it to an entire email list and see who has an account. And, you know, all of those people would suddenly see these bogus notes show up like uh, big sale, right? That kind of thing. And uh, so that could be pretty prone to abuse. So what we're going to do here is we're going to make sure that users have verified their email address before they're allowed to use our site. Okay, so essentially we're going to go with what we talked about uh, beforehand, the first strategy we talked about, which is when the user logs in, all right, just to kind of review that flow, when the user creates an account, rather, they're going to create an account first. Once they do that, it's going to say, great, thank you for doing that. Please go verify your email now. Uh, it's going to actually send them an email. This is going to be something we're going to see how to implement here, okay? So this will actually send an email to their email address, which I'm going to represent like this. And essentially the way that this works is that email is going to contain a special code that they'll only be able to have if they actually own that email address, right? If right now you go and sign up for a given site and it makes you verify your email address, what you're going to see is that that email will contain some kind of link like, you know, HTTPS, blah, 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 whatever the site's called. And then it will have some kind of query parameter. It's usually a query parameter. It could be a URL parameter as well, I suppose. And it'll have something like code equals blah, blah, blah at the end. That's basically what they're doing there, right? They're generating a secret code on the server that the user can't see unless they own that email. So we're going to see how to do that here as well. But basically, this link, when the user clicks it, is going to mark their email as verified on the server. And depending on whether or not that's successful, right, depending on whether or not the user uh, has already verified their email or whether or not the code doesn't work, that kind of thing, the server is going to redirect them either to a success page like this or to a failure page probably with a frowny face on it, of course, that says something went wrong with your email verification or maybe you've already verified, that sort of thing. All right, and from there, once the user has actually uh, verified their email, it's going to have them log in through the login page, which I've drawn very small here, but uh, you get the idea. So it's a little bit of a complicated flow here. We have the account creation. We have the page here, we have the sending of emails, we have the user clicking that email and it bringing them to one of these pages here, so that's four or four, and finally we have the user logging in. So that's going to be the basic process now. Now if this doesn't make complete sense yet, don't worry too much about that, we're going to see how to implement everything uh, as we get started. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.
All right, so to get started with our email verification, now that we know the basic strategy we're gonna be using for this, let's open up our create account page and start from here. Okay, so I mentioned that once the user creates an account, we're gonna have to send them to some sort of page that says, great, thanks for uh, signing up. And then we're basically going to redirect them back to the login page while they go and verify their email address using the email that we're gonna send. So the first problem that we run into here though is this create user with email and password function that we're calling from Firebase Auth will automatically log the user in once that account is created. Okay, so what we need to do here essentially is log the user out immediately after that account is created. So basically what's gonna happen is right after this, we're gonna have to say log out, blah, 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 and make sure that that happens as quickly as possible. Now that won't actually stop the user from visiting all of the other pages in our application if they really want to, right? If they know how to remove this line from the code, which is absolutely possible in the front end, then they'll be able to still see all of our pages. So what that means is that we're gonna need to implement uh, protection on all of the routes that serve those pages so that even if the user does manage to remove that logic that will immediately log them out, they won't actually be able to use our application, right? So that's the basic strategy here. Uh, the first thing we're gonna do then is we're going to log the user out immediately after they create an account. And to do that, we're going to import the logout function or sign out function that would be. So we'll say sign out from Firebase auth. And then down here, what we're gonna do is say await sign out. And we're going to pass the auth instance by saying get auth. And that should make sure that they're logged out immediately. Okay, and once we've logged the user out, we're gonna want to send them not to the notes page, right? Instead, we're gonna to wanna to send them to a new page which we have to create, which will basically be the uh, please verify your email page. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create that new page and we'll say, I don't know, we'll put it on the route, please verify, I suppose. So let's open up our routes now and we'll add that new route. Uh, we're gonna to have to create the page shortly as well. Now this route will be visible when the user is logged out. So I'm just gonna put it down here with the login page and create account page. Under that, I'm going to say route, right? It's just gonna be a regular route because it doesn't really matter if the user is logged in or not uh, when they see this page. And inside here is where we're going to put that. All right, so let's create that page. What we're gonna do is open up our file tree here and inside pages on our front end, of course, we're gonna create a new file and we're gonna call it please verify email page, right? Not a, not a super smooth name there, but it tells you exactly what the page does, so why not? All right, so here's what this page is gonna look like. It's gonna be extremely simple. We're just gonna say export const please verify email page. Not gonna take any props or anything. Uh, what it's gonna do what it's gonna do is just display a basic message and after, I don't know, about three seconds or so, it's going to redirect the user automatically back to uh, the login page, okay? So here's what this is gonna look like. We're going to say return. We're gonna have some React fragments here. Inside there, we're going to have H1 and we'll say thanks for signing up. Under that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say something like, we just sent a verification code to your email address. Please open the email and click it to verify your email and use the app. Awesome. So pretty straightforward. And as I said, what we're gonna do is we're going to have this page automatically redirect the user uh, after a certain amount of time. So we're going to import use effect from React to set that up. And in order to make it actually happen, we're going to import the use history hook so that we can actually navigate the user programmatically. So uh, let's say import use history from React router DOM. And then down here, we're going to get the history. We're gonna say const history equals use history. Under that, we're gonna say use effect. And what we're gonna do here is we're just going to say set timeout. 
And when the time runs out, we're gonna say history.push, and we're gonna send the user to the login page. So we're gonna call this after, I don't know, let's say 3,500 milliseconds, and that will redirect the user after three and a half seconds. And let's just put an empty array here for the dependencies list. Uh, we can always say history as well, just to uh, cross our T's and dot our I's, but it's not really necessary. And uh, that should be all we need to do. So let's just go back to our route now that we were defining. We're gonna add a path to this route, of course, which will be something like slash please verify. And inside here, we're gonna put that page component that we just created. So please verify email page. And that is about it. So let's test this out now. What we're gonna do is we're going to run our application by saying npm run dev. And what we're gonna do is log out and try and create an account with a new email that we haven't used yet. I'm just gonna use something dumb like this and we'll say asdf at gmail.com. And uh, for the password, we'll just do something simple. We're gonna end up deleting this account anyway, so it's not gonna be a big deal. And let's click on create an account. And what this will do, it'll send us to this page here and it will automatically redirect us to the login page. Awesome, so that's how we create that Please Verify page. And that's pretty much all we need to do. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Okay, so now that we've made those changes to our create account page, what you might've noticed is that when we walked through that flow and actually created a user, we got this error in the console, okay? At least if, uh, if yours ran anything like mine did, you would've got this error that said, cannot read property notes of null, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and that's coming from the list notes route as we can see. So if we open up that file, which I have right here, what we're gonna see is that this error is coming from this user.notes.map blah blah blah. So user is actually null in this case, and the reason for this is actually quite subtle. It's caused by a sort of race condition, okay? So in other words, when the user here creates an account on our front end, what that front end is gonna do is it's first going to create an account over here on Firebase Auth, Okay, and only once it's done with that and actually logging the user out too, of course, is it actually going to make a request to the server to create a new user, right? That's going to be this post slash users route that we created earlier for creating a new user and inserting that data. Now at that same point in time, remember, we've already logged the user in by calling that create user with email and password function. So for a very brief point in time, almost unnoticeable, the user is actually redirected to the notes page in our application, which tries to load those notes, okay? Now the problem with this, I'm just going to draw the uh, server here like that. The problem with this is that at this point in time, chances are that this post users thing has not actually completed. So there is currently no user in the database with that uh, user's data. Right, so what's happening, that's the error we're getting, is it's saying that this user here is null because there is currently no user with that user ID in the database. It hasn't been created yet by the front end. Now more often than not, and this is very much the case with our situation here, more often than not, these kinds of bugs are caused when we haven't really thought out very well the architecture of a certain situation, right? And in particular, what I'm talking about is that we really shouldn't be signing the user out and creating the user account here on our create account page, right? There's not really, that's not really the best way to go about it since it's too, it, it puts too much of the logic in the front end. And, you know, there's a lot of side effects that happen by prematurely logging in the user, as we just saw with the error that we got in the console. So in order to remove this error and simplify our flow a little bit, what we're gonna do instead, and here, let me just scroll down so that I have a nice big black screen here to draw on. What we're gonna do instead is we're not going to call the create user with email and password thing on the front end. We're instead going to simply have our front end make a request. The only thing it's gonna do is make a request to the server's 
slash users route to create a new user. All right, and inside this route, we're gonna use Firebase admin to actually create the user in Firebase. All right, so the benefits of this are that the user won't be logged in briefly on the front end. All we're gonna do is just redirect them to the uh, please verify email page, and we won't have to worry about signing them out. This post users endpoint will take care of everything. Okay, so here's what that's gonna look like. Essentially, we're just gonna change our create account function that we're calling here. We're going to remove create user with email and password. Okay, we're just going to get rid of that altogether. We're gonna remove sign out. We're gonna remove this token thing. We're gonna leave axios.post, but we're not gonna be able to send along the user's token with this because the user hasn't actually been created yet. What we're gonna send along instead, okay, we're just going to remove these headers here. What we're gonna send along instead is gonna be the user's email and password that they just entered into the inputs, okay? So we're saying axios.post, we're sending that to users, we're sending the email and password. So in this endpoint now, which we can open here, uh, we're gonna go to create user route. Inside this endpoint, we're gonna have to make several changes, okay? Now the first change is that we're not going to have access to this auth user thing because the user hasn't even been created yet. So we're gonna have to remove that and we're also gonna have to remove the middleware here, uh, which is trying to verify the auth token. As we just saw, we're not gonna have an auth token because once again, the user doesn't exist yet. So let's delete that as well. And the next thing that we're gonna do here is get the email and password that the user just entered. So we'll say const email and password equals request.body. And then we're gonna do things a little bit backwards from what we did before, right? Previously, we were trying to create a user first on the front end, and then we were sending that user's token to the back end, and that had the potential to cause some nasty conflicts here with this existing user thing if, uh, for some reason, that email wasn't already in Firebase auth and was already in our database, right? This would uh, basically send back a 409 conflict thing uh, in that case, and there wouldn't really be a whole lot that the user could do about it because they wouldn't have the ability to delete their account. So anyway, what I'm saying with all of this is that before we even try and create a user with this email and password, we're going to check if there's already a user with that email, right? So we already have the logic for this, okay? All we have to do here is instead of saying auth user.email, which doesn't exist, we're just gonna say email. Right, so we're finding if a user is already in our database with that email address, uh, and if there is, we're sending back a 409, which will be interpreted to mean that that user already exists. And after that, here is where we want to actually create that new user in Firebase auth using Firebase admin. Okay, so the function here for Firebase admin is a little bit different. Here's what it's gonna look like. Uh, we're gonna get rid of verify auth token because we don't need it. And instead, we're going to import all as admin from Firebase admin. And going back down here, we're gonna say const result equals await admin.auth.createUser. Okay, so create user is uh, the name of the function on Firebase admin. The reason they didn't call it create user with email and password is because since this is the admin package, it gives us a little more leeway with what we're allowed to do here. So. We're gonna say await admin.auth.createUser, and what we do here is we pass some data in the form of an object to create user containing things like the user's email, the user's password, etc. And we can also include things like their display name and whatnot that will be added to Firebase Auth's data. So for now though, we're just gonna have email, and that's going to of course be email. We're gonna have password as well, which will of course be the password that we got up here from the body. And one last thing, we're gonna say email verified, and we're gonna explicitly set that to false here. And this right here is how we're gonna keep track of whether or not a user has already verified their email. All right, we'll see how that actually works a little later on. But basically this is now going to contain the user that we just created. So actually instead of result as we did on the front end, we can say const user, 
And then what we can do is instead of saying auth user.uid here, we're just gonna say user.uid. Email, we're just going to set that to the email that the user entered. And we don't have to store the password because that's taken care of by Firebase Auth for us. In fact, we should not store the password because we don't yet know all of the security practices that are involved in doing so. So we're just gonna store the ID that we're getting from Firebase just as we did before, the email that the user entered, and we're going to initialize notes as an empty array. Okay, and then we're getting the result back from the database after inserting it, and we're sending the new user data back to the user with an inserted ID. We're actually not gonna want to do this anymore. We're just gonna say response.status200, and actually that should be send status 200. Right, we're just telling the client side, yep, everything went well. Send the user to the page, tell them they need to verify their email. That's the next step. Okay, so we can actually remove this const result thing. And that's really all we need to do for our create user route. So let's give this thing a try now, shall we? Um, our create account page, everything should work on there. We might have to uh, make one or two little changes, but everything else for the most part should be in place. So uh, first of all, let's just make sure that everything is uh, working. Uh oh, it looks like we're getting an error of some kind. Uh, and the reason that this is happening is because we didn't account for the fact that middleware could be an empty array, right? So when we deleted that, basically uh, in our server.js file, when we say dot 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 root dot middleware, this here could be null. And as a matter of fact, it looks like my IDE already uh, underlined this for me, saying maybe that could be a problem. So all we're going to do here is just say route middleware or empty array, just in case there is no middleware uh, to speak of. All right, so let's open up our terminal now, and we should see server is listening on port 8080, right? Nothing went wrong, and our front end should be running well as well. So let's try creating an account one more time. What we're gonna do, we're gonna say asdf2 at gmail.com. And by the way, ASDF is just the letters that fall under my fingers first when I just type random letters. That's the only reason why I'm using that. Hopefully it doesn't stand for anything in your line of work or uh, in your friend group. All right, so let's put in some passwords here. We're gonna re-enter it, and then we're going to click on create account. And we should see this thanks for signing up page now. And if we go back and check our MongoDB, well, first of all, notice that there is no error now in the server. Everything looks like it was good. Uh, in MongoDB, we should now be able to see that there's a new user called asdf2 at gmail.com. Uh, you can find that by doing db.users.find.pretty. And sure enough, we see that this new user has been inserted into the database. And we can also see if we go to the Firebase console and go to authentication and users, that ASDF and ASDF2, this one most importantly, is stored in there. And just to do a quick double check that this user ID here matches the one that was inserted. Uh, yep, it looks like 5iz. Their eyes there don't look uh, any different than the lowercase l's. But anyway, that's a job for the Google typographers. So essentially what we've done here is rewritten our create account flow entirely so that the front end just makes a single request to the back end. The back end actually takes care of creating a new user. And then it just says to the front end, cool, everything's good. And the front end tells the user, go verify your email. And the user is not logged in at any point in that entire flow. So I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Hi everyone, Sean Wassell here. Now that we've seen the basics of adding email verification to a full stack app and sending emails from Node.js, the next thing that we're gonna do here is cover a few of the more advanced concepts in email verification. So a little more specifically, what we're gonna do is see how to generate random codes that users can use to verify their email. And we're gonna be seeing how to send those to the user's email address and how to link that up to a specific page in our application that will use that code to tell our application that yes, indeed, our user does own that email address. So we're gonna be covering a lot more concepts that have to do with email verification here, as well as SendGrid. So without further ado, let's jump right in.